Ronicky Dune by Max Brand Chapter 1 A Horse in Need He came into town as a solid, swiftly moving dust cloud. The wind from behind had kept the dust moving forward at a pace just equal to the gallop of his horse. Not until he had brought his mount to a halt in front of the hotel and swung down to the ground did either he or his horse become distinctly visible. Then it was seen that the animal was in the last stages of exhaustion, with dull eyes and hanging head and forelegs braced wide apart, while the sweat dripped steadily from his flanks into the white dust on the street. Plainly he had been pushed to the last limit of his strength. The rider was almost as far spent as his mount, for he went up the steps of the hotel with his shoulders sagging with weariness, a wide-shouldered, gaunt-ribbed man. Thick layers of dust had turned his red kerchief and blue shirt into common gray. Dust, too, made a mask of his face, and through the mask the eyes peered out, surrounded by pink skin. Even at its best the long, solemn face could never have been called handsome. But, on this particular day, he seemed a haunted man, or one fleeing from inescapable danger. The two loungers at the front door of the hotel instinctively stepped aside, and made room for him to pass, but apparently he had no desire to enter the building. Suddenly he became doubly imposing, as he stood on the veranda, and stared up and down at the idlers. Certainly his throat must be thick and hot with dust, but an overmastering purpose made him oblivious of thirst. "'Gents,' he said huskily, while the wind fanned a cloud of dust from his clothes, "'is there anybody in this town can give me a hoss to get to Stillwater inside of three hours' riding? He waited a moment, his hungry eyes traveling eagerly from face to face. Naturally, the oldest man spoke first, since this was a matter of life and death. Any hoss in town can get you there in that time, if you know the short way across the mountain. How do you take it? That's the way for me. But the old fellow shook his head and smiled in pity. Not if you ain't rode it before. I used to go up that way when I was a kid. But nowadays, nobody rides that way except Dune. The trail is tricky as the ways of a coyote. You'd sure get lost without a guide. The stranger turned and followed the gesture of the speaker. The mountain rose from the very verge of the town, a ragged mass of sand and rock, with miserable sagebrush clinging here and there, as dull and uninteresting as the dust itself. Then he lowered the hand from beneath which he had peered, and faced about with a sigh. I guess it ain't much good trying that way, but I still got to get to Stillwater inside of three hours. They's one hoss in town can get you there, said the old man, but you can't get that hoss today. The stranger groaned. Then I'll make another hoss stretch out and do. Can't be done. Dune's hoss is a marvel. Nothing else about here can touch him, and he's the only one can make the trip around the mountain inside three hours. You'd kill another hoss trying to do it, what with your weight. The stranger groaned again, and struck his knuckles against his forehead. But why can't I get the hoss? Is Dune out of town with it? The hoss ain't out of town, but Dune is. The traveler clenched his fists. The delay and the waste of precious time was maddening him. Gents, he called desperately, I got to get to Martindale today. It's more than life and death to me. "'Where's Dune's hoss?' "'Right across the road,' said the old man who had spoken first. "'Over yonder in the corral, the bay.' The traveller turned and saw, beyond the road, a beautiful mare, not very tall, but a mare whose every inch of her fifteen-three proclaimed strength and speed. At that moment she raised her head and looked across to him, and the heart of the rider jumped into his throat. The sight of her was an omen of victory and he made a long stride in her direction. But the two men came before him. The old man jumped from the chair and tapped his arm. "'You ain't gonna take the bay without gettin' leave from Dune.' "'Gents, I got to,' said the stranger. "'Listen, my name's Greg, Bill Greg. Up in my country they know I'm straight. Down here you ain't heard of me. I ain't gonna keep the horse, and I'll pay a hundred dollars for the use of her for one day.' I'll bring or send her back safe and sound tomorrow. Here's the money. One of you gents that's a friend of Dune, take it for him. Not a hand was stretched out. Every head shook in negation. 
I'm too fond of the little life left to me, said the old man. I won't rent out the hoss for him. Why, he loves that mare like she was his sister. He'd fight like a flash rather than see another man ride her. But Bill Gregg had his eyes on the bay, and the sight of her was stealing his reason. He knew, as well as he knew that he was a man, that once in the saddle on her he would be sure to win. Nothing could stop him. And straight through the restraining circle he broke with a groan of anxiety. Only the old man who had been the spokesman called after him, "'Greg, don't be a fool. Maybe you don't recognize the name Dune, but the whole name is Ronicky Dune. Does that mean anything to you?' Into the back of Greg's mind came several faint memories, but they were obscure and uncertain. "'Blast your Ronicky Dune,' he replied. "'I got to have that hoss, and if none of you will take the money for her rent, I'll take her free and pay the rent when I come back through this way tomorrow, maybe.' So long. While he spoke, he had been undoing the cinches of his own horse. Now he whipped the saddle and bridle off, shouted to the hotel keeper brief instructions for care of the weary animal, and ran across the road with the saddle on his arm. In the corral, he had no difficulty with the mare. She came straight to him in spite of all the flopping trappings. With prickly ears and eyes lighted with kindly curiosity, she looked the dusty fellow over. He slipped the bridle over her head. When he swung the saddle over her back, she merely turned her head and carelessly watched it fall. And when he drew up the cinches hard, she only stamped in mock anger. The moment he was in the saddle, she tossed her head eagerly, ready to be off. He looked across the street to the veranda of the hotel as he passed through the gate of the corral. The men were standing in a long and awe-stricken line, their eyes wide, their mouths agape, Whoever Ronicky Doone might be, he was certainly a man who had won the respect of this town. The men on the veranda looked at Bill Gregg, as though he were already a ghost. He waved his hand defiantly at them, and the mare, at a word from him, sprang into a long striding gallop that whirled them rapidly down the street and out of the village. The bay carried him with amazing speed over the ground. They rounded the base of the big mountain and glancing up at the ragged canyons which chopped the face of the peak, he was glad that he had not attempted that shortcut. If Ronicky Doone could make that trail, he was a skillful horseman. Bill Gregg swung up over the left shoulder of the mountain, and found himself looking down on the wide plain which held Stillwater. The air was crystal clear and dry. The shoulder of the mountain was high above it. Gregg saw a breathless stretch of cattle country at one sweep of his eyes, Stillwater was still a long way off, and a far way across the plain he saw a tiny moving dot that grew smaller. It was the train heading for Stillwater, and that train must be beat to the station. For a moment his heart stood still. Then he saw the train was distant, indeed, and by the slightest use of the mare's speed he would be able to reach town two or three minutes ahead of it. But just as he was beginning to exult in the victory, after all the hard riding of the past three days, the mare tossed up her head and shortened her stride. The heart of Greg stopped, and he went cold. It was not only the fear that his journey might be ruined, but the fear that something had happened to this magnificent creature beneath him. He swung to the side in the saddle and watched her gallop. Certain she went laboring, very much as though she were trying to run against a mighty pull of the reins. He looked at her head. It was thrown high with pricking ears. Perhaps she was frightened by some foolish thing near the road. He touched her with his spurs, and she increased her pace to the old length and ease of stride. But, just as he began to be reassured, her step shortened and fell into laboring again, and this time she threw her head higher than before. It was amazing to Bill Gregg, and then it seemed to him that he heard a faint, far whistling floating down from above his head. Again, the thin, long-drawn sound, and this time, glancing over his right shoulder, he saw a horseman plunging down the slope of the mountain. He knew instantly that it was Ronicky Doone. The man had come to recapture his horse, and had taken the shortcut across the mountain to come up with her. Just by a fraction of a minute Doone would be too late, for by the time he came down the trail, the bay would be well ahead, and certainly no horse lived in these mountains capable of overtaking her when she felt like running. Greg touched her again with his spurs, but this time she reared straight up, and whirling to the side, 
faced steadily toward her onrushing master. End of Chapter 1 Chapter 2 Friendly Enemies Again and again Greg spurred the bay cruelly. She winced from the pain and snorted, but apparently having not the slightest knowledge of bucking, she could only shake her head and send a ringing whinny of appeal up the slope of the mountain toward the approaching rider. In spite of the approaching danger, in spite of the delay which was ruining his chances of getting to Stillwater before the train, Bill Gregg watched in marvel and delight the horsemanship of the stranger. Ronicky Doone, if this were he, was certainly the prince of all wild riders. Even as the mare stopped in answer to the signal of her owner, Ronicky Doone sent his mount over the edge of a veritable cliff, flung back on his haunches, and slid down the gravelly slope, careening from side to side. With a rush of pebbles about him and a dust cloud whirling after, Ronicky Doone broke out into the road ahead of the mare, and she whinnied softly again to greet him. Bill Gregg found himself looking not into the savage face of a gunfighter, as he had been led to expect, but a handsome fellow, several years younger than he, a high-headed, straight-eyed, buoyant type. In his seat in the saddle, in the pose of his head and the play of his hand on the reins, Bill Gregg recognized a boundless nervous force. There was nothing ponderous about Ronicky Doone. Indeed, he was not more than middle size, but as he reined his horse in the middle of the road and looked with flashing eyes at Bill Gregg, he appeared very large indeed. Gregg was used to fighting or paying his way, or doing both at the same time, as occasion offered. He decided this was certainly an occasion for much money and few words. "'Your dune, I guess,' he said, "'and you know I've played a pretty bad trick on you, taking your horse this way. But I wanted to pay for it, dune, and I'll pay now. I've got to get to Stillwater before that train. Look at her. I haven't hurt her any. Her wind isn't touched. She's pretty wet, but sweat never hurt nothing on four feet, eh?' "'I don't know,' returned Ronicky Doone. "'I'd as soon run off with a man's wife as his hoss.' "'Partner,' said Bill Gregg desperately, "'I have to get there.' "'Then get there on your own feet, "'not the feet of another gent's hoss.' Gregg controlled his rising anger. Beyond him the train was looming larger and larger in the plain, and Stillwater seemed more and more distant. He writhed in the saddle. "'I tell you I'll pay. "'I'll pay the whole value of the hoss if you want.' He was about to say more when he saw the eyes of Ronicky Doone widen and fix. Look, said the other suddenly, you've been cutting her up with the spurs. Greg glanced down to the flank of the bay to discover that he had used the spurs more recklessly than he thought. A sharp rowl had pricked through the skin, and though it was probably only a slight wound indeed, it had brought a smear of red to the surface. Ronicky Doone trembled with anger. Confound you, he said furiously. Any fool would have known that you didn't need a spur on that hoss. What part do you come from where they teach you to kill a hoss when you ride it? Can you tell me that? I'll tell you after I get to Stillwater. I'll see you hung before I see you in Stillwater. You talk too much, Doone, Greg said huskily. I've just begun, said Doone. Then take this and shut up, exclaimed Bill Gregg. Ordinarily he was the straightest and squarest man in the world in a fight but a sudden anger had flared up in him. He had an impulse to kill, to get rid of this obstacle between him and everything he wanted most in life. Without more warning than that, he snatched out his revolver and fired point-blank at Ronicky Doone. Certainly all approaches to a fight had been made, and Doone might have expected the attack. At any rate, as the gun shot out of Greg's holster, the other swung himself sideways in his own saddle, and snapping out his revolver fired from the hip. That swerve to the side saved him, doubtless, from the shot of Greg. His own bullet plowed clear through the thigh of the other rider. The whole leg of Greg went numb, and he found himself slumping helplessly to one side. He dropped his gun, and he had to cling with both hands to lower himself out of the saddle. Now he sat in the dust of the trail and stared stupidly, not at his conqueror, but at the train which was flashing into the little town of Stillwater just below them. He hardly heeded Ronicky Doone as the latter started forward with an oath, knelt beside him and examined the wound. "'It's clean,' Doone said, as he started ripping up his undershirt to make bandages. 
I'll have you fixed so you can be gotten into still water. He began to work rapidly, twisting the claws around Greg's thigh, which he had first laid bare by some dexterous use of a hunting knife. Then Greg turned his eyes to those of Dune. The train had pulled out of still water. The sound of the coughing engine as it started up came faintly to them after a moment. Of all the damn fools, said the two men in one voice. And then they grinned at each other. Certainly it was not the first fight, or the first wound, for either of them. I'm sorry, they began again, speaking together in chorus. Matter of fact, said Ronicky Doone, that bay means a pile to me. When I seen the red on her side, can't be more than a chance prick. I know, said Ronicky Doone, but I didn't stop to think. And I should have give you fair warning before I went for the gat. Look here, said Ronicky, you talk like a straight sort of gent to me. "'And you thought I was a cross between a hoss-thief and a gunfighter? "'I don't know what I thought, except that I wanted my mare back. "'Stranger, I'm no in sorry this has happened. "'Maybe you'd let me know why you was in such a hurry to get to Stillwater. "'If there's any trouble coming down the road behind you, "'maybe I can help take care of it for you.' "'And he smiled coldly and significantly at Bill Gregg. "'The latter eyed with some wonder the man who had just shot him down "'and was now offering to fight for his safety.' "'Nothing like that,' said Bill. "'I was going to Stillwater to meet a girl. "'As much of a rush as that, all to see a girl? "'On that train?' "'Ronicky Doone whistled softly, and I messed it up. "'But why didn't you tell me what you wanted?' "'I didn't have a chance. "'Besides, I couldn't waste time in talking "'and explaining to everybody along the road. "'Sure you couldn't, but the girl will forgive you "'when she finds out what happened. "'No, she won't.' "'because she'll never find out. "'Eh? "'I don't know where she is. "'Riding all that way just to see a girl? "'It's a long story, partner, "'and this leg is beginning to act up. "'Tell you the best thing would be "'for you to jump on your mare "'and jog into Stillwater for a buckboard, "'and then come back and get me. "'What do you say?' Twenty minutes after Ronicky Doone "'had swung into the saddle "'and raced down the road, "'the buckboard arrived, "'and the wounded man was helped "'onto a pile of blankets "'in the body of the wagon. The shooting, of course, was explained by the inevitable gun accident. Ronicky Doone happened to be passing along that way and saw Bill Gregg looking over his revolver as he rode along. At that moment the gun exploded and... The two men who had come out in the buckboard listened to the tale with expressionless faces. As a matter of fact, they had already heard in Stillwater that no less a person than Ronicky Doone was on his way toward that village in pursuit of a man who had ridden off on the famous bay mare, Lou but they accepted Ronicky's bland version of the accident with perfect calm and with many expressions of sympathy. They would have other things to say after they had deposited the wounded man in Stillwater. The trip was a painful one for Bill Gregg. For one thing, the exhaustion of the three days' long trip was now causing a wave of weariness to sweep over him. The numbness, which had come through the leg immediately after the shooting, was now replaced by a steady and continued aching and more than all he was unnerved by the sense of utter failure, utter loss. Never in his life had he fought so bitterly and steadily for a thing, and yet he had lost at the very verge of success. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 At Stillwater The true story, of course, was known almost at once. But since Ronicky Doone swore that he would tackle the first man who accused him of shooting down Bill Gregg, the talk was confined to whispers. In the meantime, Stillwater rejoiced in the possession of Ronicky Doone. Beyond one limited section of the mountain desert, he was not as yet known, but he had one of those personalities which are called electric. Whatever he did seemed greater because he, Ronicky Doone, had done it. Not that he had done a great many things as yet, but there was a peculiar feeling in the air that Ronicky Doone was capable of great and strange performances. Men older than he were willing to accept him as their leader. Men younger than he idolized him. Ronicky Doone, then, the admired of all beholders, is leaning in the doorway of Stillwater's second and best hotel. His bandana today is a terrific yellow, set off with crimson half-moon and stars strewn liberally on it. His shirt is merely white 
but it is given some significance by having nearly half of a red silk handkerchief falling out of the breast pocket. His sombrero is one of those works of art which Mexican families pass from father to son, only his was new and had not yet received that limp effect of age. And, like the gaudiest Mexican headpiece, the band of this sombrero was of purest gold, beaten into the forms of various saints. Ronicky Doon knew nothing at all about saints, but he approved very much of the animation of the martyrdom scenes, and felt reasonably sure that his hat-band could not be improved upon in the entire length and breadth of Stillwater, and the young men of the town agreed with him, to say nothing of the girls. They also admired his riding-gloves, which, a strange affectation in a country of buckskin, were always the softest and smoothest and most comfortable kid that could be obtained. Truth to tell, he did not handle a rope. He could not tell the noose end of a lariat from the straight end, hardly. Neither did Ronicky Doon know the slightest thing about barbed wire, except how to cut it when he wished to ride through. Let us look closely at his hands themselves, as Ronicky stands in the door of the hotel and stares at people walking by, for he has taken off his gloves, and he now rolls a cigarette. They are very long hands. The fingers are extremely slender and tapering. The wrists are round, and almost as innocent of sinews as the wrists of a woman, save when he grips something, and then how they stand out. But most remarkable of all, the skin of the palms of those hands is amazingly soft. It is truly as soft as the skin of the hand of a girl. There were some who shook their heads when they saw those hands. There were some who inferred that Ronicky Doon was little better than a scapegrace and that, in reality, he had never done a better or more useful thing than handle cards or swing a revolver, in both of which arts it was admitted that he was incredibly dexterous. As a matter of fact, since there was no estate from which he drew an income, and since he had never been known in the entire history of his young life to do a single stroke of productive work of any kind, the bitter truth was that Ronicky Doon was no better and no worse than a common gambler. Indeed, if to play a game of chance was to commit a sin, Ronicky Doon was a very great sinner. Yet it should be remarked that he lacked the fine art of taking the money of other less clever fellows when they were intoxicated, and he also lacked the fine hardness of mind which enables many gamblers to enjoy taking the last cent from an opponent. Also, though he knew the entire list of tricks in the repertoire of a crooked gambler, he had never been known to employ tricking. He trusted in a calm head, a quick judgment, an ability to read character. And, though he occasionally met with crooked professionals who were wolves in the guise of sheep, no one had ever been known to play more than one crooked trick at cards when playing against Ronicky Doon. So on the whole, he made a very good living. What he had, he gave or threw away in wild spending or loan to friends, of whom he had a vast number all of which goes to explain the soft hands of Ronicky Doon and his nervous, swift-moving fingers, as he stood at the door of the hotel. For he who plays long with cards or dice begins to have a special sense developed in the tips of his fingers, so that they seem to be independent intelligences. He crossed his feet. His boots were the finest leather, bench-made by the best bootmakers, and they fitted the high-arched instep with the elastic smoothness of gloves. The man of the mountain desert dresses the extremities, and cares not at all for the midsections. The moment Doon was off his horse, those boots had to be dressed, and rubbed, and polished to softness and brightness before this luxurious gambler would walk about town. From the heel of the boots extended a long pair of spurs. Surely a very great vanity, for never in her life had his beautiful mare, Lou, needed even a touch of a spur but Ronicky Doon could not give up this touch of luxury. The spurs were plated heavily with gold, and they swept up and out in a long, exquisite curve, the hub of the row set with diamonds. In a word, Ronicky Doon was a dandy, but he had this peculiarity that he seemed to dress to please himself rather than the rest of the world. His glances never roved about taking account of the admiration of others. As he leaned there in the door of the hotel, he was the type of the young, happy, genuine, carefree fellow, whose mind is no heavier with a thousand dollars or a thousand cents in his pocket. 
Suddenly he started from his lounging place, caught his hat more firmly over his eyes, threw away his unlighted cigarette, and hurried across the veranda of the hotel. He had seen an enemy to chastise, or an old friend to greet, or a pretty girl? No, it was only old Judd Harding, the blacksmith, whose hand had lost its strength, but who still worked iron as others mold putty, simply because he had the genius for his craft. He was staggering now under a load of boards, which he was shouldering to carry to his shop. In a moment that load was shifted to the shoulder of Ronicky Doone, and then they went down the street, laughing and talking, until the load was dropped on the floor of Harding's shop. "'And how's the sick feller coming?' asked Harding. "'Coming fine,' answered Ronicky. "'Couple of days, and I'll have him out for a little exercise. Lucky thing it was a clean wound, and didn't nick the bone. As soon as it's healed over, he'll never know he was plugged.' Harding considered his young friend with twinkling eyes. "'Queer thing to me,' he said, "'is how you and this gent Greg have hit it off so well together. "'Might almost say it was like you'd shot Greg, "'and now you was trying to make up for it. "'But of course that ain't the truth.' "'Of course not,' said Ronicky gravely, "'and met the eye of Harding without faltering. "'Another queer thing,' went on the cunning old Smith. "'He was fooling with his gun while he was in the saddle, "'which just means that the muzzle must have been pretty close to his skin.' "'But there wasn't any sign of a powder burn, the doc says. "'But his trousers was pretty bad burned, I guess,' said Ronicky. "'Hm,' said the blacksmith. "'That's the first time I've heard about it.' "'He went on more seriously. "'I've got something to tell you, Ronicky. "'Ever hear the story about the gent that took pity on the snake that was stiff with cold "'and brought the snake in to warm him up beside the fire? "'The minute the snake come to life, he sunk his fangs into the gent that had saved him. "'Meaning?' said Ronicky, that because I've done a good turn for Greg, I'd better look out for him? Meaning nothing, said Harding, except that the reason the snake bit the gent was because he'd had a stone heaved at him by the same man one day, and he hadn't forgotten. But Ronicky Doone merely laughed, and turned back toward the hotel. End of Chapter 3 Chapter 4 His Victim's Trouble Yet he could not help pondering the words of old Harding. Bill Gregg had been a strange patient. He had never repeated his first offer to tell his story. He remained sullen and silent, with his brooding eyes fixed on the blank wall before him, and nothing could permanently cheer him. Some inward gloom seemed to possess the man. The first day after the shooting, he insisted on scrawling a painfully written letter, while Ronicky propped a writing board in front of him as he lay flat on his back in the bed, but that was his only act. Thereafter he remained silent and brooding. Perhaps it was hatred for Ronicky that was growing in him, as the sense of disappointment increased. For Ronicky, after all, had kept him from reaching that girl when the train passed through Stillwater. Perhaps, for all Ronicky knew, his bullet had ruined the happiness of two lives— he shrugged that disagreeable thought away, and, reaching the hotel, he went straight up to the room of the sick man. Bill, he said gently, have you been spending all your time hating me? Is that what keeps you thin and glum? Is it because you sit here all day blaming me for the things that have happened to you? The dark face flushed, and the uneasy flicker of Greg's glance gave sufficient answer. Ronicky Doone sighed and shook his head, but not in anger. "'You don't have to talk,' he said. "'I see that I'm right. "'And I don't blame you, Bill, "'because maybe I've spoiled things pretty generally for you.' "'At first the silence of Bill Gregg "'admitted that he felt the same way about the matter. "'Yet he finally said aloud, "'I don't blame you. "'Maybe you thought I was a hoss thief. "'But the thing is done, Ronicky, "'and it can never be undone. "Greg," said Ronicky, "'do you know what you're going to do now?' "'I don't know.' "'You're going to sit there and roll a cigarette and tell me the whole yarn. "'You ain't through with this little chase. "'Not if I have to drag you along with me. "'But first just figure that I'm your older brother or something like that "'and get rid of the whole yarn. "'Got to have the ore specimens before you can assay em. "'Besides, it'll help a pile to get the poison out of your system. "'If you feel like cussing me hearty when the time comes, go ahead and cuss. "'But I got to hear that story. "'Maybe it would help.' said Greg, but it's a fool story to tell. Leave that to me to say whether it's a fool story or not. 
You start talking. Greg shifted himself to a more comfortable position, as is the immemorial custom of storytellers, and his glance missed it a little with the flood of recollections. Started along back about a year ago, he said. I was up to the Sullivan Mountains working a claim. There wasn't much to it, just enough to keep me going sort of comfortable. I pegged away at it pretty steady, leading a lonely life and hoping every day I'd cut my way down to a good lead. Well, the fine ore never showed up. Meanwhile, I got pretty weary of the same mountains staring me in the face all the time. I didn't even have a dog with me for conversation, so I got to thinking. Thinking is a bad thing, mostly. Don't you agree, Ronicky? It sure is, replied Ronicky instantly. Not a bit of doubt about it. It starts you doubting things, went on Greg bitterly, and pretty soon you're even doubting yourself. Here he cast an envious glance at the smooth brow of his companion. But I guess that never happened to you, Ronicky. You'd be surprised if I told you, said Ronicky. Well, went on Bill Gregg, I got so darn tired of my own thoughts and of myself that I decided something ought to be done, something to give me new things to think about. So I sat down and went over the whole deal. I had to get new ideas. Then I thought of what a gent told me once. He'd got pretty interested in mining and figured he wanted to know all about how the fancy things was done. So he sent off to some correspondence schools. Well, they're a great bunch. They say, write us a lot of letters and ask us your questions. Before you're through, you'll know something you want to know. See? I see. I didn't have anything special I wanted to learn, except how to use myself for company when I got tired of solitaire. So I sat down and wrote this here correspondence school and says, I want to do something interesting. How do you figure that I had better begin? And what do you think they answered back? I don't know, said Ronicky, his interest steadily increasing. Well, sir, the first thing they wrote back was, We have your letter, and we think in the first place you had better learn how to write. That was a queer answer, wasn't it? It sure was, Ronicky swallowed a smile. Every time I looked at that letter it sure made me plumb mad. And I looked at it a hundred times a day, and come near to tearing it up every time. But I didn't, continued Bill. Why not? Because it was a woman that wrote it. I told by the hand after a while. A woman? Go on, Bill. This story sure sounds different than most. It ain't even started to get different yet, said Bill gloomily. Well, that letter made me so plumb mad that I sat down and wrote everything I could think of that a gent would write to a girl to let her know what he thought about her. And what do you think happened? She wrote you back the prettiest letter you ever seen, suggested Ronicky, saying how she'd never meant to make you mad, and that if you... Say, broke in Bill Gregg, did I show that letter to you? Nope, I was just guessing at what a woman would do. You see? No, I don't. I could never figure them as close as that. Anyway, that's the thing she done right enough. She writes me a letter that was smooth as oil, and suggests that I go on with the composition course to learn how to write. Gonna have you do books, Bill? I ain't a plumb fool, Ronicky. But I thought it wouldn't do no harm to unlimber my pen and fire out a few words a day. So I done it. I started writing what they told me to write about, the things that was around me, with a lot of lessons about how you can't use the same word twice on one page, and how terrible bad it is to use passive verbs. What's a passive verb, Bill? I didn't figure that out exactly. However, it seems like there's something that slows you up the way a muddy road slows up a hoss. And then she began talking about the mountains, and then began asking about you, suggested Ronicky with a grin. Confound you, said Bill Gregg. How come you guessed that? I don't know. I just sort of scented what was coming. Well, anyways, that's what she done. And pretty soon she sent me a snapshot of herself. Well, let me see it, said Ronicky Doone calmly. I don't know just where it is, maybe, replied Bill Gregg. I'll tell you. It's around your neck, in that nugget locket you wear there. For a moment Bill Gregg hated the other with his eyes and then he submitted with a sheepish grin, took off the locket, which was made of one big nugget rudely beaten into shape, and opened it for the benefit of Ronicky Doone. 
it showed the latter not a beautiful face, but a pretty one, with a touch of honesty and pride that made her charming. "'Well, as soon as I got that picture,' said Bill Gregg, as he took the locket back, "'I got excited. Looked to me like the girl was made for me. A lot finer than I could ever be, you see, but simple. No frills, no raven beauty, maybe, but darn easy to look at. First thing I done, I went in and got a copy of my face made.' and rushed it back to her, and then he stopped dolefully. What do you think, Ronicky? I don't know, said Ronicky. What happened then? Nothing. Not a thing. Not a word came back from her to answer that letter I'd sent along. Maybe you didn't look rich enough to suit her, Bill. I thought that, and I thought it was my ugly face that might have made her change her mind. I thought of pretty near everything else that was bad about me, and that she might read into my face. Sure made me sick for a long time. Somebody else was correct in my lessons, and that made me sicker than ever. So I sat down and wrote a letter to the head of the school, and told him I'd like the address of that first girl. You see, I didn't even know her name. But I didn't get no answer. Ronicky groaned. It don't look like the best detective in the world could help you find a girl when you don't know her name, he added gently. But maybe she don't want you to find her. I thought that for a long time. Then, a while back, I got a letter from San Francisco saying she was coming on the train through these parts, and could I be in Stillwater, because the train stopped there a couple of minutes. Most like, she thought Stillwater was just sort of across the street from me. Matter of fact, I jumped on a hoss, and it took me three days of breaking my neck to get near Stillwater, and then... He stopped, and cast a gloomy look on his companion. I know, said Ronicky. Then I come and spoiled the whole party. "'Sure makes me sick to think about it.' "'And she's plumb gone,' muttered Bill Gregg. "'I thought maybe the reason I didn't have her correct in my lessons any more "'was because she had to leave the schools and go west. "'So right after I got this drillin' through my leg, you remember, I wrote a letter. "'Sure. It was to her at the schools, but I didn't get no answer. "'I guess she didn't go back there after all. "'She's plumb gone, Ronicky.' "'The other was silent for a moment.' "'How much would you give to find her?' he asked suddenly. "'Half my life,' said Bill Gregg solemnly. "'Then,' said Ronicky, "'we'll make a try at it. "'I got an idea how we can start on the trail. "'I'm going to go with you, partner. "'I've messed up considerable, this little game of yours. "'Now I'm going to do what I can to straighten it out. "'Sometimes two are better than one. "'Anyway, I'm going to stick with you till you found her "'or lost her for good, you see?' Bill Gregg sighed. "'You're pretty straight, Ronicky,' he said. "'But what good does it do for two gents to look for a needle in a haystack? "'How could we start to hit the trail? "'This way. "'We know the train that she took. "'Maybe we could find a Pullman conductor that was on it. "'And he might remember her. "'They got good memories, some of them gents. "'We'll start to find him, which it ought to be pretty easy. "'Ronicky, I'd have never thought of that in a million years.' It ain't thinkin' we want now. It's actin'. When can you start with me? I'll be fit tomorrow. Then tomorrow we start. End of chapter four. Chapter five. Macklin's Library. Robert Macklin, Pullman conductor, had risen to the eminent position so early in life that the glamour of it had not yet passed away. He was large enough to have passed for a champion wrestler, or a burly pugilist, and he was small enough to glory in the smallest details of his work. Having at the age of thirty, through a great deal of luck and a touch of accident, secured his place, he possessed, at least, sufficient dignity to fill it. He was one of those rare men that carry their dignity with them past the door of their homes. Robert Macklin's home, during the short intervals when he was off the trains, was a tiny apartment. It was really one not overly large room, with a little alcove adjoining. But Robert Macklin had seized the opportunity to hang a curtain across the alcove, and since it was large enough to contain a chair and a bookshelf, he referred to it always as his library. He was this morning seated in his library, with his feet protruding through the curtains and resting on the foot of his bed, when the doorbell rang. He surveyed himself in his mirror before he answered it. 
Having decided that in his dressing gown he was imposing enough, he advanced to the door and slowly opened it. He saw before him two sun-darkened men, whose soft gray hats proclaimed that they were newly come out of the West. This one was a fellow whose face had been made stern by hard work and few pleasures in life. The other was one who, apparently, had never worked at all. There was something about him that impressed Robert Macklin. He might be a young Western millionaire, for instance. Aside from his hat, he was dressed with elaborate care. He wore gray spats, and his clothes were obviously well tailored, and his necktie was done in a bow. On the whole, he was a very cool, comfortable-looking chap. The handkerchief, which protruded from his breast pocket and showed an edging of red, was a trifle noisy, and the soft gray hat was hardly in keeping, but on the whole he was a dashing-looking chap. The baggy trousers and the blunt shoes of his companion were to Robert Macklin a distinct shock. He centered all his attention instantly on the younger of the two visitors. "'You're Robert Macklin, I guess,' said the handsome man. "'I am,' said Macklin, and stepping back from the door he invited them in with a sweeping gesture. There were only two chairs, but the younger of the strangers immediately made himself comfortable on the bed. "'My name's Dune,' he said, "'and this is Mr. William Gregg. "'We think that you have some information which we can use. "'Mind if we fire a few questions?' "'Certainly not,' said Robert Macklin. "'At the same time he began to arm himself with caution. "'One could never tell.' "'Matter of fact,' went on Ronicky smoothly, lighting a tailor-made cigarette, while his companion rolled one of his own making, "'we are looking for a lady who was on one of your trains. "'We think you may possibly remember her. "'Here's a picture.' And as he passed a snapshot to the Pullman conductor, he went on with the details of the date and the number of the train. Robert Macklin, in the meantime, studied the picture carefully. He had a keen eye for faces, but when it came to pretty faces— his memory was a veritable lion. He had talked a few moments to this very girl, and she had smiled at him. The memory made Robert Macklin's lips twitch just a trifle, and Ronicky Doone saw it. Presently the dignitary returned the picture and raised his head from thought. "'It is vaguely behind my mind, something about this lady,' he said. "'But I'm sorry to say, gentlemen, I really don't know you, and—' "'Why don't you know us?' broke in Bill Gregg. "'Ain't my partner just introduced us?' "'Exactly,' said Robert Macklin, "'and his opinion of the two sank a full hundred points. "'Such grammar proclaimed a ruffian. "'You don't get his drift,' Ronicky was explaining to his companion. "'I introduced us, but he doesn't know who I am. "'We should have brought along a letter of introduction.' "'He turned to Macklin. "'I am mighty sorry I didn't get one,' he said. "'It came to Macklin for a fraction of a second that he was being mocked, but he instantly dismissed the foolish thought. Even the rough fellows must be able to recognize a man when they saw one. The point is, went on Ronicky gently, that my friend is very eager for important reasons to see this lady, to find her, and he doesn't even know her name. Here his careful grammar gave out with a crash. You can't beat a deal like that, eh, Macklin? If you can remember anything about her, her name, first— then, where she was bound, who was with her, how tall she is, the color of her eyes, we'd be glad to know anything you know. What can you do for us? Macklin cleared his throat thoughtfully. Gentlemen, he said gravely, if I knew the purpose for which you were seeking the lady, I— The purpose ain't to kidnap her, if that's your drift, said Ronicky. We ain't gonna treat her wrong, partner. Out in our part of the land, they don't do it. Just shake up your thoughts, and see if something about that girl doesn't pop right into your head. Robert Macklin smiled, and carefully shook his head. It seems to be impossible for me to remember a thing, he asserted. Not even the color of her eyes? asked Ronicky, as he grinned. He went on more gravely. I'm pretty dead sure that you do remember something about her. There was a shade of a threat in the voice of this slender youngster and Robert Macklin had been an amateur pugilist of much brawn and a good deal of boxing skill. He cast a weary eye on Ronicky. One punch would settle that fellow. The man Greg might be a harder nut to crack, but it would not take long to finish them both. Robert Macklin thrust his shoulders forward. 
friends,' he said gruffly. "'I don't have much time off. "'This is my day for rest. "'I have to say good-bye.' "'Ronicky Doone stood up with a yawn. "'I thought so,' he said to his companion. "'Mind the door, Greg, "'and see that nobody steps in "'and busts up my little party. "'What are you going to do?' "'Going to argue with this gent "'in a way he'll understand a pile better "'than the chatter we've been making so far.' He stepped a long, light pace forward. Macklin, you know what we want to find out. Will you talk? A cloud of red gathered before the eyes of Macklin. It was impossible that he must believe his ears, and yet the words still rang there. Why curse you, little rat face? burst out Robert Macklin, and stepping in, he leaned forward with a perfect straight left. Certainly his long vacation from boxing had not ruined his eye or stiffened his muscles. With delight he felt the big sinews about his shoulders come into play. Straight and true the big fist drove to the face of the smaller man, but Robert Macklin found that he had punched a hole in thin air. It was as if the very wind of the blow had brushed the head of Ronicky Doone to one side, and at the same time he seemed to sway and stagger forward. A hard, lean fist struck Robert Macklin's body. As he gasped and doubled up, Clubbing his right fist to land a blow behind the ear of Ronicky Doone, the latter bent back, stepped in, and rising on the toes of both feet, whipped a perfect uppercut that in ring parlance rang the bell. The result was that Robert Macklin, his mouth agape and his eyes dull, stood wobbling slowly from side to side. Here, called Ronicky to his companion at the door. Grab him on one side, and I'll take the other. He's out on his feet. Get him to that chair. With Greg's assistance, he dragged the bulk of the man there. Macklin was still stunned. Presently the eyes cleared and filled immediately with horror. Big Robert Macklin sank limply back in the chair. I have no money, he said. I swear I haven't a cent in the place. It's in the bank, but if a check will— We don't want your money this trip, said Ronicky. We want talk, Macklin. A lot of talk— and a lot of true talk. Understand? It's about that girl. I saw you grin when you saw the picture. You remember her well enough. Now start talking, and remember this. If you lie, I'll come back here and find out and use this on you. The eyes of Robert Macklin started from his head as his gaze concentrated on the black muzzle of the gun. He moistened his white lips and managed to gasp. Everything I know, of course, I'll tell you everything, word for word. She, she, her name, I mean. You're doing fine, said Ronicky. Keep it up. And you keep away, Bill. When you come at him with that hungry look, he thinks you're going to eat him up. Fire away, Macklin. What's first? What's she look like? Soft brown hair, blue eyes, her mouth is a little big. That's all right. You don't have to be polite and lie. We want the truth. How big is she? About five feet and five inches. Must weigh around a hundred and thirty pounds. You sure are an expert on the ladies, Macklin, and I'll bet you didn't miss her name. Her name? Don't tell me you missed out on that. No, it, it, it was... Just a minute. Take your time. Carolyn. Take your time now, Macklin. You're doing fine. Don't get confused. Get the last name right. It's the most important to us. I have it, I'm sure. The whole name is Carolyn Smith. There was a groan from Ronicky Doone, and another from Bill Gregg. That's a fine name to use for trailing a person. Did she say anything more, anything about where she expected to be living in New York? I don't remember any more, said Macklin, sullenly, for the spot where Ronicky's fist landed on his jaw was beginning to ache. I didn't sit down and have any chats with her. She just spoke to me once in a while when I did something for her. I suppose you fellows have some crooked work on hand for her. We're bringing her good news, said Ronicky calmly. Now see if you can't remember where she said she lived in New York. And he gave an added point to the question by pressing the muzzle of his revolver a little closer to the throat of the Pullman conductor. The latter blinked and swallowed hard. The only thing I remember was her saying that she could see the East River from her window, I think. And that's all you know? Yes, not a thing more about her to save my life. 
"'Maybe what you know has saved it,' said Ronicky, darkly. The victim eyed him with sullen malevolence. "'Maybe there'll be a new trick or two in this game before it's finished. I'll never forget you, Dune, and you, Greg.' "'You haven't a thing in the world on us,' replied Ronicky. "'I have the fact that you carry a concealed weapon. Only this time. Always. Fellows like you are as lonesome without a gun as they are without a skin.' Ronicky turned to the door and laughed back at the gloomy face, and then they were gone, down the steps and into the street. End of Chapter 5 Chapter 6 The New York Trail On the train to New York that night they carefully summed up their prospects, and what they had gained. "'We started at pretty near nothing,' said Ronicky. He was a professional optimist. We had a picture of a girl, and we knew she was on a certain train bound east three or four weeks ago. That's all we knew. Now we know her name is Carolyn Smith, and that she lives where she can see the East River out of her back window. I guess that narrows it down pretty close, doesn't it, Bill? Close? asked Bill. Close, did you say? Well, we know the trail, said Ronicky cheerily. All we've got to do is locate the shack that stands beside the trail. For old mountain men like us, that ought to be nothing. What sort of stream is this East River, though? Bill Gregg looked at his companion in disgust. He had become so used to regarding Dune as entirely infallible that it amazed and disheartened him to find that there was one topic so large about which Ronicky knew nothing. Perhaps the whole base for the good cheer of Ronicky was his ignorance of everything except the mountain desert. A river's a river, went on Ronicky blandly, and it's got a town beside it, and in the town there's a house that looks over the water. Why, Bill, she's as good as found. New York runs about a dozen miles along the shore of that river, groaned Bill Gregg. A dozen miles, gasped Ronicky. He turned in his seat and stared at his companion. Bill, you sure are making a man-sized joke. There ain't that much city in the world. A dozen miles of houses, one right next to the other? Yep, and one on top of the other. And that ain't all. Start about the center of that town, and swing a twenty-mile line around it, and the end of the line will pass through houses most of the way. Ronicky Doon glared at him in positive alarm. Well, he said, that's different. It sure is. I guess we've come on a wild goose chase, Ronicky, hunting a girl named Smith that lives on the bank of the East River, he laughed bitterly. How come you know so much about New York? asked Ronicky, eager to turn the subject of the conversation until he could think of something to cheer his friend. Books, said Bill Gregg. After that there was a long lull in the conversation. That night neither of them slept long, for every rattle and sway of the train was telling them that they were rocking along toward an impossible task. Even the cheer of Ronicky had broken down the next morning and, though breakfast in the diner restored some of their confidence, he was not the man of the day before. Bill, he confided on the way back to their seats from the diner, there must be something wrong with me. What is it? I don't know, said Bill. Why? People are looking at me. Ain't they got a right to do that? Sure they have, in a way. But when they don't seem to see you, when you see them, and when they begin looking at you out of the corner of their eyes, the minute you turn away, why then it seems to me that they're laughing at you, Bill. What they got to laugh about? I'd punch a gent in the face that laughed at me. Ronicky fell into a philosophical brooding. It can't be done, Bill. You can punch a gent for cussing you, or stepping on your foot, or crowding you, or sneering at you, or talking behind your back, or a thousand other things. But back here in a crowd you can't fight a gent for laughing at you. Laughing is outside of the law most anywheres, Bill. It's the one thing you can't answer back except with more laughing. Even a dog gets sort of sick inside when you laugh at him, and a man is a pile worse. He wants to kill the gent that's laughing, and he wants to kill himself for being laughed at. Well, Bill, that's a good deal stronger than the way they've been laughing at me, but they done enough to make me think a bit. They've been looking at three things, these here spats, the red rim of my handkerchief sticking out of my pocket, and that soft gray hat when I got it on. Durned if I don't see anything wrong with your outfit. Didn't they tell you that was the style back east, to have spats like that on? 
Sure, said Ronicky, but maybe they didn't know, or maybe they go with some, but not with me. Maybe I'm kind of too brown and outdoors looking to fit with spats and handkerchiefs like this. Ronicky, said Bill in admiration, maybe you ain't read a pile, but you figure things out just like a book. The conversation was cut short by the appearance of a drift of houses, and then more and more. From the elevated line on which they ran presently they could look down on block after block of roofs packed close together, or big business structures, as they reached the uptown business section, and finally Ronicky gasped as they plunged into utter darkness that roared past the window. We go underground to the station, Bill Gregg explained. He was a little startled himself, but his reading had fortified him to a certain extent. But is there still more of New York? asked Ronicky humbly. More? We ain't seen a corner of it. Bill's superior information made him swell like a frog in the sun. This is kinder near 100th Street, where we dive down. New York keeps right on to 1st Street, and then it has a lot more streets below that. But that's just the island of Manhattan. All around there's more. Manhattan is mostly where they work. They live other places. It was not very long before the train slowed down to make Grand Central Station. On the long platform, Ronicky surrendered his suitcase to the first porter. Bill Gregg was much alarmed. "'What'd you do that for?' he asked, securing a stronger hold on his own valise and brushing aside two or three red caps. "'He asked me for it,' explained Ronicky. "'I wasn't none too set on giving it to him to carry, but I hated to hurt his feelings. Besides, they're all done up in uniforms. Maybe this is their job. But suppose that feller got away out of sight.' What would you do? Your brand new pair of colts is lying away in it. He won't get out of sight, none, Ronicky assured his friend grimly. I got another colt with me, and no matter how fast he runs, a forty-five slug can run a pile faster. But come on, Bill. The word in this town seems to be to keep right on moving. They passed under an immense, brightly lighted vault, and then wriggled through the crowds in pursuit of the astonishingly agile porter. So they came out of the big station to 42nd Street, where they found themselves confronted by a taxi driver, and the question, Where? I don't know, said Ronicky to Bill. Your reading tell you anything about the hotels in this here town? Not a thing, said Bill, because I never figured I'd be fool enough to come this far away from my home diggings. But here I am, and we don't know nothing. Listen, partner, said Ronicky to the driver, where's a fair to medium place to stop at? The driver swallowed a smile that left a twinkle about his eyes, which nothing could remove. What kind of place? Anywhere from fifty cents to fifty dollars a night. Fifty dollars! exclaimed Bill Gregg. Can you lay over that, Ronicky? Our wad won't last a week. Say, pal, said the taxi driver, becoming suddenly friendly, I can fix you up. I know a little joint where you'll be snug as you want. They'll stick you about one fifty per, but you can't beat the price in this town and keep clean. Take us there, said Bill Gregg, and they climbed into the machine. The taxi turned around, shot down Park Avenue, darted aside into the darker streets to the east of the district, and came suddenly to a halt. Did you follow that trail? asked Bill Gregg in a chuckling whisper. Sure, twice to the left, then to the right, and then to the left again. I know the number of blocks, too. Ain't no reason for getting rattled because a joint is strange to us. New York may be tolerable big, but it's got men in it just like we are, and maybe a lot worse kinds. As they got out of the little car, they saw the taxi driver preceding them, carrying their suitcases. They followed him up the steep pitch of the stairs to the first floor of the hotel, where the landing had been widened to form a little office. Hello, Bert, said the driver. I picked up these gentlemen at Grand Central. They ain't wise to town, so I put em next to you. Fix em up here? Sure, said Bert, lifting a huge bulk of manhood from behind the desk. He placed his fat hands on top of it and observed his guest with a smile. I'll make you right at home here, friends. Thank you, Joe. Joe grinned, nodded, and receiving his money from Bill Gregg, departed down the stairs humming. Their host, in the meantime, had picked up their suitcases and led the way down a hall dimly lighted by two flickering gas jets. Finally he reached a door and led them into a room where the gas had to be lighted. 
it showed them a cheerless apartment in spite of the red of the wallpaper and carpet. "'Only three bucks,' said the proprietor, with the air of one bestowing charity out of the fullness of his heart. "'Bathroom only two doors down. I guess you can't beat this layout, gents.' Bill Gregg glanced once about him and nodded. "'You come up from the south, maybe?' asked the proprietor, lingering at the door. "'West,' said Bill Gregg, curtly. "'You don't say. Then you boys must be used to your toddy at night, eh?' "'It's tolerable dry country out there,' said Ronicky, without enthusiasm. "'All the more reason you need some liquor to moisten it up. "'Wait till I get you a bottle of rye. I got handy.' "'And he disappeared in spite of their protests. "'I ain't a drinkin' man,' said Greg, "'and I know you ain't, "'but it's sure insulting to turn down a drink in these days.' "'Ronicky nodded, and presently the host returned with two glasses, "'rattling against a tall bottle on a tray. "'Say when,' he said, filling the glasses and keeping on, in spite of their protest, until each glass was full. "'I guess it looks pretty good to you to see the stuff again,' he said, stepping back and rubbing his hands like one warmed by the consciousness of a good deed. "'It ain't very plentiful round here.' "'Well,' Greg said, swinging up his glass, "'here's in your eye, Ronicky, and here's to you, sir.' "'Wait,' replied Ronicky. "'Hold on a minute, Bill.' "'Looks to me like you ain't drinkin', he said to the proprietor. The fat man waved the suggestion aside. "'Never touch it,' he assured them. "'Used to indulge a little in light wines and beers, when the country was wet. "'But when it went dry, the stuff didn't mean enough to me to make it worth while dodging the law. "'I managed to keep a little of it around for friends and men out of a dry country. "'But we got a funny habit out in our country. "'We can't no ways drink unless the gent that's setting them out takes something himself.' "'It ain't done that way in our part of the land,' said Ronicky. "'It ain't? Never. Come, come. That's a good joke, but even if I can't be with you boys, drink hearty.' Ronicky Doon shook his head. "'No joke at all,' he said firmly. "'Matter of politeness, that a lot of gents are terrible hard set on out where we come from.' "'Why, Ronicky,' protested Bill, "'ain't you making it a little strong?' For my part, I've drunk twenty times without having the gent that set em up touch a thing. I reckon I can do it again. Here's how. Wait, declared Ronicky Doon. And there was a little jarring ring in his voice that arrested the hand of Bill Gregg in the act of raising the glass. Ronicky crossed the room quickly, took a glass from the washstand, and returning to the center table, poured a liberal drink of whiskey into it. "'I don't know about my friend,' he went on almost sternly, to the bewildered hotel-keeper. "'I don't know about him, but some gents feel so strong about not drinking alone that they'd sooner fight. "'Well, sir, I'm one of that kind. "'So I say, there's your liquor. Get rid of it.' The fat man reached the center of the table and propped himself against it, gasping. His whole body seemed to be wilting, as though in a terrible heat. "'I don't know,' he murmured. "'I don't know what's got into you fellers. "'I tell you, I never drink.' "'You lie, you fat fool,' retorted Ronicky. "'Didn't I smell your breath?' "'Bill Gregg dropped his own glass to the table "'and hurriedly came to confront his host by the side of Ronicky. "'Breathe,' he asked the fat man hurriedly, "'still gasping more and more heavily for air. "'I—I I may have taken a small tonic after dinner. "'In fact, I think I did. "'That's all, nothing more. "'I assure you, I—' I have to be a sober man in my work. You got to make an exception this evening, said Ronicky, more fiercely than ever. I ought to make you drink all three drinks for being so slow about drinking one. Three drinks? exclaimed the fat man, trembling violently. It, it would kill me. I think it would, said Ronicky. I swear I think it would. And maybe even one will be sort of a shock, eh? He commanded suddenly, Drink. "'Drink that glass and clean out the last drop of it, "'or we'll tie you and pry your mouth open "'and pour the whole bottle down your throat. "'You understand?' "'A feeble moan came from the throat of the hotel-keeper. "'He cast one frantic glance toward the door, "'and a still more frantic appeal centered on Ronicky Doon, "'but the face of the latter was as cold as stone. "'Then take your own glasses, boys,' he said, "'striving to smile as he picked up his own drink.' "'You drink first, and you drink alone,' declared Ronicky. "'Now!' The movement of his hand was as ominous as if he had whipped out a revolver. 
the fat man tossed off the glass of whiskey and then stood with a pudgy hand pressed against his breast and the upward glance of one who awaits a calamity under the astonished eyes of bill gregg he turned pale a sickly greenish pallor his eyes rolled and his hand on the table shook and the arm that supported him sagged open the window he said the air there ain't no air i'm choking and get him some water cried bill gregg whilst i open the window stay where you are bill he looks like he's dying then he's killed himself gents began the fat man feebly and made a short step toward them the step was incomplete in the middle of it he wavered put out his arms and slumped upon his side on the floor bill gregg cried out softly in astonishment and horror but ronicky doone knelt calmly beside the fallen bulk and felt the beating of his heart he ain't dead he said quietly but he'll be tolerable sick for a while now come along with me but what's all this mean asked bill gregg in a whisper as he picked up his suitcase and hurried after ronicky doped booze said ronicky curtly they hurried down the stairs and came out onto the dark street then ronicky doone dropped his suitcase and dived into the dark nook beside the entrance there was a brief struggle he came out again pushing a sulking figure before him with the man's arm twisted behind his back take off this gent's hat will you asked ronicky bill gregg obeyed too dumb with astonishment to think it's the taxi driver he exclaimed i thought so muttered ronicky the skunk came back here to wait till we were fixed right now what'll we do with him i begin to see what's coming off said bill gregg frowning into the white scowling face of the taxi driver the man was like a rat but in spite of his fear he did not make a sound over there said bill gregg nodding toward a flight of cellar stairs they caught the man between them rushed him to the stairs and flung him headlong down there was a crashing fall groans and then silence he'll have a broken bone or two maybe said ronicky peering calmly into the darkness but he'll live to trap somebody else curse him and picking up their suitcases again they started to retrace their steps end of chapter 6 chapter 7 the first clue they did not refer to the incidents of that odd reception in new york until they had located a small hotel for themselves not three blocks away it was no cheaper but they found a pleasant room clean with electric lights it was not until they had bathed and were propped up in their beds for a good night smoke which cowpunchers love that bill gregg asked and what gave you the tip ronicky i don't know in my business you learn to watch faces bill suppose you sit down at a five-handed game of poker one gent says everything with his face while he's picking up his cards another gent don't say a thing but he shows what he's got by the way he moves his chair or the way he opens and shuts his hands when you said something about our wad i seen the taxi driver blink right after that he got terrible friendly and said he could steer us to a friend of his that could put us up for the night pretty comfortable well it wasn't hard to put two and two together not that i figured anything out just was walking on my toes ready to jump in any direction as for bill gregg he brooded for a time on what he had heard then shook his head and sighed i'd be a mighty helpless kid in this here town if i didn't have you along ronicky he said nope insisted ronicky long as you use another gent for a sort of guide you feel kinda helpless but when you step off for yourself everything is pretty easy you were just waiting for me to take the lead or you'd have done just as much by yourself again bill gregg sighed as he shook his head if this is what new york is like he said we're in for a pretty bad time and this is what they call a civilized town great guns they need martial law and a thousand policemen to the block to keep a gent's life and pocketbook safe in this town first gent we meet tries to bump us off and get our wad don't look like we're going to have much luck ronicky we saved our hides i guess that's about all and we learned something sure then i figure it was a pretty good night another thing bill i got an idea from that taxi gent i figure that a whole gang of taxi men are pretty sharp in the eye what i mean is that we can tramp up and down along this here east river 
and now and then we'll talk to some taxi men that do most of their work from stands in them parts of the town. Maybe we can get on our trail that way. Anyways, it's an opening. Maybe, said Bill Gregg dubiously. He reached under his pillow, but I'm sure going to sleep with my gun under my head in this town. With this remark, he settled himself for repose, and presently was snoring loudly. Ronicky presented a brave face to the morning, and at once started with Bill Gregg to tour along the East River. That first day, Ronicky insisted that they simply walk over the whole ground, so as to become fairly familiar with the scale of their task. They managed to make the trip before night, and returned to their hotel, footsore from the hard, hot pavements. There was something unkindly and ungenerous in those pavements, it seemed to Ronicky. He was discovering to his great amazement that the loneliness of the mountain desert is nothing at all compared to the loneliness of the Manhattan crowd. The very gloomy and silent cowpunchers ate their dinner that night and went to bed early. But in the morning they began the actual work of their campaign. It was an arduous labor. It meant interviewing at every district one or two shopkeepers, and asking the mail carriers for Carolyn Smith, and showing the picture to taxi drivers. These latter were the men, insisted Ronicky, who would eventually bring them to Carolyn Smith. Because if they've ever drove a girl as pretty as that, they'll remember for quite a while. But half these gents ain't going to talk to us, even if they know, Bill Gregg protested, after he had been gruffly refused an answer a dozen times in the first morning. Some of em won't talk, admitted Ronicky, but that's probably because they don't know. Take em by and large, most gents like to tell everything they know and then some. As a matter of fact, they met with rather more help than they wanted. In spite of all their efforts to remain casual, there was something too romantic in this search for a girl to remain entirely unnoticed. People whom they asked became excited, and offered them a thousand suggestions. Everybody, it seemed, had somewhere, somehow, heard of a Carolyn Smith living on his own block and every one remembered dimly having passed a girl on the street who looked exactly like Carolyn Smith. But they went resolutely on, running down a thousand false clues, and finding at the end of each something more ludicrous than what had gone before. Maiden ladies with many teeth and big glasses they found, and they discovered at the end of the trails on which they were to go, young women, and old, ugly girls, and pretty ones, but never any one who in the slightest degree resembled Carolyn Smith. In the meantime they were working back and forth in their progress along the East River, from the slums to the better residence districts. They bought newspapers at little stationery stores, and worked up chance conversations with the clerks, particularly girl clerks, whenever they could find them. Because women have an eye for faces, Ronicky would say, and if a girl like Carolyn Smith came into the shop, she'd be remembered for a while but for ten days they labored without a ghost of a success. Then they noticed the taxi stands along the east side and worked them as carefully as they could. And it was on the evening of the eleventh day of the search that they reached the first clue. They had found a taxi drawn up before a saloon, converted into an eating place, and when they went inside they found the driver alone in the restaurant. They worked up a conversation as they had done a hundred times before, and Greg produced the picture and began showing it to Ronicky. "'Maybe the ladies around here,' said Ronicky, "'but I'm new in this part of town.' He took the picture and turned to the taxi driver. "'Maybe you've been around this part of town "'and know the folks here. "'Ever see this girl around?' "'And he passed the picture to the other. "'The taxi driver bowed his head over it "'in a close scrutiny. "'When he looked up, his face was blank. "'I don't know. Let me see. "'I think I seen a girl like her the other day, "'waiting for the traffic to pass "'at 72nd and Broadway.' Yep, she sure was a ringer for this picture. He passed the picture back, and a moment later he finished his meal. He paid his check and went sauntering through the door. Quick, said Ronicky, the moment the chauffeur had disappeared. Pay the check and come along. That fellow knows something. Bill Gregg, greatly excited, obeyed, and they hurried to the door of the place. They were in time to see the taxi driver lurch away from the curb and go humming down the street, while the driver leaned out to the side and looked back. He didn't see us, said Ronicky, confidently. But what did he leave for? He's going to tell somebody somewhere that we're looking for Carolyn Smith. Come on. He stepped out to the curb and stopped a passing taxi. Follow that machine and keep a block away from it, he ordered. 
Bootlegger? asked the taxi driver cheerily. I don't know, but just drift along behind him till he stops. Can you do that? Watch me. And with Ronicky and Bill Gregg installed in his machine, he started smoothly on the trail. Straight down the cross street, under the roaring elevated tracks of Second and Third Avenues, they passed, and on First Avenue, they turned and darted sharply south for a round dozen blocks, then went due east and came to a halt after a brief run. He stopped in Beekman Place, said the driver, jerking open the door. If I run in there, he'll see me. Ronicky stepped out of the machine, paid him, and dismissed him with a word of praise for his fine trailing. Then he stepped around the corner. What he saw was a little street closed at both ends, and only two or three blocks long. It had the serene, detached air of a village a thousand miles from any great city, with its grave rows of homely houses standing solemnly face to face. Well to the left, the 59th Street Bridge swung its great arch across the river, and it led, Ronicky knew, to Long Island City beyond, but here everything was cupped in the village quiet. The machine which they had been pursuing was drawn up on the right-hand side of the street, looking south, and even as Ronicky glanced around the corner he saw the driver leave his seat, dart up a flight of stairs, and ring the bell. Ronicky could not see who opened the door, but after a moment of talk the chauffeur from the car they had pursued was allowed to enter. And as he stepped across the threshold he drew off his cap with a touch of reverence which seemed totally out of keeping for his character as Ronicky had seen it. "'Bill,' he said to Greg, "'we've got something. You see him go up those steps to that house?' Sure. Bill Gregg's eyes were flashing with excitement. That house has somebody in it who knows Carolyn Smith, and that somebody is excited because we're hunting for her, said Bill. Maybe it holds Carolyn Smith herself. Who can tell that? Let's go see. Wait till the taxi driver goes. If he wanted us to know about Carolyn, he'd have told us. He doesn't want us to know, and he'd maybe take it pretty much to heart if he knew we'd followed him. What he thinks doesn't worry me none. I can tend to three like him. Maybe, but you couldn't handle thirty, and coyotes like him hunt in packs, always. The best fighting pair of coyotes that ever stepped wouldn't have no chance against a loafer wolf, but no loafer wolf could stand off a dozen or so of the little devils. So keep clear of these little rat-faced gents, Bill. They hunt in crowds. Presently they saw the chauffeur coming down the steps. Even at that distance it could be seen that he was smiling broadly, and that he was intensely pleased with himself and the rest of the world. Starting up his machine, he swung it around dexterously, as only New York taxi drivers can, and sped down the street by the way he had come, passing Greg and Ronicky, who had flattened themselves against the fence to keep from being seen. They observed that while he controlled the car with one hand, with the other he was examining the contents of his wallet. "'Money for him!' exclaimed Ronicky as soon as the car was out of sight around the corner. "'This begins to look pretty thick, Bill. "'Because he goes and tell them that he's taken us off the trail, "'they not only thank him, but they pay him for it. "'And, by the face of him as he went by, they pay him pretty high. "'Bill, it's easy to figure that they don't want any friend near Carolyn Smith, "'and most like they don't even want us near that house.' "'I only want to go near it once,' said Bill Gregg. I just want to find out if the girl's there. Go break in on em? Break in, Ronicky? That's burglary. It sure is. I'll just ask for Carolyn Smith at the door. Try it. The irony made Bill Gregg stop in the very act of leaving and glance back, but he went on again resolutely and stamped up the steps to the front door of the house. It was opened to him almost at once by a woman, for Bill's hat came off. For a moment he was explaining— then there was a pause in his gestures as she made the reply. Finally he spoke again, but was cut short by the loud banging of the door. Bill Gregg drew himself up rigidly and slowly replaced the hat on his head. If a man had turned that trick on him, a forty-five caliber slug would have gone crashing through the door in search of him to tell him a Westerner's opinion of such manners. Ronicky Doone could not help smiling to himself, as he saw Bill Gregg stamp stiffly down the stairs, limping a little on his wounded leg, and come back with a grave dignity to the starting point. He was still crimson to the roots of his hair. "'Let's start,' he said. "'If that happens again, I'll be doing a couple murders in this here town, and getting myself hung.' "'What happened?' 
an old hag jerked open the door after I rang the bell. I asked her nice and polite if a lady named Carolyn Smith was in the house. No, she says, and if she was, what's it to you? I told her I'd come a long ways to see Carolyn. Then you go a long ways back without seeing Carolyn, says the withered old witch, and she banged the door right in my face. Man, I'm still seeing red. Them words of the old woman were whips, and every one of them sure took off my hide. I used to think that old lady Moore in Martindale was a pretty nasty talker, but this one laid her over a mile. But we're beat, Ronicky. You couldn't get by that old woman with a thousand men. Maybe not, said Ronicky, but we're going to try. Did you look at the house across the street and see a sign a while ago? Which side? Side right opposite Carolyn's house. Sure. Room to rent. Thought so. Then that's our room. Eh? That's our room, partner, and right at the front window, over the street, one of us is going to keep watch day and night till we make sure that Carolyn Smith don't live in that house. Is that right? That's a great idea. He started away from the fence. Wait. Ronicky caught him by the shoulder and held him back. We'll wait till night, and then go and get the room. If Carolyn is in the house yonder, and they know we're looking for her, it's easy that she won't be allowed to come out of the front of the house so long as we're perched up at that window, waiting to see her. We'll come back tonight and start waiting. End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 Two Apparitions They found that the room in the house on Beekman Place opposite that which they felt covered their quarry, could be secured, and they were shown to it by a quiet gentlewoman, found a big double room that ran across the whole length of the house. From the back it looked down on the lights glimmering on the black East River, and across to the flare of Brooklyn. To the left the whole arc of the 59th Street Bridge was exposed. In the front windows overlooked Beekman Place, and were directly opposite the front of the house to which the taxi driver had gone that afternoon. Here they took up the vigil. For four hours one of the two sat with his eyes never moving from that street and the windows of the house across the street, and then he left the post and the other took it. It was vastly wearying work. Very few vehicles came into the light of the street lamp beneath them, and every person who dismounted from one of them had to be scrutinized with painful diligence. Once a girl, young and slender and sprightly, stepped out of a taxi about ten o'clock at night, and ran lightly up the steps of the house. Ronicky caught his friend by the shoulder and dragged him to the window. "'There she is now!' he exclaimed. But the eye of the lover, even though the girl was in a dim light, could not be deceived. The moment he caught her profile, as she turned in the open door, Bill Gregg shook his head. "'That's not the one. She's all different. A pile different, Ronicky.' Ronicky sighed. I thought it was her, he said. Go on back to sleep. I'll call you again if anything happens. But nothing happened that night, though even in the dull, ghost hours of the early morning they did not relax their vigil. But all the next day there was no sign of Carolyn Smith in the house across the street. No face like hers ever appeared at the windows. Apparently the place was a harmless rooming house, of fairly good quality. Not a sign of Carolyn Smith appeared, even during the second day. By this time the nerves of the two watchers were shattered by the constant strain, and the monotonous view from the front window was beginning to madden them. "'It's proof that she ain't yonder,' said Bill Gregg. "'Here's two days gone, and not a sign of her. It sure means that she ain't in the house, unless she's sick in bed,' and he grew pale at the thought. "'Partner,' said Ronicky Doone, "'if they are trying to keep her away from us, they sure have the sense to keep her under cover for as long as two days. Ain't that right?' It looks pretty bad for us, but I'm staying here for a solid week, anyway. It's just about our last chance, Bill. We've done our hunting pretty near as well as we could. If we don't land her this trip, I'm about ready to give up. Bill Gregg sadly agreed that this was their last chance, and that they must play it to the limit. One week was decided on as a fair test. If, at the end of that time, Carolyn Smith did not come out of the house across the street, they could conclude that she did not stay there. And then there would be nothing for them but to take the first train back west. The third day passed, and the fourth, dreary, dreary days of unfaltering vigilance on the part of the two watchers. 
On the fifth morning even Ronicky Doone sat with his head in his hands at the window, peering through the slit between the drawn curtains, which sheltered him from being observed at his spying. When he called out softly, the sound brought Greg, with one long leap out of the chair where he was sleeping, to the window. There could be no shadow of a doubt about it. There stood Carolyn Smith in the door of the house. She closed the door behind her, and walking to the top of the steps, paused there, and looked up and down the street. Bill Gregg groaned, snatched his hat, and plunged through the door, and Ronicky heard the brief thunder of his feet down the first flight of stairs, then the heavy thumps as he raced around the landing. He was able to trace him down the three flights of steps to the bottom. And so swift was that descent, that when the girl, idling down the steps across the street, came onto the sidewalk, Bill Gregg rushed out from the other side and ran toward her. They made a strange picture as they came to a halt at the same instant, the girl shrinking back in apparent fear of the man, and Bill Gregg stopping by that same show of fear, as though by a blow in the face. There was such contrast between the two figures that Ronicky Doone might have laughed, had he not been shaking his head with sympathy for Bill Gregg. For never had the miner seemed so clumsily big and gaunt, never had his clothes seemed so unpressed and shapeless, while his soft gray hat, to which he still clung religiously, appeared hopelessly out of place in contrast to the slim prettiness of the girl. She wore a black straw hat, turned back from her face, with a single big red flower at the side of it. Her dress was tailored gray tweed. The same distinction between their clothes was in their faces, the finely modeled prettiness of her features and the big, careless chiseling of the features of Bill Gregg. Ronicky Doone did not wonder that after her first fear her gesture was one of disdain and surprise. Bill Gregg had dragged the hat from his head, and the wind lifted his black hair and made it wild. He went a long, slow step closer to her, with both his hands outstretched. A strange scene for a street, and Ronicky Doone saw the girl flash a glance over her shoulder and back to the house from which she had come. Ronicky Doone followed that glance, and he saw all hidden save a profile of the face, a man standing at the opposite window, and smiling scornfully down at the picture in the street. What a face it was! Never in his life had Ronicky Doone seen a man who, in one instant, filled him with such fear and hatred, such loathing and such dread, such scorn and such terror. The nose was hooked like the nose of a bird of prey, the eyes were long and slanting like those of an oriental, the face was thin, almost fleshless, so that the bony jaw stood out like the jaw of a death's head. As for the girl, the sight of the onlooker seemed to fill her with a new terror. She shrank back from Bill Gregg until her shoulders were pressed against the wall of the house, and Ronicky saw her head shake as she denied Bill the right of advancing further. Still he pleaded, and still she ordered him away. Finally Bill Gregg drew himself up, bowed to her, and turned on his heel. The girl hesitated a moment. It seemed to Ronicky, in spite of the fact that she had just driven Bill away, as if she were on the verge of following him to bring him back. For she made a slight outward gesture with one hand. If this were in her mind, however, it vanished instantly. She turned with a shudder and hurried away down the street. As for Bill Gregg, he bore himself straight as a soldier, and came back across the pavement but it was the erectness of a soldier who had met with a crushing defeat, and only preserves an outward resolution, while all the spirit within is crushed. Ronicky Doone turned gloomily away from the window and listened to the progress of Bill up the stairs. What a contrast between the ascent and the descent! He had literally flown down. Now his heels clumped out a slow and regular death march as he came back to the room. When Greg opened the door, Ronicky Doon blinked and drew in a deep breath at the sight of the poor fellow's face. Greg had known before that he truly loved this girl whom he had never seen, but he never dreamed what the strength of that love was. Now, in the very moment of seeing his dream of the girl turned into flesh and blood, he had lost her, and there was something like death in the face of the big miner as he dropped his hat on the floor and sank into a chair. After that he did not move so much as a finger from the position into which he had fallen limply. His legs were twisted awkwardly, sprawling across the floor in front of him, one long arm dragged down toward the floor, as if there was no strength in it to support the weight of the labor-hardened hands. His chin was fallen against his breast. 
When Ronicky Doone crossed to him and laid a kind hand on his shoulder, he did not look up. "'It's ended,' said Bill Gregg faintly. "'Now we hit the back trail and forget all about this,' he added with a faint attempt at cynicism. "'I've just wasted a pile of good money-making time from the mine. That's all.' "'Hm,' said Ronicky Doone. "'Bill, look me in the eye and tell me, man to man, that you're a liar.' He added, "'Can you ever be happy without her, man?' The cruelty of that speech made Greg flush, and he looked up sharply. That was exactly what Ronicky Doone wanted. "'I guess they ain't any use in talking about that part of it,' said Greg huskily. "'Ain't there? That's where you and me don't agree. Why, Bill, look at the way things have gone. You start out with the photograph of a girl. Now we followed her, found her name, tracked her across the continent, and know her street address.' and you've given her a chance to see your own face. Ain't that something done? After you've done all that, are you going to give up now? Not you, Bill. You're going to buck up and go ahead full steam, eh? Bill Gregg smiled sourly. Do you know what she said to me when I came rushing up saying I'm Bill Gregg? Do you know what she said? Well, Bill Gregg, she says. I don't remember any such name. That took the wind out of me. I only had enough left to say, the gent that was writing those papers to the correspondence school to you from the West, the one you sent your picture to, and sent my picture to, she says, and looks as if the ground had opened under her feet. You're mad, she says. And then she looks back over her shoulder as much as to wish she was safe back in her house. Do you know why she looked back over her shoulder? Just for the reason I told you. No, Bill. There was a gent standing up there at the window watching her and how she acted. He's the gent that kept her from writing you and signing her name. He's the one who's kept her in that house. He's the one that knew we were watching all the time, that sent out the girl with the exact orders how she should act if you was to come out and speak to her when you seen her. Bill, what that girl told you didn't come out of her own head. It come out of the head of the gent across the way. When you turned your back on her, she looked like she'd run after you and try to explain. But the fear of that fellow up in the window was too much for her, and she didn't dare. Bill, to get that girl, you got to get that gent I seen grinning from the window. Grinning? asked Bill Gregg, grinding his teeth and starting from his chair. Was the skunk laughing at me? Sure, every minute. Bill Gregg groaned. I'll smash every bone in his ugly head. Shake, said Ronicky Doone. That's the sort of talk I wanted to hear, and I'll help you, Bill. Unless I'm away wrong, it'll take the best you and me can do, working together, to put that gent down. End of Chapter 8 Chapter 9 A Bold Venture But how to reach that man of the smile, and the sneer, how, above all, to make sure that he was really the power controlling Carolyn Smith, were problems which could not be solved in a moment. Bill Gregg contributed one helpful idea. We've waited a week to see her. Now that we've seen her, let's keep on waiting, he said, and Ronicky agreed. They resumed the vigil, but it had been prolonged for such a length of time that it was impossible to keep it as strictly as it had been observed before. Bill Gregg, outworn by the strain of the long watching and the shock of the disappointment of that day, went completely to pieces and in the early evening fell asleep. But Ronicky Doone went out for a light dinner and came back after dark, refreshed and eager for action, only to find that Bill Gregg was incapable of being roused. He slept like a dead man. Ronicky went to the window and sat alone. Few of the rumors were home in the house opposite. They went out for the evening, or for dinner, at least, and the face of the building was dark and cold, the light from the street lamp glinting unevenly on the window panes. He sat there staring at the old house so many hours in the past that it was beginning to look like a face to him, to be studied as one might study a human being. And the people it sheltered, the old hag who kept the door, the sneering man, and Carolyn Smith, were to the house like thoughts behind the man's face, an inscrutable face. But, if one cannot pry behind the mask of the human, at least it's possible to enter a house and find. At this point in his thoughts, Ronicky Doone rose with a quickening pulse. Suppose he, alone, entered that house by stealth, like a burglar, and found what he could find. 
he brushed the idea away. Instantly it returned to him. The danger of the thing, and danger there certainly would be in the vicinity of him of the sardonic profile, appealed to him more and more keenly. Moreover, he must go alone. The heavy-footed Greg would be a poor helpmate on such an errand of stealth. Ronicky turned away from the window, turned back to it, and looked once more at the tall front of the building opposite. Then he started to get ready for the expedition. The preparations were simple. He put on a pair of low shoes, very light and with rubber heels. In them he could move with the softness and the speed of a cat. Next he dressed in a dark gray suit, knowing that this is the color hardest to see at night. His old felt hat had been discarded before in favor of the prevailing style of the average New Yorker. For this night expedition he put on the cap which drew easily over his ears, and had a long visor, shadowing the upper part of his face. Since it might be necessary to remain as invisible as possible, he obscured the last bit of white that showed in his costume with a black neck scarf. Then he looked in the glass. A lean face came back to him, the eyes obscured under the cap, a stern, resolute face, with a distinct threat about it. He hardly recognized himself in the face of the glass. He went to his suitcase and brought out his favorite revolver. It was a long and ponderous weapon to be hidden beneath his clothes, but to Ronicky Doone that gun was a friend, well tried, in many an adventure. His fingers went deftly over it. It literally fell to pieces at his touch, and he examined it cautiously and carefully in all its parts, looking to the cartridges before he assembled the weapon again. For if it became necessary to shoot this evening, it would be necessary to shoot to kill. He then strolled down the street, passing the house opposite with a close scrutiny. A narrow, paved sidewalk ran between it and the house on its right, and all the windows open on this side court were dark. Moreover, the house which was his quarry was set back several feet from the street, an indentation which would completely hide him from anyone who looked from the street. Ronicky made up his mind at once. He went to the end of the block, crossed over, and turning back on the far side of the street, slipped into the opening between the houses. Instantly he was in dense darkness. For five stories above him the two buildings towered, shutting out the starlight. Looking straight up, he found only a faint reflection of the glow of the city lights in the sky. At last he found a cellar window. He tried it and found it locked but a little maneuvering with his knife enabled him to turn the catch at the top of the lower sash. Then he raised it slowly and leaned into the blackness. Something incredibly soft, tenuous, clinging, pressed at once against his face. He started back with a shudder and brushed away the remnants of a big spider web. Then he leaned in again. It was an intense blackness. The moment his head was in the opening, the sense of listening, which is ever in a house, came to him. There were the strange, musty underground odors which go with cellars and make men think of death. However, he must not stay here indefinitely. To be seen leaning in at this window was as bad as being seen in the house itself. He slipped through the opening at once, and beneath his feet there was a soft crunching of coal. He had come directly into the bin. Turning, he closed the window, for that would be a definite clue to anyone who might pass down the alley. As he stood surrounded by that hostile silence, that evil darkness, he grew somewhat accustomed to the dimness, and he could make out not definite objects, but ghostly outlines. Presently he took out the small electric torch which he carried and examined his surroundings. The bin had not yet received the supply of winter coal, and was almost empty. He stepped out into a part of the basement which had been used apparently for storing articles not worth keeping, but too good to be thrown away, an American habit of thrift. Several decrepit chairs and a rickety cabinet and old console tables were piled together in a tangled mess. Ronicky looked at them with an unaccountable shudder, as if he had read in them the history of the ruin and fall and death of many an old inhabitant of this house. It seemed to his imagination that the man with the sneer had been the cause of all the destruction and would be the cause of more. He passed through the basement quickly, eager to be out of the musty odors and his gloomy thoughts. He found the storerooms, reached the kitchen stairs, and ascended at once. 
Halfway up the stairs, the door above him suddenly opened, and light poured down at him. He saw the flying figure of a cat, a broom behind it, and a woman behind the broom. Wished out of here, dirty beast! The cat thudded against Ronicky's knee, screeched, and disappeared below. The woman of the broom shaded her eyes and peered down the steps. A queer cat, she muttered, then slammed the door. It seemed certain to Ronicky that she must have seen him, yet he knew that the blackness of the cellar had probably half blinded her. Besides, he had drawn as far as possible to one side of the steps, and in this way she might easily have overlooked him. In the meantime, it seemed that this way of entering the house was definitely blocked. He paused a moment to consider other plans, but while he stayed there in thought, he heard the rattle of pans. It decided him to stay for a while longer. Apparently she was washing the cooking utensils, and that meant that she was near the close of her work for the evening. In fact, the rim of light, which showed behind the door frame and the door, suddenly snapped out, and he heard her footsteps retreating. Still he delayed for a moment or two, for fear that she might return to take something which she had forgotten. But the silence deepened above him, and voices were faintly audible toward the front of the house. That decided Ronicky. He opened the door, blessing the well-oiled hinges which kept it from making any noise, and let a shaft from his pocket lantern flicker across the kitchen floor. The light glimmered on the newly scrubbed surface, and showed him a door to his right, opening into the main part of the house. He passed through it at once, and sighed with relief when his foot touched the carpet on the hall beyond. He noted, too, that there was no sign of a creak from the boards beneath his tread. However old the house might be, he was a noble carpenter who had laid the flooring, Ronicky thought, as he slipped through the semi-gloom. For there was a small hall light toward the front, and it gave him an uncertain illumination, even at the rear of the passage. Now that he was definitely committed to the adventure, he wondered more and more what he could possibly gain by it. But still he went on, and in spite of the danger, it is doubtful if Ronicky would have willingly changed places with any man in the world at that moment. At least there was not the slightest sense of remaining on the lower floor of the house. He slipped down the shadow of the main stairs, swiftly circled through the danger of the light of the lower hall lamp, and started his ascent. Still the carpet muffled every sound which he made in climbing, and the solid construction of the house did not betray him with a single creaking noise. He reached the first hall. This, beyond doubt, was where he would find the room of the man who sneered, the arch-enemy, as Ronicky Doone was beginning to think of him. A shiver passed through his lithe, muscular body as he thought of that meeting. He opened the first door on his left. It was a small closet for brooms and dust-cloths and such things. Determining to be methodical, he went to the extreme end of the hall and tried that door. It was locked, but while his hand was still on the knob, turning it in disappointment, a door higher up in the house opened, and a hum of voices passed out to him. They grew louder. They turned to the staircase from the floor above, and commenced to descend at a running pace. Three or four men at least there must be, by the sound, and perhaps more. Ronicky started to the head of the stairs to make his retreat, but just as he reached there, the party turned into the hall and confronted him. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Mistaken Identity To flee down the stairs now would be rank folly. If there happened to be, among these fellows, a man of the type of him who sneered, a bullet would catch the fugitive long before he reached the bottom of the staircase. And, since he could not retreat, Ronicky went slowly and steadily ahead, for certainly, if he stood still, he would be spoken to. He would have to rely now on the very dim light in the hall, and the shadow of his cap obscuring his face. If these were rumors, perhaps they would take him for some newcomer but he was hailed at once, and a hand was laid on his shoulder. "'Hello, Pete. What's the dope?' Ronicky shrugged the hand away and went on. "'Won't talk. Curse him. That's because the plant went fluey. Maybe not. Pete don't talk much, except to the old man.' "'Let me get at him,' said the third voice. "'Beat it down to Rooney's. I'm going with Pete and get what he knows.' 
and, as Ronicky turned onto the next flight of the stairway, he was overtaken by hurrying feet. The other two had already scurried down toward the front door of the house. "'I got some stuff in my room, Pete,' said the friendly fellow who had overtaken him. "'Come up and have a jolt, and we can have a talk. Lefty and Monahan think you went flop on the job, but I know better, eh? The old man always picks you for these singles. He never gives me a shot at them.' Then he added, "'Here we are.' and opening the door in the first hall, he stepped to the center of the room and fumbled at a chain that broke loose and tinkled against glass. Eventually he snapped on an electric light. Ronicky Doone saw a powerfully built, bull-necked man, with a soft hat pulled far down on his head. Then the man turned. It was much against the grain for Ronicky to attack a man by surprise, but necessity is a stern ruler. And the necessity which made him strike made him hit with the speed of a snapping whiplash and the weight of a sledgehammer. Before the other was fully turned, that iron hand set of knuckles crashed against the base of his jaw. He fell without a murmur, without a struggle, Ronicky catching him in his arms to break the weight of the fall. It was a complete knockout. The dull eyes which looked up from the floor saw nothing. The square, rather brutal face was relaxed as if in sleep but here was a type of man who would recuperate with great speed. Ronicky set about the obvious task which lay before him, as fast as he could. In the man's coat pocket he found a handkerchief which, hard knotted, would serve as a gag. The window curtain was drawn with a stout, thick cord. Ronicky slashed off a convenient length of it and secured the hands and feet of his victim before he turned the fellow on his face. Next he went through the pockets of the unconscious man, who was only now beginning to stir slightly, as life returned after that stunning blow. It was beginning to come to Ronicky that there was a strange relation between the men of this house. Here were three who apparently started out to work at night, and yet they were certainly not at all the type of night clerks, or night shift engineers or mechanics. He turned over the hand of the man he had struck down. The palm was as soft as his own. No, certainly not a laborer but they were all employed by the old man. Who was he? And was there a relation between all of these and the man who sneered? At least Ronicky determined to learn all that could be read in the pockets of his victim. There was only one thing. That was a snub-nosed, heavy automatic. It was enough to make Ronicky Doone sigh with relief. At least he had not struck some peaceful, law-abiding fellow. Any man might carry a gun— Ronicky himself would have been uncomfortable without some sort of weapon about him. But there are guns, and guns. This big, ugly automatic seems specifically designed to kill swiftly and surely. He was considering these deductions when a tap came on the door. Ronicky groaned. Had they come already to find out what had kept the senseless victim so long? "'Morgan! Oh, Harry Morgan!' called a girl's voice. Ronicky Doone started. Perhaps, who could tell, this might be Carolyn Smith herself, come to tap at the door when he was on the very verge of abandoning the adventure. Suppose it were someone else. If he ventured out expecting to find Greg's lady, and found instead quite another person, well, women screamed at the slightest provocation, and if a woman screamed in this house, it seemed exceedingly likely that she would rouse a number of men carrying such short-nosed, ugly automatics, as that which he had taken from the pocket of Harry Morgan. In the meantime, he must answer something. He could not pretend that the room was empty, for the light must be showing around the door. "'Harry!' called the voice of the girl again. "'Do you hear me? Come out. The chief wants you,' and she rattled the door. Fear that she might open it, and stepping in see the senseless figure on the floor, alarmed Ronicky. He came close to the door. "'Well?' he demanded, keeping his voice deep, like the voice of Harry Morgan, as well as he could remember it. "'Hurry, the chief, I tell you.' He snapped out the light, and turned resolutely toward the door. He felt his faithful colt, and the feel of the butt was like the touch of a friendly hand before he opened the door. She was dressed in white, and made a glimmering figure in the darkness of the hall, and her hair glimmered also, almost as if it possessed a light, and a life of its own. Ronicky Doone saw that she was a very pretty girl, indeed. Yes, it must be Carolyn Smith. 
the very perfume of young girlhood breathed from her, and very sharply, and suddenly, he wondered why he should be here to fight the battle for Bill Gregg in this matter. Bill Gregg, who slept peacefully and stupidly in the room across the street. She had turned away, giving him only a side glance as he came out. I don't know what's going on. Something big. The chief is going to give you your chance. With me. Ronicky Doone grunted. Don't do that, the girl said impatiently. I know you think Pete is the top of the world, but that doesn't mean you can make a good imitation of him. Don't do it, Harry. You'll pass by yourself. You don't need a make-up, and not Pete's on a bet. They reached the head of the stairs, and Ronicky Doone paused. To go down was to face the mysterious chief, whom he had no doubt was the old man to whom Harry Morgan had already referred. In the meantime, the conviction grew that this was indeed Carolyn Smith. Her free and easy way of talk was exactly that of the girl who might become interested in a man who she had never seen, merely by letters. "'I want to talk to you,' said Ronicky, muffling his voice. "'I want to talk to you alone.' "'To me?' asked the girl, turning toward him. The light from the hall lamp below gave Ronicky the faintest hint of her profile. "'Yes. But the chief. He can wait.' She hesitated, apparently drawn by curiosity in one direction, but stopped by another thought. I suppose he can wait, but if he gets stirred up about it, oh well, I'll talk to you. But nothing foolish, Harry, promise me that. Yes. Slip into my room for a minute. She led the way a few steps down the hall, and he followed through the door, working his mind frantically in an effort to find words with which to open the speech before she should see that he was not Harry Morgan and cry out to alarm the house. What should he say? Something about Bill Gregg at once, of course. That was the thing. The electric light snapped on at the far side of the room. He saw the dressing table, an empire bed covered with green figured silk, a pleasant rug on the floor, and just as he gathered an impression of delightful femininity from these furnishings, the girl turned from the lamp on the dressing table, and he saw, not Carolyn Smith, but a bronze-haired beauty, as different from Bill Gregg's lady as day is from night. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 A Cross-Examination He was conscious then only of the green-blue eyes, very wide, very bright, and lips that parted on a word, and froze there in silence. The heart of Ronicky Doone leapt with joy, he had passed the crisis in safety. She had not cried out. "'You're not,' he had said in the first moment. "'I am not who?' asked the girl with amazing steadiness. He saw her hand go back to the dressing-table and open, with incredible deftness and speed, the little top drawer behind her. "'Don't do that,' said Ronicky, softly but sharply. "'Keep your hand off that table, lady, if you don't mind.' She hesitated a fraction of a second. In that moment she seemed to see that he was in earnest, and that it would be foolish to tamper with him. "'Stand away from the table. Sit down yonder.' Again she obeyed without a word. Her eyes, to be sure, flickered here and there about the room, as though they sought some means of sending a warning to her friends, or finding some escape for herself. Then her glance returned to Ronicky Doone. "'Well,' she said, as she settled in the chair, "'well?' a world of meaning in those two small words, a world of dread controlled. He merely stared at her thoughtfully. "'I hit the wrong trail, lady,' he said quietly. "'I was looking for somebody else.' She started. "'You were after?' She stopped. "'That's right, I guess,' he admitted. "'How many of you are there?' she asked curiously, so curiously that she seemed to be forgetting the danger. "'Poor Carrie Smith with a mob?' She stopped suddenly. "'What did you do to Harry Morgan?' "'I left him safe and quiet,' said Ronicky Doone. The girl's face hardened strangely. "'What you are, and what your game is, I don't know,' she said. "'But I'll tell you this. I'm letting you play as if you had all the cards in the deck. But you haven't. I've got one ace that'll take all your trumps. Suppose I call. Once. What'll happen to you, pal?' "'You don't dare call,' he said." "'Don't dare me,' she said angrily. "'I hate a dare worse than anything in the world, almost.' For a moment 
Her green-blue eyes were pools of light flashing angrily at him. Into the hand of Ronicky Doone, with that magic speed and grace for which his fame was growing so great in the mountain desert, came the long, glimmering body of the revolver, and holding it at his hip, he threatened her. She shrank back at that, gasping, for there was an utter surety about this man's handling of the weapon. The heavy gun balanced and steadied in his slim fingers, as if it were no more than a feather's weight. "'I'm talking straight, lady,' said Ronicky Doone. "'Sit down. Pronto.' In the very act of obedience she straightened again. "'It's bluff,' she said. "'I'm going through that door.' Straight for the door she went, and Ronicky Doone set his teeth. "'Go back,' he commanded. He glided to the door and blocked her way, but the gun hung futile in his hand. "'It's easy to pull a gun, eh?' said the girl with something of a sneer. "'But it takes nerve to use it. "'Let me through this door.' "'Not in a thousand years,' said Ronicky. She laid her hand on the door and drew it back. It struck his shoulder, and Ronicky gave way with a groan and stood with his head bowed. Inwardly he cursed himself. Doubtless she was used to men who bullied her, as if she were another man of an inferior sort. Doubtless she despised him for his weakness. But though he gritted his teeth, he could not make himself firm. Those old lessons which sink into a man's soul in the West came back to him and held him. In the helpless rage which possessed him, he wanted battle above all things in the world. If a half a dozen men poured through the doorway, he would have rejoiced. But this one girl was enough to make him helpless. He looked up in amazement. She had not gone. In fact, she had closed the door slowly and stood with her back against it, staring at him in a speechless bewilderment. "'What sort of a man are you?' asked the girl at last. "'A fool,' said Ronicky, slowly. "'Go out and round up your friends. I can't stop you.' "'No,' said the girl thoughtfully. "'But that was a poor bluff at stopping me.' He nodded, and she hesitated still, watching his face closely. "'Listen to me,' she said suddenly. "'I have two minutes to talk to you, and I'll give you those two minutes. You can use them getting out of the house. I'll show you a way, or you can use them to tell me why you've come.' In spite of himself, Ronicky smiled. "'Lady,' he said, "'if a rat was in a trap, do you think he'd stop very long between a chance of getting clear and a chance to tell how he come to get into the place?' "'I have a perfectly good reason for asking,' she answered. "'Even if you now get out of the house safely, you'll try to come back later on.' "'Lady,' said Ronicky, "'do I look as plumb foolish as that?' "'You're from the West,' she said in answer to his slang. "'Yes.' She considered the straight-looking honesty of his eyes. "'Out West,' she said, "'I know you men are different. "'Not one of the men I know here "'would take another chance as risky as this "'once they were out of it. "'But out there in the mountains "'you follow long trails, "'trails that haven't anything but hope "'to lead you along them. "'Isn't that so?' "'Maybe,' admitted Ronicky. "'It's the fever out of the gold days, lady. "'You start chipping rocks to find the right color. "'Maybe you never find the right color. "'Maybe you never find a streak of pay stuff. "'But you keep on trying. "'You're always just sort of around the corner "'from making a big strike.' "'She nodded, smiling again, "'and the smiles changed her pleasantly, "'it seemed to Ronicky Doone. "'At first she had impressed him almost as a man, "'with her cold, steady eyes.' but now she was all woman indeed. That's why I say that you'll come back. You won't give up with one failure. Am I right? He shrugged his shoulders. I don't know. If the trail fever hits me again, maybe I would come back. You started to tell me. Is it because of Carolyn Smith? Yes. You don't have to talk to me, said the girl. As a matter of fact, I shouldn't be here listening to you. But, I don't know why, I want to help you. You... "'You are in love with Carolyn?' "'No,' said Ronicky. Her expression grew grave and cold again. "'Then why are you hunting for her? "'What do you want with her?' "'Lady,' said Ronicky, "'I'm going to show you the whole layout of my cards. "'Maybe you'll take what I say to headquarters, "'the man that smiles, and block my game.' "'You know him?' she asked sharply. "'Apparently that phrase, "'the man who smiles, was enough to identify him. "'I seen him.' I don't know what he is. I don't know what you are, lady, but I figure that you and Carolyn Smith and everybody in this house is under the thumb of the gent that smiles. 
her eyes darkened with a shadow of alarm. "'Go on,' she said curtly. "'I'm not going to guess about what you all are. All I know is what I'm here trying to do. I'm not working for myself. I'm working for a partner.' She started. "'That's the second man, the one who stopped her on the street today?' "'You're pretty well posted,' replied Ronicky. "'Yes, that's the one.' He started after Carolyn Smith, not even knowing her name, with just a picture of her. We found out that she lived in sight of the East River, and pretty soon we located her here. And what are you hoping to do? To find her, and talk to her straight from the shoulder, and tell her what a pile Bill has done to get to her, and a lot of other things. Can't he find her, and tell her those things himself? He can't talk, said Ronicky. Not that I'm a pile better, but I could talk better for a friend than I can talk for myself, I figure. If things don't go right, then I'll know the trouble is with the gent with the smile. And then, asked the girl, very excited and grave. I'll find him, said Ronicky Doone. And? Lady, he replied obliquely, because I couldn't use a gun on a girl ain't no sign I can't use it on a gent. I've one thing to tell you, she said, breaking in swiftly on him. Do what you want. Take all the chances you care to. But if you value your life and the life of your friend... Keep away from the man who smiles. I'll have a fighting chance, I guess, said Ronicky quietly. You'll have no chance at all. The moment he knows your hand is against him, I don't care how brave or how clever you are, you're doomed. She spoke with such passion of conviction that she flushed, and a moment later she was shivering. It might have been the draft from the window which made her gather the hazy green mantle closer about her and glance over her shoulder, but a grim feeling came to Ronicky Doone that the reason why the girl trembled and her eyes grew wide was that the mention of the man who smiles had brought the thought of him into the room like a breath of cold wind. "'Don't you see,' she went on gently, "'that I like you? It's the first and the last time that I'm going to see you, so I can talk. I know you're honest, and I know you're brave.' Why, I can see your whole character in the way you've stayed by your friend, and if there's a possible way of helping you, I'll do it. But you must promise me first that you'll never cross the man with the sneer, as you call him. There's a sort of fate in it, said Ronicky, slowly. I don't think I could promise. There's a chill in my bones that tells me I'm going to meet up with him one of these days. She gasped at that, and stepping back from him, she appeared to be searching her mind to discover something which would finally and completely convince him. At length she found it. "'Do I look to you like a coward?' she said. "'Do I seem to be weak-kneed?' He shook his head. "'And what will a woman fight hardest for?' "'For the youngsters she's got,' said Ronicky, after a moment's thought. "'And outside that, I suppose a girl will fight hardest to marry the gent she loves.' and to keep from marrying a man she doesn't love, as she'd try to keep from death. Sure, said Ronicky, but these days a girl don't have to marry that way. I'm going to marry the man with the sneer, she said simply enough, and with dull, patient eyes she watched the face of Ronicky wrinkle and grow pale, as if a heavy fist had struck him. You? he asked. You marry him? Yes, she whispered. And you hate the thought of him. I... I don't know... "'He's kind. You hate him,' insisted Ronicky. "'And he's to have you, that cold-eyed snake, that devil of a man.' He moved a little, and she turned toward him, smiling faintly and allowing the light to come more clearly and fully on her face. "'You're meant for a king of men, lady. You got the queen in you. It's in the lift of your head. When you find a gent you can love, why, lady, he'll be pretty near the richest man in the world.' The ghost of a flush bloomed in her cheeks, but her faint smile did not alter, and she seemed to be hearing him from far away. "'The man with the sneer,' she said at length, "'will never talk to me like that, and still I shall marry him.' "'Tell me your name,' said Ronicky Doone bluntly. "'My name is Ruth Tolliver. "'Listen to me, Ruth Tolliver. "'If you was to live a thousand years, "'and that gent with the smile was to keep going for two thousand, it had never come about that he could ever marry you. She shook her head, still watching him from a distance. If I crossed the country and followed a hard trail and come here tonight and stuck my head in a trap, as you might say, for the sake of a gent like Bill Gregg, fine fellow though he is, what do you think I would do to keep a girl like you from a lifelong misery? 
and he dwelt on the last word until the girl shivered. "'It's what it means,' said Ronicky Doone. "'Lifelong misery for you. And it won't happen. It can't happen.' "'Are you mad? Are you quite mad?' asked the girl. "'What on earth have I and my affairs got to do with you? Who are you?' "'I don't know,' said Ronicky Doone. "'I suppose I'm a champion of lost causes, lady. Why have I got something to do with you? I'll tell you why. Because when a girl gets past being just pretty, and starts being plumb beautiful, she lays off being the business of any one gent, her father or her brother. She starts being the business of the whole world. You see?' They come like that about one in ten million. And I figure you're that one, lady. The faint smile went out. She was looking at him now with a sort of sad wonder. Do you know what I am? she said gravely. I don't know, said Ronicky Doone, and I don't care. What you do don't count. It's inside that matters, and the inside of you is all right. Lady, as long as I can sling a gun, and as long as my name is Ronicky Doone, you ain't going to marry the gent with the smile. If he expected an outbreak of protest from her, he was mistaken. For what she said was, Ronicky Doone? Is that the name? Ronicky Doone? Then she smiled at him. I'm within one ace of being foolish and saying, but I won't. She made a gesture of brushing a mist away from her, and then stepped back a little. I'm going down to see the man with the smile, and I'm going to tell him that Harry Morgan is not in his room that he didn't answer my knock, and then that I looked around through the house and didn't find him. After that I'm coming back here, Ronicky Doone, and I'm going to try to get an opportunity for you to talk to Carolyn Smith. I knew you'd change your mind, said Ronicky Doone. I'll even tell you why, she said. It isn't for your friend who's asleep, but it gives you a chance to finish this business, and come to the end of this trail, and go back to your own country. Because if you stay around here long, there'll be trouble. A lot of trouble, Ronicky Doone. Now stay here and wait for me. If anyone taps at the door, you'd better slip into that closet in the corner. Will you wait? Yes. And you'll trust me? To the end of the trail, lady. She smiled at him and was gone. Now the house was perfectly hushed. He went to the window and looked down to the quiet street with all its atmosphere of some New England village and eternal peace. It seemed impossible that in the house behind him there were... He caught his breath. Somewhere in the house the muffled sound of a struggle rose. He ran to the door, thinking of Ruth Tolliver at once, and then he shrank back again, for a door was slammed open, and a voice shouted, the voice of a man, Help! Harrison! Lefty! Jerry! Other voices answered far away. Footfalls began to sound. Ronicky Doone knew that Harry Morgan his victim, had at last recovered and managed to work the cords off his feet, or hands, or both. Ronicky stepped back close to the door of the closet and waited. It would mean a search, probably, this discovery that Morgan had been struck down in his own room by an unknown intruder. And a search certainly would be started at once. First there was confusion, and then a clear, musical man's voice began to give orders. Harrison, take the cellar. Lefty, Go up to the roof. The rest of you take the rooms one by one. The search was on. Don't ask questions, was the last instruction. When you see someone you don't know, shoot on sight and shoot to kill. I'll do the explaining to the police. You know that. Now scatter. And the man who brings him down I'll remember. Quick. There was a new scurry of footfalls. Ronicky Doone heard them approach the door of the girl's room, and he slipped into the closet. At once a cloud of soft, cool silks brushed about him, and he worked back until his shoulders had touched the wall at the back of the closet. Luckily the enclosure was deep, and the clothes were hanging thickly from the racks. It was sufficient to conceal him from any careless search, but it would do no good if anyone probed, and certainly these men were not ones to search carelessly. In the meantime it was a position which made Ronicky grind his teeth, to be found skulking in a woman's clothes in a closet, to be dragged out and stuck in the back, no doubt, like a rat, and thrown into the river, that was an end for Ronicky Doone indeed. He was on the verge of slipping out and making a mad break for the door of the house and trying to escape by taking the men by surprise, when he heard the door of the girl's room open. Some ex-pugilist, 
he heard a man's voice saying, and he recognized it at once as belonging to the man who had given the orders. He recognized also that this must be the man with the sneer. "'You think he was an amateur robber and an expert prize-fighter?' asked Ruth Tolliver. It seemed to Ronicky Doone that her voice was perfectly controlled and calm. Perhaps it was her face that betrayed emotion, for after a moment of silence the man answered, "'What's the matter? You're as nervous as a child tonight, Ruth.' "'Isn't there reason enough to make me nervous?' she demanded. "'A robber? Heaven knows what, running at large in the house?' "'Hm,' murmured the man. "'Devilish queer that you should get so excited all at once. "'No, it's something else. "'I've trained you too well for you to go to pieces like this over nothing. "'What is it, Ruth?' "'There was no answer. "'The voice began again, silken smooth and gentle, "'so gentle and kindly that Ronicky Doone started. "'In the old days you used to keep nothing from me. "'We were companions, Ruth. "'That was when you were a child. "'Now that you're a woman—' When you feel more, think more, see more, when our companionship should be like a running stream, continually bringing new things into my life, I find barriers between us. What is it, my dear? Still, there was no answer. The pulse of Ronicky Doone began to quicken, as though the question had been asked him, as though he himself were fumbling for the answer. Let us talk more freely, went on the man. Try to open your mind to me. There are things which you dislike in me. I know it. Just what those things are I cannot tell, but we must break down these foolish little barriers, which are appearing more and more every day. Not that I mean to intrude myself on you every moment of your life. You understand that, of course. Of course, said the girl faintly. And I understand perfectly that you have passed out of childhood into young womanhood, and that this is a dreamy time for a girl. Her body is formed at last, but her mind is only half formed. There is a pleasant mist over it. Very well, I don't wish to brush the mist away. If I did, I would take half that charm away from you, that elusive incompleteness, which Fragonard and Watteau tried to imitate. Heaven knows with how little success. No, I shall always let you live your own life. All I ask for, my dear, are certain meeting-places— let us establish them before it is too late, or you will find one day that you have married an old man, and we shall have silent dinners. There is nothing more wretched than that. If it should come about, then you will begin to look on me as a jailer, and— Don't! Ah, he said very tenderly. I knew that I was feeling toward the truth. You are shrinking from me, Ruth, because you feel that I'm too old. No, no! Here a hand pounded heavily on the door. "'The idiots have found something,' said the man of the sneer. "'And now they have come to talk about their cleverness, like a rooster crowing over a grain of corn.' He raised his voice. "'Come in!' And Ronicky Doone heard a panting voice a moment later exclaim, "'We've got him!' End of Chapter 11 Chapter 12 the strange bargain. Ronicky drew his gun and waited. Good, said the man of the sneer. Go ahead. It was down in the cellar that we found the first tracks. He came through the side window and closed it after him. That dropped him into the coal bin. Did he get coal dust on his shoes? Right, and he didn't have sense enough to wipe it off. An amateur, a rank amateur. I told you, said the man of the sneer, with satisfaction. You followed his trail. Up the stairs to the kitchen, and down the hall, and up to Harry's room. We already knew he'd gone there. But he left that room again and came down the hall. Yes, the coal dust was pretty well wiped out by that time, but we held the light close to the carpet and got signs of it. And where did it lead? Right to this room. Ronicky stepped from among the smooth silks and pressed close to the closet door, his hand on the knob. The time had almost come for one desperate attempt to escape, and he was ready to shoot to kill. A moment of pause had come, a pause which, in the imagination of Ronicky, was filled with the approach of both the men toward the door of the closet. The man of the sneer said, "'That's a likely story. I can show you the tracks.' "'Hm. You fool. 
They simply grew dim when they got to this door. I've been here for some time. Go back and tell them to hunt some more. Go up to the attic and search there. That's the place an amateur would most likely hide. The man growled some retort and left, closing the door heavily behind him, while Ronicky Doone breathed freely again for the first time. Now, said the man of the sneer, tell me the whole of it, Ruth. Ronicky set his teeth. Had the clever devil guessed at the truth so easily? Had he sent his follower away merely to avoid having it known that a man had taken shelter in the room of the girl he loved? Go on, the leader was repeating. Let me hear the whole truth. I, I, stammered the girl, and she could say no more. The man of the sneer laughed unpleasantly. Let me help you. It was somebody you met somewhere, on the train, perhaps, and you couldn't help smiling at him, eh? You smiled so much, in fact, that he followed you, and found that you had come here. The only way he could get in was by stealth. Is that right? So he came in exactly that way, like a robber, but really only to keep a tryst with his lady love. A pretty story, a true romance. I begin to see why you found me such a dull fellow, my dear girl. John, began Ruth Tolliver, her voice shaking. Tush! he broke in as smoothly as ever. Let me tell the story for you, and spare you your blushes. When I sent you for Harry Morgan, you found Lochinvar in the very act of slugging the poor fellow. You helped him tie Morgan, then took him here to your room. Although you were glad to see him, you warned him that it was dangerous to play with fire, fire being me. Do I gather the drift of the story fairly well? Finally, you have him worked up to the right pitch. He is convinced that retreat would be advantageous, if possible. You show him that it is possible. You point out the ledge under your window, and the easy way of working to the ground, eh? Yes, said the girl, unevenly. That is... Ah, murmured the man of the sneer. You seem rather relieved that I have guessed he left the house. In that case... Ronicky Doone had held the latch of the door turned back for some time. Now he pushed it open and stepped out. He was only barely in time, for the man of the sneer was turning quickly in his direction, since there was only one hiding place in the room. He was brought up with a shock by the sight of Ronicky's big colt, held at the hip and covering him with absolute certainty. Ruth Tolliver did not cry out, but every muscle in her face and body seemed to contract, as if she were preparing herself for the explosion. "'You don't have to put up your hands,' said Ronicky Doone, wondering at the familiarity of the face of the man of the sneer. He had brooded on it so often in the past few days that it was like the face of an old acquaintance. He knew every line in that sharp profile. "'Thank you,' responded the leader, and turning to the girl said coldly, "'I congratulate you on your good taste. "'A regular Apollo, my dear Ruth.' He turned back to Ronicky Doone. "'And I suppose you have overheard our entire conversation.' "'The whole lot of it,' said Ronicky, "'though I wasn't playing my hand at eavesdropping. "'I couldn't help hearing you, partner.' The man of the sneer looked him over leisurely. "'Western,' he said at last, "'decidedly western. "'Are you staying long in the East, my friend?' "'I don't know,' said Ronicky Doone, "'smiling faintly at the coolness of the other. "'What do you think about it?' "'Meaning that I'm liable to put an end to your stay?' "'Maybe. "'Tush, tush. "'I suppose Ruth has filled your head with a lot of rot "'about what a terrible fellow I am. "'But I don't use poison, "'and I don't kill with mysterious X-rays. "'I am, as you see, a very quiet and ordinary sort.' "'Ronicky Doone smiled again. "'You just oblige me, partner,' he replied in his own soft voice. "'Just stay away from the walls of the room.' Don't even sit down. Stand right where you are. You'd murder me if I took another step? Asked the man of the sneer, and a contemptuous and sardonic expression flitted across his face for the first time. I'd sure blow you full of lead, said Ronicky, fervently. I'd kill you like a snake, stranger, which I mostly think you are. So step light and step quick when I talk. Certainly, said the other, bowing. I am entirely at your service. He turned a little to Ruth. I see that you have a most determined cavalier. I suppose he'll instantly abduct you and sweep you away from beneath my eyes. She made a vague gesture of denial. 
"'Go ahead,' said the leader. "'By the way, my name is John Mark. "'I'm Dune. Some call me Ronicky Dune. "'I'm glad to know you, Ronicky Dune. "'I imagine that name fits you. "'Now tell me the story of why you came to this house. "'Of course it wasn't to see a girl.' "'You're wrong. It was.' "'Ah!' In spite of himself, the face of John Mark wrinkled with pain and suspicious rage. I came to see a girl, and her name, I figure, is Carolyn Smith. Relief, wonder, and even a gleam of outright happiness shot into the eyes of John Mark. Carolyn, you came for that? Suddenly he laughed heartily, but there was a tremor of emotion in that laughter. The perfect torture, which had been wringing the soul of the man with the sneer, projected through the laughter. "'I ask your pardon, my dear,' said John Mark to Ruth. "'I should have guessed. "'You found him. He confessed why he was here. You took pity on him, and—' He brushed a hand across his forehead, and was instantly himself, calm and cool. "'Very well, then. It seems I've made an ass of myself. "'But I'll try to make up for it. Now what about Carolyn? There seems to be a whole host of Westerners annoying her. Only one. I'm acting as his agent. And what do you expect? I expect you will send for her and tell her that she is free to go down with me, leave this house, and take a ride or a walk with me. As much as that? If you have to talk to her, why not do the talking here? I don't know, replied Ronicky Doone. I figure she'd think too much about you all the time. The basilisk, eh? asked John Mark. Well, you were going to persuade her to go to Bill Gregg. You know the name, eh? Yes, I have a curious stock of useless information. Well, you're right. I'm going to try to get her back to Bill. But you can't expect me to assent to that. I sure do. And why? This Carolyn Smith may be a person of great value to me. I have no doubt she is, but I got a good argument. What is that? The gun, partner. And, if you couldn't get the girl? But see how absurd the whole thing is, Ronicky Doone? I send for the girl. I request her to go down with you to the street and take a walk, because you wish to talk to her. Heavens, man, I can't persuade her to go with a stranger at night. Surely you see that. "'I'll do the persuading,' said Ronicky Doone calmly. "'And when you're on the streets with the girl, "'do you suppose I'll rest idle and let you walk away with her?' "'Once we're outside of the house, Mark,' said Ronicky Doone, "'I don't ask no favors. Let your men come on. "'All I got to say is I come from a country where every man wears a gun "'and has to learn how to use it. "'I ain't terrible backward with the trigger finger, John Mark.' Not that I figure on bragging, but I want you to pick good men for my trail and tell them to step soft. Is that square? Aside from certain idiosyncrasies, such as your manner of paying a call by the way of a cellar window, I think you are the soul of honor, Ronicky Doone. Now may I sit down? Sure. Suppose we shake hands to bind the bargain, said Ronicky. You send for Carolyn Smith. I'm to do the persuading to get her out of the house. We're safe to the doors of the house. The minute we step into the street, you're free to do anything you want to get either of us. Will you shake on that? For a moment the leader hesitated. Then his fingers closed over the extended hand of Ronicky Doone and clamped down on them like so many steel wires contracting. At the same time, a flush of excitement and fierceness passed over the face of John Mark. Ronicky Doone, taken utterly by surprise, was at a great disadvantage. Then he put the whole power of his hand into the grip, and it was like iron meeting iron. A great rage came into the eyes of John Mark. A great wonder came into the eyes of the Westerner. Where did John Mark get his sudden strength? Well, said Ronicky, we've shaken hands, and now you can do what you please. Sit down, leave the room, anything. He shoved the gun away in his clothes. That brought a start from John Mark, and a flash of eagerness, but he repressed the idea after a single glance at the girl. "'We've shaken hands,' he admitted slowly, as though just realizing the full extent of the meaning of that act. "'Very well, Ronicky. I'll send for Carolyn Smith, and more power to your tongue. 
but you'll never get her away from this house without force. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 Dune Wins A servant answered the bell almost at once. "'Tell Miss Smith she's wanted in Miss Tolliver's room,' said Mark. And when the servant disappeared, he began pacing up and down the room. Now and then he cast a sharp glance to the side and scrutinized the face of Ronicky Doone. With Ruth's permission, the latter had lighted a cigarette and was smoking it in bland enjoyment. Again the leader paused directly before the girl, and with his feet spread and his head bowed in an absurd Napoleonic posture, he considered every feature of her face. The uncertain smile, which came trembling on her face, elicited no response from Mark. She dreaded him, Ronicky saw, as a slave dreads a cruel master. Still she had a certain affection for him, partly as a result of many benefications, no doubt, and partly from long acquaintance, and, above all, she respected his powers of mind intensely. The play of emotion in her face, fear, anger, suspicion, as John Mark paced up and down before her, was a study. With a secret satisfaction, Ronicky Doone saw that her glances continually sought him, timidly, curiously. All vanity aside, he had dropped a bomb under the feet of John Mark, and some day the bomb might explode. There was a tap at the door. It opened, and Carolyn Smith entered in a dressing gown. She smiled brightly at Ruth, and wanly at John Mark, then started at the sight of the stranger. This, said John Mark, is Ronicky Doone. The Westerner rose and bowed. He has come, said John Mark, to try to persuade you to go for a stroll with him, so that he can talk to you about that curious fellow, Bill Gregg. He is also going to try and soften your heart, I believe, by telling you all the inconveniences which Bill Gregg has endured to find you here. But he will do his talking for himself. Just why he has to take you out of the house, at night, before he can talk to you is, I admit, a mystery to me. But let him do the persuading. Ronicky Doone turned to his host, a cold gleam in his eyes. His case had been presented in such a way as to make his task of persuasion almost impossible. Then he turned back and looked at the girl. Her face was a little pale, he thought, but perfectly composed. I don't know, Bill Gregg, she said simply. Of course, I'm glad to talk to you, Mr. Doone, but why not here? John Mark covered a smile of satisfaction, and the girl looked at him, apparently to see if she had spoken correctly. It was obvious that the leader was pleased, and she glanced back at Ronicky with a flush of pleasure. "'I'll tell you why I can't talk to you here,' said Ronicky gently. "'Because, while you're under the same roof with this gent with the sneer,' he turned and indicated Mark, sneering himself as he did so, "'you're not yourself. You don't have a halfway chance to think for yourself.' You feel him around you, and behind you, and beside you every minute, and you keep wondering not what you really feel about anything, but what John Mark wants you to feel. Ain't that the straight of it? She glanced apprehensively at John Mark, and seeing that he did not move to resent this assertion, she looked again with wide-eyed wonder at Ronicky Doone. You see, said the man of the sneer to Carolyn Smith, that our friend from the West has a childlike faith in my powers of, what shall I say? hypnotism? A faint smile of agreement flickered on her lips and went out. Then she regarded Ronicky with an utter lack of emotion. If I could talk like him, said Ronicky Doone, I sure wouldn't care where I had to do the talking, but I haven't any smooth lingo. I ain't got a lot of words already and handy. I'm a pretty single-minded sort of gent, Miss Smith. That's why I want you to go out of this house where I can talk to you alone. She paused and then shook her head. "'As far as going out with me goes,' went on Ronicky, "'well, there's nothing I can say except to ask you to look at me close, lady, and then ask yourself if I'm the sort of gent a girl has got anything to be afraid about. I won't keep you long. Five minutes is all I ask, and we can walk up and down the street in plain view of this house if you want. Is it a go?' At least he had broken through the surface crust of indifference." She was looking at him now, with a shade of interest and sympathy, but she shook her head. "'I'm afraid,' she began. 
Don't refuse right off without thinking, said Ronicky. I've worked pretty hard to get a chance to meet you face to face. I busted into this house tonight like a burglar. Oh, cried the girl. You're the man. Harry Morgan. She stopped, aghast. He's the man who nearly killed Morgan, said John Mark. Is that against me? asked Ronicky eagerly. Is that all against me? I was fighting for a chance to find you and talk to you. Give me that chance now. Obviously, she could not make up her mind. It had been curious that this handsome, boyish fellow should come as an emissary for Bill Gregg. It was more curious still that he should have the daring and the strength to beat Harry Morgan. What shall I do, Ruth? she asked suddenly. Ruth Tolliver glanced apprehensively at John Mark and then flushed, but she raised her head bravely. If I were you, Carolyn, she said steadily, I'd simply ask myself if I could trust Ronicky Doone. Can you? The girl faced Ronicky again, her hands clasped in indecision and excitement. Certainly, if clean honesty was ever written in the face of a man, it stood written in the clear cut features of Ronicky Doone. Yes, she said at last, I'll go. For five minutes, only in the street, in full view of the house. There was a hard, deep throated exclamation from John Mark. He rose and glided across the room, as if to go and vent his anger elsewhere. But he checked and controlled himself at the door, then turned. You seem to have won, Dune. I congratulate you. When he's talking to you, Carolyn, I want you constantly to remember that. Wait, cut in Ronicky sharply. She'll do her own thinking without your help. John Mark bowed with a sardonic smile, but his face was colorless. Plainly, he had been hard hit. Later on, he continued, We'll see more of each other, I expect. A great deal more, Dune. It's something I'm sure I'll wait for, said Ronicky savagely. I got more than one thing to talk over with you, Mark. Maybe about some of them we'll have to do more than talkin'. Goodbye. Lady, I'll be waiting for you down by the front door of the house. Carolyn Smith nodded flung one frightened and appealing glance at Ruth Tolliver for direction, then hurried out to her room to dress. Ronicky Doone turned back to Ruth. In my part of the country, he said simply, they some gents we know sort of casual, and some gents we have for friends. Once in a while you bump into somebody that's so straight and square shooting that you'd like to have him for a partner. If you were out west, lady, and if you were a man, well, I'd pick you for a partner because you've sure played straight and square with me tonight. He turned, hesitated, and facing her again caught up her hand, touched it to his lips, then hurried past John Mark and through the doorway. They could hear his rapid footfalls descending the stairs, and John Mark was thoughtful indeed. He was watching Ruth Tolliver as she stared down at her hand. When she raised her head and met the glance of the leader, she flushed slowly to the roots of her hair. Yes, muttered John Marks, still thoughtfully and half to himself. There's true steel in him. He's done more against me in one half hour than any other dozen men in ten years. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Her Little Joke A brief ten minutes of waiting beside the front door of the house, and Ronicky Doone heard a swift pattering of feet on the stairs. Presently the girl was moving very slowly toward him down the hall. Plainly she was bitterly afraid when she came beside him, under the dim hall light. She wore that same black hat, turned back from her white face, and the red flower beside it was a dull, uncertain blur. Decidedly she was pretty enough to explain Bill Gregg's sorrow. Ronicky gave her no chance to think twice. She was in the very act of murmuring something about a change of mind when he opened the door and, stepping out into the starlight, invited her with a smile and a gesture to follow. In a moment they were in the freshness of the night air. He took her arm and they passed slowly down the steps. At the bottom she turned and looked anxiously at the house. "'Lady,' murmured Ronicky, "'there's nothing to be afraid of. We're going to walk right up and down this street and never get out of sight of the friends you've got in this here house. At the word friends, she shivered slightly, and he added, unless you want to go farther of your own free will. No, no, 
she exclaimed, as if frightened by the very prospect. Then we won't. It's all up to you. You're the boss. I'm the cowpuncher, lady. But tell me quickly, she urged. I... I have to go back. I mustn't stay out too long. Starting in right at the first, Ronicky said, I got to tell you that Bill told me pretty much everything that went on between you two. All about the correspondence school work, and about the letters, and the pictures. I don't understand, murmured the girl faintly. But Ronicky diplomatically raised his voice and went on, as if he had not heard her. You know what he's done with that picture of yours? No, she said faintly. He got the biggest nugget that he's ever taken out of the dirt. He got it beaten out into the right shape, and then he made a locket of it, and put your picture in it, and now he wears it around his neck, even when he's working at the mine. Her breath caught. That silly, cheap snapshot? She stopped. She had admitted everything already, and she had intended to be a very sphinx with this strange westerner. It was only a joke, she said. I... I didn't really mean to... Do you know what that joke did? asked Ronicky. It made two men fight, then cross the continent together and get on the trail of a girl whose name they didn't even know. They found the girl, and then she said she'd forgotten. But no, I don't mean to blame you. There's something queer behind it all but I want to explain one thing. The reason that Bill didn't get to that train wasn't because he didn't try. He did try. He tried so hard that he got into a fight with a gent that tried to hold him up for a few words, and Bill got shot off his hoss. Shot? asked the girl. Shot? Suddenly she was clutching his arm, terrified at the thought. She recovered herself at once and drew away, eluding the hand of Ronicky. He made no further attempt to detain her but he had lifted the mask and seen the real state of her mind, and she, too, knew that the secret was discovered. It angered her and threw her instantly on the aggressive. "'I tell you what I guessed from the window,' said Ronicky. "'You went down to the street, all prepared to meet up with poor old Bill.' "'Prepared to meet him?' she started up at Ronicky. "'How in the world could I ever guess?' She was looking up at him, trying to drag his eyes down to hers, but Ronicky diplomatically kept his attention straight ahead. "'You couldn't guess,' he suggested, "'but there was someone who could guess for you. "'Someone who pretty well knew we were in town, "'who wanted to keep you away from Bill because he was afraid.' "'Of what?' she demanded sharply. "'Afraid of losing you.' This seemed to frighten her. "'What do you know?' she asked. "'I know this,' he answered, "'that I think a girl like you, all in all, is too good for any man. But if any man ought to have her, it's the gent that is fondest of her. And Bill is terrible fond of you, lady. He don't think of nothing else. He's grown thin as a ghost, longing for you. So he sends another man to risk his life, to find me, and tell me about it, she demanded, between anger and sadness. He didn't send me. I just came." but the reason I came was because I knew Bill would give up without a fight. I hate a man who won't fight, she said. It's because he figures he's so much beneath you, said Ronicky. And besides, he can't talk about himself. He's no good at that at all. But if it comes to fightin', lady, why, he rode a couple of hosses to death and stole another and had a gunfight, all for the sake of seeing you when a train passed through town. She was speechless. "'So I thought I'd come,' said Ronicky Doone, "'and tell you the insides of things, "'the way I knew Bill wouldn't and couldn't, "'but I figure it don't mean nothing much to you.' "'She did not answer directly. "'She only said, "'Are men like this in the West? "'Do they do so much for their friends? "'For a gent like Bill, "'that's simple and straight from the shoulder, "'they ain't nothing too good to be done for him. "'What I'd do for him, "'he'd do mighty pronto for me, "'and what he'd do for me, well,' Don't you figure that he'd do ten times as much for the girl he loves? Be honest with me, said Ronicky Doone. Tell me if Bill means any more to you than any stranger. No, yes, which means simply yes, but how much more, lady? I hardly know him. How can I say? It's sure an easy thing to say. You've wrote to him. You've had letters from him. You've sent him your picture, and he sent you his, and you've seen him on the street. 
Lady, you sure know Bill Gregg. What do you think of him? I think. Is he a square sort of gent? Yeah, yes. The kind you'd trust? Yes, but... Is he the kind of man that would stick to a girl he loved and take care of her through thick and thin? You mustn't talk like this, said Caroline Smith, but her voice trembled, and her eyes told him to go on. I'm going back, and tell Bill Gregg that down in your heart you love him just about the same as he loves you. Oh, she asked, would you say a thing like that? It isn't a bit true. I'm afraid that's the way I see it. When I tell him that, you can lay to it that old Bill will let loose all holds, and start for you, and, if there's ten brick walls and twenty gunmen in between, it won't make no difference. He'll find you, or die trying. Before he finished, she was clinging to his arm. If you tell him, you'll be doing a murder, Ronicky Doone. What he'll face will be worse than twenty gunmen. The gent that smiles, eh? Yes, John Mark. No, no, I didn't mean... But you did, and I knew it too. It's John Mark that's between you and Bill. I seen you in the street when you were talking to poor Bill. Look back over your shoulder at that devil standing in the window of this house. Don't call him that. Do you know of one drop of kindness in his nature, lady? Are we quite alone? Not a soul around. Then he is a devil, and being a devil, no ordinary man has a chance against him. Not a chance, Ronicky Doone. I don't know what you did in the house, but I think you must have outfaced him in some way. Well, for that you'll pay, be sure. You'll pay with your life, Ronicky. Every minute now, you're in danger of your life. You'll keep on being in danger until he feels he's squared his account with you. Don't you see that if I let Bill Gregg come near me, then Bill Gregg will be in danger of this same wolf of a man, eh? And in spite of the fact that you like Bill, ah, yes I do, that you love him, in fact. Why shouldn't I tell you, demanded the girl, breaking down suddenly, I do love him, and I can never see him to tell him, because I dread John Mark. Rest easy, said Ronicky, you'll see Bill, or else he'll die trying to get to you. If you're his friend, I'd rather see him dead than living the rest of his life plumb unhappy. She shook her head, arguing, and so they reached the corner of Beckman Place again, and turned into it, and went straight toward the house opposite that of John Mark. Still the girl argued, but it was in a whisper, as if she feared that terrible John Mark might overhear. In the home of John Mark, that calm leader was still with Ruth Tolliver. They had gone down to the lower floor of the house, and at his request she sat at the piano, while Mark sat comfortably beyond the sphere of the piano light and watched her. "'You're thinking of something else,' he told her, and playing abominably. "'I'm sorry.' "'You ought to be,' he said. "'It's bad enough to play poorly for someone who doesn't know, but it's torture to play like that for me.' He spoke without violence, as always, but she knew that he was intensely angry and that familiar chill passed through her body. It never failed to come when she felt that she had aroused his anger. "'Why doesn't Carolyn come back?' she asked at length. "'She's letting him talk himself out, that's all. Carolyn's a clever youngster. She knows how to let a man talk till his throat is dry, and then she'll smile and tell him it's impossible to agree with him. Yes, there are many possibilities in Carolyn. "'You think Ronicky Doone is a gambler?' she asked, harking back to what he had said earlier. "'I think so,' answered John Mark, and again there was a tightening in the muscles around his mouth. "'A gambler has a certain way of masking his own face, and looking at yours, as if he were dragging your thoughts out through your eyes. Also, he's very cool. He belongs at a table with cards on it, and the stake's high.' The door opened. "'Here's young Rose. He'll tell us the truth of the matter.' "'Has she come back, Rose?' The young fellow kept far back in the shadow, and when he spoke his voice was uncertain, almost to the point of trembling. "'No,' he managed to say. "'She ain't come back, Chief.' Mark stared at him for a moment, and then slowly opened a cigarette case and lighted a smoke. "'Well,' he said, and his words were far more violent than the smooth voice. "'Well, idiot, what did she do?' She done a fadeaway, Chief, in the house across the street. Went in with that other gent. 
"'He took her by force?' asked John Mark. "'Nope. She slipped in quick enough, all by herself. He went in last.' "'Damnation!' murmured Mark. "'That's all, Rose.' His follower vanished through the doorway, and closed the door softly after him. John Mark stood up, and paced quietly up and down the room. At length he turned abruptly on the girl. "'Good night. I have business that takes me out.' "'What is it?' she asked eagerly. He paused, as if in doubt as to how he should answer her, if he answered at all. "'In the old days,' he said at last, "'when a man caught a poacher on his grounds, do you know what he did?' "'No. Shot him, my dear, without a thought, and threw his body to the wolves. "'John Mark, do you mean—' "'Your friend Ronicky, of course. "'Only because Carolyn was foolish?' Are you going to... Carolyn? Tut, tut. Carolyn is only a small part of it. He has done more than that. Far more, this poacher out of the West. He turned and went swiftly through the door. The moment it was closed, the girl buried her face in her hands. End of Chapter 14 Chapter 15 The Girl Thief before the death sentence had been passed on him, Ronicky Doone stood before the door of his room, with the trembling girl beside him. "'Wait here,' he whispered to her. "'Wait here while I go in and wake him up. "'It's going to be the greatest moment in his life. "'Bill Gregg is going to turn into the richest man in New York, all in one moment. "'But I don't dare go in. "'It will mean—it will mean everything. "'But it's too late to turn back now. "'Besides, in your heart of hearts—' "'You don't want to turn back, you know?' Quickly he passed into the room and hurried to the bed of Bill Gregg. Under the biting grip of Doone's hand, Bill Gregg writhed to a sitting posture with a groan. Still he was in the throes of his dream, and only half awake. "'I've lost her,' he whispered. "'You're wrong, idiot,' said Ronicky, softly. "'You're wrong. You've won her. She's at the door now, waiting to come in.' Ronicky said Bill Gregg, suddenly awake, you've been the finest friend a man ever had. But if you make a joke out of her, I'll wring your neck. Sure you would, but before you do that, jump into your clothes and open the door. Sleep was still thick enough in the brain of Bill Gregg to make him obey automatically. He stumbled into his clothes and then shambled dizzily to the door and opened it. As the light from the room struck down the hall, Ronicky saw his friend stiffen to his full height and strike a hand across his face. "'Stars and stripes!' exclaimed Bill Gregg. "'The days of miracles ain't over!' Ronicky Doone turned his back and went to the window. Across the street rose the forbidden face of the house of John Mark, and it threatened Ronicky Doone like a clenched hand, brandished against him. The shadow under the upper gable was like the shadow under a frowning brow. In that house worked the mind of John Mark. Certainly Ronicky Doone had won the first stage of the battle between them, but there was more to come, much more of that battle, and who would win in the end was an open question. He made up his mind grimly that, whatever happened, he would first ship Bill Gregg and the girl out of town, then act as the rear guard to cover their retreat. When he returned, they had closed the door and were standing back from one another, with such shining eyes that the heart of Ronicky Doone leaped. If, for a moment, doubt of his work came to him, it was banished as they glanced toward him. "'I don't know how he did it,' Bill Gregg was stammering. "'But here it is. Done. Bless you, Ronicky.' "'A minute ago,' Ronicky said, "'it looked to me like the lady didn't know her own mind, but that seems to be over.' "'I found my mind in the moment I saw him,' said the girl. Ronicky studied her in wonder. There was no embarrassment, no shame to have confessed herself. She had the clear brow of a child. Suddenly it seemed to Ronicky that he had become an old man, and these were two children under his protection. He struck into the heart of the problem at once. "'The main point,' he said, "'is to get the two of you out of town as quick as we can.' Out west in Bill's country he can take care of you, but back here this John Mark is a devil, and has the strength to stop us. How quick can you go, Carolyn? I can never go, she said, as long as John Mark is alive. Then he's as good as dead, said Bill Gregg. We both have guns, 
and no matter how husky John Mark may be, we'll get him. The girl shook her head. All the joy had gone out of her face, and left her wistful and misty-eyed. You don't understand, and I can't tell you. You can never harm John Mark. Why not? asked Bill Gregg. Has he got a thousand men around him all the time? Even if he has, there's ways of getting at him. Not a thousand men, said the girl. But, you see, he doesn't need help. He's never failed. That's what they say of him. John Mark, the man who has never lost. Listen to me, said Ronicky angrily. Seems to me that everyone stands around and gapes at this man with the sneer a terrible lot, without a pile of good reason behind him. Never failed? Why, lady, here's one night when he's failed, and failed bad. He's lost you. No, said Carolyn. Not lost you? asked Bill Gregg. Say, you ain't figuring on going back to him. I have to go back. Why? demanded Gregg. It's because of you, interrupted Ronicky Doone. She knows that if she leaves you, Mark will start on your trail. Mark is the name of the gent with the sneer, Bill. He's got to die, then, Ronicky. I've been figuring on the same thing for a long time, but he'll die hard, Bill. Don't you see? asked the girl. Both of you are strong men and brave, but against John Mark I know that you're helpless. It isn't the first time people have hated him. Hated? Who does anything but hate him? But that doesn't make any difference. He wins. He always wins, and that's why I've come to you. She turned to Bill Gregg but such a sad resignation held her eyes that Ronicky Doone bowed his head. "'I've come to tell you that I love you, that I have always loved you, since I first began writing to you. All of yourself showed through your letters, plain and strong and simple and true. I've come tonight to tell you that I love you, but that we can never marry. Not that I fear him for myself, but for you.' "'Listen here,' said Bill Gregg. "'Ain't there police in this town?' What could they do? In all of the things which he has done, no one has been able to accuse him of a single illegal act. At least no one has ever been able to prove a thing. And yet he lives by crime. Does that give you any idea of the sort of man he is? A low hound, said Bill Gregg bitterly. That's what he shows to be. Tell me straight, said Ronicky. What sort of hold has he got over you? Can you tell us? I have to tell you, said the girl gravely, if you insist, but won't you take my word for it, and ask no more? We have a right to know, said Ronicky. Bill has a right, and me being Bill's friend, I have a right too. She nodded. First off, what's the way John Mark uses you? She clenched her hands. If I tell you, you will both despise me. Try us, said Ronicky. And you can lay to this, lady. That when a gent out of the West says partner to a girl or a man, he means it. What you do may be bad. What you are is all right. We both know it. The inside of you is right, lady, no matter what John Mark makes you do. But tell us straight, what is it? He has made me, said the girl, her head falling, a thief. Ronicky saw Bill Gregg wince, as if someone had struck him in the face. And he himself waited curious to see what the big fellow would do. He had not long to wait. Greg went straight to the girl and took her hands. "'Do you think that makes any difference?' he asked. "'Not to me, and not to my friend Ronicky. There's nothing behind it. Tell us that.' "'There is something behind it,' said the girl, "'and I can't say how grateful I am to both of you for trusting me. I have a brother. He came to New York to work, found it easy to spend money, and spent it. Finally he began sending home for money. We are not rich, but we gave him what we could. It went on like that for some time. Then one day a stranger called at our house, and it was John Mark. He wanted to see me, and when we talked together he told me that my brother had done a terrible thing. What it was I can't even tell you. I wouldn't believe at first, though he showed me what looked like proofs. At last I believed enough to agree to go to New York and see for myself. I came here and saw my brother and made him confess. What it was I can't tell you. I can only say that his life is in the hand of John Mark. John Mark has only to say ten words and my brother is dead. He told me that. 
he showed me the hold that Mark had over him, and begged me to do what I could for him. I didn't see how I could be of use to him, but John Mark showed me. He taught me to steal, and I have stolen. He taught me to lie, and I have lied. And he has me still in the hollow of his hand. Do you see? And that's why I say it's hopeless. Even if I could fight against John Mark, which no one can, you couldn't help me. The moment you strike him, he strikes my brother. Curse him, exclaimed Ronicky. Curse the hound. Then he added, there's just one thing to do, first of all. You got to go back to John Mark. Tell him that you came over here. Tell him that you seen Bill Gregg, but you only came to say goodbye to him and ask him to leave town and go west. Then, tomorrow, we'll move out, and he may think that we've gone. Meantime, the thing you do is give me the name of your brother and tell me where I can find him. I'll hunt him up. Maybe something can be done for him. I don't know, but that's where we've got to try. But, she began, do what he says, whispered Bill Gregg. I've doubted Ronicky before, but look at all he's done. Do what he says, Carolyn. It means putting him in your power, she said at last, just as he was put in the power of John Mark, but I trust you. Give me a slip of paper, and I'll write on it what you want. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 Disarming Suspicion From the house across the street, Carolyn Smith slipped out upon the pavement and glanced wearily about her. The street was empty, quieter and more village-like than ever, yet she knew perfectly well that John Mark had not allowed her to be gone so long without keeping watch over her. Somewhere from those blank faces of the houses across the street, his spies kept guard over her movements. Here she glanced sharply over her shoulder, and it seemed to her that a shadow flitted into the door of the basement, further up the street. At that, she fled and did not stop running until she was at the door of the house of Mark. Since all was quiet, up and down the street, she paused again, her hand upon the knob. To enter meant to step back into the life which she hated. There had been a time when she had almost loved the life to which John Marks had introduced her. There had been a time when she rejoiced in the nimbleness of her fingers which had enabled her to become an adept thief. And by doing so, she had kept the life of her brother from danger, she verily believed. She was still saving him, and so long as she worked for John Mark, she knew that her brother was safe, yet she hesitated long at the door. It would be only the work of a moment to flee back to the man she loved, tell him that she could not, and dared not stay longer with the master criminal, and beg him to take her to the West to a clean life. Her hand fell from the knob, but she raised it again immediately. It would not do to flee, so long as John Mark had power of life and death over her brother. If Ronicky Doone, as he promised, was able to inspire her brother with the courage to flee from New York, give up his sporting life and seek refuge in some far-off place, then, indeed, she would go with Bill Gregg to the ends of the earth and mock the cunning fiend who had controlled her life so long. The important thing now was to disarm him of all suspicion, make him feel that she had only visited Bill Gregg in order to say farewell to him. With this in her mind she opened the front door and stepped into the hall, always lighted with ominous dimness. The gloom fell about her like the visible presence of John Mark. A squat, powerful figure glided out of the doorway to the right. It was Harry Morgan, and the side of his face was swathed in bandages so that he had to twist his mouth violently in order to speak. "'The chief,' he said abruptly, "'beat it quick to his room. He wants you.' "'Why?' asked Carolyn, hoping to extract some grain or two of information from the henchman. "'Listen, kid,' said the sullen criminal, "'do you think I'm a nut to blow what I know? You beat it, and he'll tell you what he wants.' The violence of his voice, however, had given her clues enough to the workings of the chief's mind." She had always been a favored member of the gang, and the men had whistled attendance on her hardly less than upon Ruth Tolliver herself. This sudden harshness in the language of Harry Morgan told her that too much was known, or guessed. A sudden weakness came over her. "'I'm going out,' she said, turning to Harry Morgan, who had sauntered over to the front door. "'Are you?' he asked. "'I'm going to take one turn up the block. I'm not sleepy yet,' 
she repeated, and put her hand on the knob of the door. "'Not so you could notice it, you ain't,' retorted Morgan. "'We've taken lip enough from you, kid. Your day's over. Go up and see what the chief has to say, but you ain't going through this door unless you walk over me.' "'Those are orders?' she asked, stepping back, with her heart turning cold. "'Think I'm doing this on my own hook?' She turned slowly to the stairs. With her hand on the baluster, she decided to try the effect of one personal appeal. Nerving herself, she whirled and ran to Harry Morgan. "'Harry,' she whispered, "'let me go out until I've worked up the courage. You know he's terrible to face when he's angry, and I'm afraid, Harry. I'm terribly afraid.' "'Are you?' asked Morgan. "'Well, you ain't the first. So go and take your medicine like the rest of us been doing time and time running.' There was no help for it. She went wearily up the stairs to the room of the master thief. There she gave the accustomed rap with the proper intervals. Instantly the cold, soft voice, which she knew and hated so, called her to enter. She found him in the act of putting aside his book. He was seated in a deep easy chair, a dressing gown of silk, and a pair of horn-rimmed spectacles gave him the look of owlish wisdom with a touch of the owl's futility of expression likewise. He rose, as usual, with all his courtesy. She thought at first, as he showed her to a chair, that he was going to take his usual damnable tack of pretending ignorance in order to see how much she would confess. However, to-night this was not his plan of battle. The moment she was seated, he removed his spectacles, drew a chair close to hers, and sat down, leaning far forward, "'Now, my dear foolish girl,' said the master thief, smiling benevolently upon her, "'what have you been doing to-night to make us all miserable?' She knew at once that he was aware of every move she had made, from the first to the last. It gave her firmness to tell the lie with suavity. "'It's a queer yarn, John,' she said. "'I'm used to queer yarns,' he answered. "'But where have you been all this time? It was only to take five minutes, I thought.' She made herself smile. "'That's because you don't know Ronicky Doon, John.' "'I'm getting to know him, however,' said the master. "'And before I'm done, I hope to know him very well indeed. "'Well, he has a persuasive tongue. "'I think I noticed that for myself. "'And when he told me how poor Bill Gregg had come clear across the continent, "'no wonder you were touched, my dear. "'New Yorkers won't travel so far, will they? "'Not for a girl, I mean.' Hardly, but Ronicky Doon made it such a sad affair that I promised I'd go across and see Bill Gregg. Not in his room. I knew you wouldn't let him come to see me here. Never presuppose what I'll do. But go on. I'm interested. Very. Just as much as if Ronicky Doon himself were telling me. She eyed him shrewdly. But, if there were any deception in him, he hid it well. She could not find the double meaning that must have been behind his words. I went there, however, she said, because I was sorry for him, John. If you had seen, you'd have been sorry, too, or else you would have laughed. I could hardly keep from it at first. I suppose he took you in his arms at once. I think he wanted to. Then, of course, I told him at once why I had come. Which was? Simply that it was absurd for him to stay about and persecute me that the letters I wrote to him were simply written for fun when I was doing some of my cousin's work at the correspondence schools, that the best thing he could do would be to take my regrets and go back to the West. "'Did you tell him all that?' asked John Mark, in a rather changed voice. "'Yes, but not quite so bluntly. "'Naturally not. You're a gentle girl, Carolyn. "'I suppose he took it very hard. "'Very, but in a silly way.' He's full of pride, you see. He drew himself up and gave me a lecture about deceiving men. Well, since you have lost interest in him, it makes no difference. But in a way, she said faintly, rising slowly from her chair, I can't help feeling some interest. Naturally not. But you see, I was worried so much about you and this fellow that I gave orders for him to be put out of the way as soon as you left him. Carolyn Smith stood for a moment, stunned, and then ran to him. "'No, no,' she declared. "'In the name of the dear mercy of heaven, John, you haven't done that.' "'I'm sorry.' "'Then call him back, the one you sent. Call him back, John, and I'll serve you for the rest of my life without question. I'll never fail you, John, 
but for your own sake and mine, for the sake of everything fair in the world, call him back. He pushed away her hands, but without violence. I thought it would be this way, he said coldly. You told a very good lie, Carolyn. I suppose clever Ronicky Doone rehearsed you in it, but it needed only the oldest trick in the world to expose you. She recoiled from him. It was only a joke, then? You didn't mean it, John? Thank heaven for that. A savagery, which though generally concealed, was never far from the surface, now broke out in him, making the muscles of his face tense and his voice metallic. Get to your room, he said fiercely. Get to your room. I've wasted time enough on you and on your brat of a brother. And now a western lout is to spoil what I've done? I've a mind to wash my hands of all of you and sink you. Get to your room and stay there while I make up my mind which of the two I shall do. She went, cringing like one beaten to the door, and he followed her, trembling with rage. Or have you a choice, he asked, brother or lover, which shall it be? She turned and stretched out her hands to him, unable to speak, but the man of the sneer struck down her arms and laughed in her face. In mute terror she fled to her room. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 Old Scars In his room Bill Gregg was striding up and down, throwing his hands toward the ceiling. Now and then he paused to slap Ronicky Doone on the back. "'It's fate, Ronicky,' he said over and over again. "'Thinking of waking up and finding the girl you loved and lost waiting for you? "'It's the dead come to life. "'I'm the happiest man in the world. "'Ronicky, old boy, one of these days I'll be able—' "'He paused, stopped by the solemnity of Dune's face. "'What's wrong, Ronicky?' "'I don't know,' said the other gloomily. He rubbed his hands slowly, as if to bring back the circulation to numbed limbs. "'You act like you're sick, Ronicky. "'I'm getting bad luck signs, Bill. That's the short of it. "'How come? The old scars are prickling. "'Scars? What scars? Ain't you noticed them? "'It was bedtime, so Ronicky Doone took off his coat and shirt. "'The rounded body, alive with playing muscles— was striped here and there with white streaks, scars left by healed wounds. At your age, a kid like you with scars? Bill Gregg had been asking, and then he saw the exposed scars and gasp. How come, Ronicky, he asked, huskily in his astonishment, that you got all those and you ain't dead yet? I don't know, said the other. I wonder a pile about that myself. Fact is, I'm a lucky gent, Bill Gregg. They say back yonder, in your country, that you ain't never been beaten, Ronicky. They sure say a lot of foolish things, just to hear themselves talk, partner. Gent gets pretty good with a gun, then they say he's the best that ever breathed, that he's never been beat. But they forget things that happened just a year back. No, sir, I sure took my lickings when I started. But doggone it, Ronicky, you ain't yet twenty-four now. Between sixteen and twenty-two I spent a pile of time in bed, Bill, and you can lay to that. And you kept practicing? Sure, when I found out that I had to. I never liked shooting much. Hated to think of having a gent's life right inside the crook of my trigger finger. But when I seen that I had to get good, why I just let go all holds and practiced day and night. And I still got to practice. I seen that, said Bill Gregg. Every day for an hour or two you work out with your guns. It's like being a musician, said Ronicky without enthusiasm. I heard about it once. Suppose a gent works up to be a fine musician, maybe at the piano. You'd think when he got to the top and knew everything, he could lay off and take things easy the rest of his life. But not him. Nope, he's got to work like a slave every day. "'But how come you felt them scars pricking you as a bad luck sign, Ronicky?' he asked after a time. "'Is there anything that's gone wrong, far as you can see?' "'I don't know,' said Ronicky gravely. "'Maybe not, and maybe so. I ain't a prophet. "'But I don't like having everything so smooth, "'not when they's a gent like the man with the sneer on the other end of the wire. "'It means he's holding back some cards on us, "'and I'd sure like to see the color of what he's got.' What I'm going to work for is this, Bill, 
to get Carolyn's brother, Jerry Smith, and rustle him out of town. But how can you do that when John Mark has a hold on him? That's a pile of bunk, Bill. I figure Mark is just bluffing. He ain't going to turn anybody over to the police. Less he has to do with the police, the happier he'll be. You can lay to that. Matter of fact, he's been loaning money to Carolyn's brother. You heard her say that. Also, he thinks that Mark is the finest and most generous gent that ever stepped. Probably a selfish skunk of a spoiled kid, this brother of hers. Most like he puts Mark up as some sort of an ideal. Well, the thing to do is get hold of him and wake him up and pay off his debts to Mark, which most like run to several thousand. Several thousand, Ronicky? But where'll we get the money? You forget that I can always get money. It grows on bushes for me, he grinned at Bill Gregg. Once we get Jerry Smith, then the whole gang of us will head straight west, as fast as we can step. Now let's hit the hay. Never had the mind of Ronicky Doon worked more quickly and surely to the point. The case of Jerry Smith was exactly as he had surmised. As for the crime of which John Mark knew, and which he held like a club over Jerry Smith, it had been purely and simply an act of self-defense. But, to Carolyn and her brother, Mark had made it seem clear that the shadow of the electric chair was before the young fellow. Mark had worked seriously to win Carolyn. She was remarkably dexterous. She was the soul of courage. And, if he could once make her love her work, she would make him rich. In the meantime, she did very well indeed, and he strengthened his hold on her through her brother. It was not hard to do. If Jerry Smith was the soul of recklessness, he was the soul of honor, also, in many ways. John Mark had only to lead the boy toward a life of heavy expenditures and gaming, lending him from time to time the wherewithal to keep it up. In this way he anchored Jerry as a safeguard to windward, in case of trouble. But now that Ronicky Doon had entered the tangle, everything was changed. That clear-eyed fellow might see through the very bottom of Mark's tidewater plans. He might step in and cut the Gordian knot, simply paying off Jerry's debts. Telling the boy to laugh at the danger of exposure, Doon could snatch him away to the west. So Mark came to forestall Ronicky by sending Jerry out of town and out of reach for the time being. He would not risk the effect of Ronicky's tongue. Had not Carolyn been persuaded under the very eyes of this strange Westerner? The very next morning John Mark went straight to the apartment of his protégé. It was his own man, Northrop, who answered the bell and opened the door to him. He had supplied Northrop to Jerry Smith immediately after Carolyn accomplished the lifting of the Larrigan emeralds. That clever piece of work proved the worth of the girl and made it necessary to spare no expense on Jerry. So he had given him the tired and proven Northrop. The moment he looked into the grinning face of Northrop, he knew that the master was not at home, and both the chief and the servant relaxed. They were friends of too long a term to stand on ceremony. "'There was no one here?' asked Mark, as a matter of form. "'Not a soul. The kid skipped. Not a soul in the house.' Suppose he were to come up behind the door and hear you talk about him like this, Northrop. He'd trim you down nicely, eh? Him? asked Northrop, with an eloquent jerk of his hand. He's a husky young brute, but it ain't brute force that I work with. He smiled significantly into the face of the other. And John Mark smiled in return. They understood one another perfectly. When is he coming back? Didn't leave any word, Chief. Isn't this earlier than his usual time for starting the day? It is, by five hours. The lazy pup usually don't crack an eye till one in the afternoon. What happened this morning? Something rare, something it would have done your heart good to see. Out with it, Northrop. I was routed out of bed at eight o'clock by a jangling of the telephone. The operator downstairs said a gentleman was calling on Mr. Smith. I said, of course... Mr. Smith couldn't be called upon at that hour. Then the operator said the gentleman would come up to the door and explain. I told him to come ahead. At the door of the apartment, I met as fine a youngster as I ever laid eyes on, brown as a berry, with a quick, straight look about the eyes that would have done you good to see. No booze or dope in that face, chief. He said, How tall was he? asked the chief. About my height. Know him? Maybe. What name did he give? Didn't give a name. 
I've come to surprise Jerry, he says to me. Anybody would surprise Jerry at this hour of the morning, says I. It's too early, I take it, says he. About five hours, says I. Then this is going to be one of the exceptions, says he. If you knew Jerry better, you wouldn't force yourself on him, says I. Son, says the fresh kid. Is this the way you talk to Smith? broke in Mark. No, I can polish up my lingo with the best of em. But this brown-faced youngster was a card. Son, he says to me, I'll do my own explainin'. Just lead me to his dugout. I couldn't help laughin'. You'll get a hot reception, says I. I come from a hot country, says he, and I got no doubt that Jerry will try to make me at home, and he grinned with a devil in each eye. Come in, then, says I, and in he steps. And mind your fists, says I, if you wake him up sudden. He fights sometimes because he has to, but mostly because it's a pleasure to him. Sure, says he, that's the way I like to have him come. And he went in, demanded John Mark. What's wrong with that? asked Northrop anxiously. Nothing. Go ahead. Well, in he went to Jerry's room. I listened at the door. I heard him call Jerry, and then Jerry groaned like he was half dead. I don't know you, says Jerry. You will before I'm through with you, says the other. Who the devil are you? asked Jerry. Dune is my name, says he. Then go to the devil till one o'clock, says Jerry. And come back then if you want to. Here's my time for a beauty sleep. If it's that time, says Dune, you'll have to go ugly today. I'm here to talk. I heard Jerry sit up in bed. Now what the devil's the meaning of this? he asked. Are you awake? says Dune. Yes, but be hung to you, says Jerry. Don't be hanging me, says Dune. You just mark this day down in red. It's a lucky one for you, son. And how do you mean that? says Jerry, and I could hear by his voice he was choking. He was that crazy mad. Because it's the day you met me, says Dune. That's why it's a lucky one for you. Listen to me, says Jerry. Of all the nervy, cold-blooded fakers that ever stepped, you're the nerviest. Thanks, says Dune. I think I am doing pretty well. If I wanted to waste time, says Jerry, I'd get up and throw you out. It's a wise man, says Dune, that does his talkin' from the other side of a rock. Well, says Jerry, do you think I can't throw you out? Anyway, says Dune, I'm still here. I heard the spring squeal as Jerry went bouncing out of bed. For a minute they wrestled, and I opened the door. What I see was Jerry lying flat, and Dune sitting on his chest, as calm and smiling as you please. I closed the door quick. Jerry's too game a boy to mind being licked fair and square. But, of course, he'd rather fight till he died than have me or anybody else see him give up. I don't know how you got there, says Jerry, but if I don't kill you for it later on, I'd like to shake hands with you. It was a good trick. The gent that taught me near busted me in two with the trick of it, said Dune. Suppose I let you up. Is there to be handshaking or fightin'? My wind is gone for half an hour, says Jerry, and my head is pretty near jarred loose from my spinal column. I guess it'll have to be handshaking today. But I warn you, Dune, he says, some day I'll have it all out with you over again. Any time you mention, says Dune, but if you landed that left when you rushed in, I would have been on the carpet instead of you. And Jerry chuckles, feeling a pile better to think how near he had come to winning the fight. Wait till I jump under the shower, says Jerry, and I'll be with you again. Have you had breakfast? And what has brought you to me? And who the devil are you, Dune? Are you out of the West? He piles all the questions pretty thick and fast at Dune, and then I seen right off that him and Dune had made up to be pretty thick with each other. So I went away from the door and didn't listen any more. In about a half an hour, out they walk, arm in arm, like old pals. It was perfectly clear to John Mark that Ronicky had come there purposely to break the link between him and young Jerry Smith. It was perfectly plain why he wanted to do it. How much does Jerry owe me? he asked suddenly. The other drew out a pad and calculated for a moment. Seven thousand eight hundred and forty-two, he announced with a grin as he put back the pad. That's what he sold himself for up to this time. Too much in a way, and not enough in another way, replied John Mark. 
Listen, if he comes back, which I doubt, keep him here. Get him away from Ronicky. Dope him. Dope them both. In any case, if he comes back here, don't let him get away. You understand? Nope. But I don't need to understand. I'll do it. John Mark nodded and turned toward the door. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 The Spider's Web Only the select attended the meetings at Fernand's. It was doubly hard to choose them. They had to have enough money to afford high play, and they also had to lose without a murmur. It made it extremely difficult to build up a clientele, but Fernand was equal to the task. He seemed to smell out the character of a man, or woman, to know at once how much iron was in their souls. And following the course of an evening's play, Fernand knew the exact moment at which a man had had enough. It was never twice the same for the same man. A rich fellow who lost twenty thousand one day, and laughed at it, might groan and curse if he lost twenty hundred a week later. It was Fernand's desire to keep the groans and curses from being heard in his gaming-house. He extracted wallets painlessly, so to speak. He was never crooked, and yet he would not have a dealer in his employ unless the fellow knew every good trick of running up a deck. The reason was that while Fernand never cheated in order to take money away from his customers, he very, very frequently had his men cheat in order to give money away. This sounds like a mad procedure for the proprietor of a gambling house, but there were profound reasons beneath it. For one of the maxims of Fernand, and like every gambler he had many of them, was that the best way to make a man lose money is first of all to make him win it. Such was M. Frederick Fernand, and if many compared him to Falstaff, and many pitied the merry fat old man for having fallen into so hard a profession, yet there were a few who called him a bloated spider, holding his victims with invisible cords, and bleeding them slowly to death. To help him he had selected two men, both young, both shrewd, both iron in will and nerve and courage, both apparently equally expert with the cards and both as equally capable of pleasing his clients. One was a Scotchman, McKeever. The other was a Jew, Simons. But in looks they were as much alike as two peas out of one pod. They hated each other with silent, smiling hatred, because they knew that they were on trial for their fortunes. Tonight the Jew, Simons, was dealing at one of the tables, and the Scotchman, McKeever, stood at the side of the master of the house, ready to execute his commissions. Now and again his dark eyes wandered toward the table where the Jew sat, with the cards flashing through his fingers. McKeever hungered to be there on the firing line. How he wished he could feel the sifting of the polished cardboard under his fingertips. They were playing blackjack. He noted the smooth skill with which Simons buried a card. And yet the trick was not perfectly done. Had he, McKeever, been there, at this point he was interrupted by the easy, oily voice of Monsieur Fernand. This is an infernal nuisance. McKeever raised his eyebrows and waited for an explanation. Two young men, very young, very straight, had just come into the rooms. One he knew was Jerry Smith. Another table and dealer wasted, declared Monsieur Fernand. Smith, and by heavens he's brought some friend with him. "'Shall I see if I can turn them away without playing?' asked McKeever. "'No, not yet. Smith is a friend of John Mark. Don't forget that. Never forget, McKeever, that the friends of John Mark must be treated with gloves, always.' "'Very good,' replied McKeever, like a pupil memorizing in class. "'I'll see how far I can go with them,' went on M. Fernand. He went straight to the telephone and rang John Mark. "'How far should I go with them?' he asked, after he explained that Smith had just come in. "'Is there someone with him?' asked John Mark eagerly. "'A young chap about the same age, very brown. "'That's the man I want.' "'The man you want?' "'Fernand,' said Mark, without explaining. "'Those youngsters have gone out there to make some money, at your expense.' Monsieur Fernand growled. "'I wish you'd stop using me as a bank, Mark,' he complained. Besides, it costs a good deal. 
"'I pay you a tolerable interest, I believe,' said John Mark coldly. "'Of course, of course. Well, this in the manner of great resignation. How much shall I let them take away?' "'Bleed them both to death, if you want. Let them play on credit. Go as far as you like.' "'Very well,' said Fernand. But I may be out there later myself. Good-bye. The face of Frederick Fernand was dark when he went back to McKeever. "'What do you think of the fellow with Jerry Smith?' he asked. "'Of him?' asked McKeever, fencing desperately for another moment, as he stared at Ronicky Doone. The latter was idling at a table close to the wall, running his hands through a litter of magazines. After a moment he raised his head suddenly and glanced across the room at McKeever. The shock of meeting glances is almost a physical thing and the bold, calm eyes of Ronicky Doone lingered on McKeever, and seemed to judge him and file that judgment away. McKeever threw himself upon the wings of his imagination. There was something about this fellow, or his opinion would not have been asked. What was it? Well, asked Frederick Fernand peevishly, what do you think of him? I think, said the other casually, that he's probably a western gunman, with a record as long as my arm. You think that? asked the fat man. Well, I have an idea that you think right. There's something about him that suggests action. The way he looks about so slowly, that is the way a fearless man is apt to look, you know. Do you think you can sit at a table with Ronicky Doone, as they call him, and Jerry Smith, and win from them this evening? With any sort of luck, leave luck out of it. John Mark has made a special request. Tonight, McKeever, it's going to be your work to make luck come to you. Do you think you can? A faint smile began to dawn on the face of McKeever. Never in his life had he heard news so sweet to his ear. It meant, in brief, that he was to be trusted for the first time at real manipulation of the cards. His trust in himself was complete. This would be a crushing blow for Simons. Mind you, the master of the house went on, if you're caught at working. Nonsense, said McKeever happily. They can't follow my hands. This fellow Dune, I don't know. I'll take the chance. If you're caught, I turn you out. You hear? Are you willing to take the risk? Yes, said McKeever, very pale but determined. At the right moment, McKeever approached Jerry and Ronicky, dark, handsome, smoothly amiable. He was clever enough to make no indirect effort to introduce the topic. I see that you gentlemen are looking about, he said. "'Yonder is a clear table for us. "'Do you agree, Mr. Smith?' "'Jerry Smith nodded, and having introduced Ronicky Doone, "'the three started for the table which had been indicated. "'It was in an alcove, apart from the sweep of big rooms "'which were given over to the players. "'It lay, too, conveniently in range of the beat of Frederick Fernand, "'as he moved slowly back and forth, over a limited territory, "'and stopped here and there for a word, here and there for a smile.' He was smoothing the way for dollars to slide out of wallets. Now he deliberately stopped the party in their progress to the alcove. "'I have to meet you,' he said to Ronicky. "'You remind me of a friend of my father, a young Westerner, those many years ago. Same brown skin, same clear eye. He was a card expert, the man I'm thinking about. I hope you're not in the same class, my friend.' Then he went on, laughing thunderously at his own poor jest particularly from the back as he retreated. He seemed a harmless fat man, very simple, very naive. But Ronicky Doone regarded him with an interest both cold and keen. And with much the same regard, after Fernand had passed out of view, the Westerner regarded the table at which they were to sit. In the alcove there were three wall lights, giving an ample illumination, too ample to suit Ronicky Doone, for McKeever had taken the chair with the back to the light. He made no comment, but taking the chair which was facing the lights, the chair which had been pointed out to him by McKeever, he drew it around on the far side, and sat down next to the professional gambler. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 Stacked Cards The game opened slowly. The first, second, and third hands were won by Jerry Smith, he tucked away his chips with a smile of satisfaction, as if the three hands were significant of the whole progress of the game. But Ronicky Doone pocketed his losses without either smile or sneer. 
he had played too often in games in the West which ran to high prices. Miners had come in with their belts loaded with dust, eager to bet the entire sum of their winnings at once. Ranchers, fat with the profits of a good sale of cattle, had wagered the whole amount in a single evening. As far as large losses and large gains were concerned, Ronnie Cadoon was ready to handle the bets of anyone other than millionaires, without a smile or a wince. The trouble with McKeever was that he was playing the game too closely. Long before, it had been a maxim of the chief that a good gambler should only lose by a small margin. That maxim, McKeever, playing for the first time for what he felt were important stakes in the eyes of Fernand, followed too closely. Stacking the cards, with the adeptness which years of practice had given him, he never raised the amount of his opponent's hand beyond his own order. A pair was beaten by a pair, three of a kind was simply beaten by three of a kind of a higher order, and, when a full house was permitted by his expert dealing to appear to excite the other gamblers, he himself indulged in no more than a superior grade of three of a kind. Half a dozen times these coincidences happened, without calling for any distrust on the part of Ronicky Doon, but eventually he began to think. Steady training enabled his eyes to do what the eyes of an ordinary man could not achieve, and while to Jerry Smith all that happened in the deals of McKeever was the height of correctness, Ronicky Doon, at the seventh deal, awakened to the fact that something was wrong. He hardly dared to allow himself to think of anything for a time, but waited and watched, hoping against hope that Jerry Smith himself would discover the fraud which was being perpetrated on them. But Jerry Smith maintained a bland interest in the game. He had won between two and three hundred, and these winnings had been allowed by McKeever to accumulate in little runs, here and there. For nothing encourages a gambler towards reckless betting so much as a few series of high hands. He then begins to believe that he can tell, by some mysterious feeling inside, that one good hand presages another. Jerry Smith had not been brought to the point where he was willing to plunge, but he was very close to it. McKeever was gathering the youngster in the hollow of his hand, and Ronicky Doon, fully aware and aware of all that was happening, felt a gathering rage accumulate in him. There was something doubly horrible in this cheating in this place. Ronicky set his teeth and watched. Plainly he was the chosen victim. The winnings of Jerry Smith were carefully balanced against the losses of Ronicky Doon. Hatred for this smooth-faced McKeever was waxing in him, and hatred in Ronicky Doon meant battle. An interruption came to him from the side. It came in the form of a brief rustling of silk, like the stir of wind, and then Ruth Tolliver's coppery hair and green eyes were before him, Ruth Tolliver in an evening gown and wonderful to look at. Ronicky Doon indulged himself with staring eyes as he rose to greet her. This, then, was her chosen work under the regime of John Mark. It was as a gambler that she was great. The uneasy fire in her eyes, the same fire that he had seen in western gold camps, in western gaming houses, and the delicate, nervous fingers took on a new meaning to him. That she had won heavily this evening he saw at once. The dangerous and impalpable flush of the gamester was on her face and behind it burned a glow and radiance. She looked as if, having defeated men by the coolness of her wits, and the favor of luck, she had begun to think that she could now outguess the world. Two men trailed behind her, stirring uneasily about when she paused at Ronicky's alcove table. "'You found the place so soon?' she asked. "'How's your luck?' "'Not nearly as good tonight as yours.' "'Oh, I can't help winning.' Every card I touch turns to gold this evening. I think I have the formula for it. Tell me, then, said Ronicky, quickly enough, for there was just a shadow of a backward nod of her head. Just step aside. I'll spoil Mr. McKeever's game for him, I'm afraid. Ronicky excused himself with a nod to the other two, and followed the girl into the next room. I have bad news, she whispered instantly, but keep smiling. Laugh if you can. The two men with me I don't know. They may be his spies, for all I can tell. Ronicky Doon, John Mark is out for you. 
Why in heaven's name are you interfering with Carolyn Smith and her affairs? It will be your death, I promise you. John Mark has arrived and has placed men around the house. Ronicky Doone, he means business. Help yourself if you can. I'm unable to lift a hand for you. If I were you, I should leave, and I should leave at once. Laugh, Ronicky Doone. He obeyed, laughing until tears were glittering in his eyes, until the girl laughed with him. Good, she whispered. Good-bye, Ronicky, and good luck. He watched her going, saw the smiles of the two men as they greeted her again and closed in beside her, and watched the light flash on her shoulders as she shrugged away some shadow from her mind perhaps the small care she had given about him. But no matter how cold-hearted she might be, how thoroughly in tune with this hard, bright world of New York, she at least was generous and had courage. Who could tell how much she risked by giving him that warning? Ronicky went back to his place at the table, still laughing in apparent enjoyment of the jest he had just heard. He saw McKeever's ferret-like glance of interrogation and distrust, a thief's distrust of an honest man. But Ronicky's good nature did not falter in outward seeming for an instant. He swept up his hand, bet a hundred, with apparently foolish recklessness, on three sevens, and then had to buy fresh chips from McKeever. The coming of the girl seemed to have completely upset his equilibrium as a gambler. Certainly it made him bet with the recklessness of a madman. And Frederick Fernand, glancing in from time to time, watched the demolition of Ronicky's pile of chips, with growing complacence. Ronicky Doone had allowed himself to take heed of the room about him, and Frederick Fernan liked him for it. His beautiful rooms were pearls cast before swine, so far as most of his visitors were concerned. A moment later Ronicky had risen, went toward the wall, and drew a dagger from its sheath. It was a full twelve inches in length, that blade, and it came to a point drawn out thinner than the eye could follow. The end was merely a long glint of light. As for Ronicky Doone, he cried out in surprise, and then sat down, balancing the weapon in his hand and looking down at it, with the silent happiness of a child with a satisfying toy. Frederick Fernand was observing him. There was something remarkably likable in young Doone, he decided. No matter what John Mark said, no matter if John Mark was a genius in reading the characters of men, every genius could make a mistake. This, no doubt, was one of John Mark's mistakes. There was the free and careless thoughtlessness of a boy about this young fellow, and though he glanced down the glimmering blade of the weapon with a sort of sinister joy, Frederick Fernand did not greatly care. There was more to admire in the workmanship of the hilt than in a thousand such blades, but a westerner, would have his eye on the useful part of the thing. "'How much do you think that's worth?' asked McKeever. "'Dunno,' said Ronicky. "'That's good steel.' He tried the point, then snapped it under his thumbnail, and a little shiver of a ringing sound reached as far as Frederick Fernand. Then he saw Ronicky suddenly lean a little across the table, pointing toward the hand in which McKeever held the pack, ready for the deal. McKeever shook his head and gripped the pack more closely. "'Do you suspect me of crooked work?' asked McKeever. He pushed back his chair. Fernand, studying his lieutenant in this crisis, approved of him thoroughly. He himself was in a quandary. Westerners fight, and a fight would be most embarrassing. "'Do you think?' began McKeever. "'I think you'll keep that hand and that same pack of cards on the table till I've looked it over,' said Ronicky Doone. "'I've dropped a cold thousand to you.' and you're winning it with stacked decks, McKeever. There was a stifled oath from McKeever as he jerked his hand back. Frederick Fernand was beginning to draw one breath of joy at the thought that McKeever would escape without having that pack, of all packs, examined when the long dagger flashed in the hand of Ronicky Doone. It struck as a cat strikes when it hooks the fish out of the stream. He struck as the snapper on the end of a whiplash doubles back and well and truly did the steel uphold its fame. The dull, chopping sound of the blow stood by itself for an instant. Then McKeever, looking down in horror at his hand, screamed and fell back in his chair. That was the instant when Frederick Fernand judged his lieutenant and found him wanting. 
A man who fainted in such a crisis as this was beyond the pale. Other people crowded past him. Frightened, desperate, he pushed on. At length his weight enabled him to squeeze through the rapidly gathering crowd of gamblers. The only nonchalant man of the lot was he who had actually used the weapon. Veronica Doone stood with his shoulders propped against the wall, his hands clasped lightly behind him. For all that, it was plain that he was not unarmed. A certain calm insolence about his expression told Frederick Fernand that the teeth of the dragon were not drawn. "'Gents,' he was saying in a mild voice, while his eyes ran restlessly from face to face, "'I sure do hate to bust up a nice little party like this one has been, but I figure them cards are stacked.' I got a pile of reasons for knowin', and I want somebody to look over them cards. Somebody that knows stacked cards when he sees em. Mostly it ain't hard to get on to the order of them being run up. I'll leave it, gents, to the man who runs the dump. And leaning across the table, he pushed the pack straight to Frederick Fernand. The latter set his teeth. It was very cunningly done to trap him. If he said the cards were straight, they might be examined afterward, and, if he were discovered in a lie, it would mean more than the loss of McKeever. It would mean the ruin of everything. Did he dare take the chance? Must he give up McKeever? The work of years of careful education had been squandered on McKeever. Fernand looked up, and his eyes rested on the calm face of Ronicky Doone. Why had he never met a man like that before? There was an assistant. There was a fellow with steel-cold nerve, worth a thousand trained McKeevers. Then he glanced at the wounded man, cowering and hunched in his chair. At that moment the gambler made up his mind to play the game in the big way and pocket his losses. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he said sadly, placing the cards back on the edge of the table, "'I'm sorry to say that Mr. Doone is right. The pack has been run up. There it is for any of you to examine it. I don't pretend to understand.' Most of you know that McKeever has been with me for years. Needless to say, he will be with me no more. And, turning on his heel, the old fellow walked slowly away, his hands clasped behind him, his head bowed. And the crowd poured after him to shake his hand and tell him of their unshakable confidence in his honesty. McKeever was ruined, but the house of Frederick Fernand was more firmly established than ever after the trial of the night. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 Trapped Get the money, said Ronicky to Jerry Smith. There it is. He pointed to the drawer where McKeever, as banker, had kept the money. The wounded man in the meantime had disappeared. How much is ours? asked Jerry Smith. All you find there, answered Ronicky, calmly. But there's a big bunch, large bills, too. McKeever was loaded for bear. He loses, the house loses it. Out in my country, Jerry, that wouldn't be half of what the house would lose, for a little trick like what's been played on us tonight. Not the half of what the house would lose, I tell you. He had us trimmed, Jerry, and out west we'd wreck this joint from head to heels. The diffident Jerry fingered the money in the drawer of the table uncertainly. Ronicky Doone swept it up and thrust it into his pocket. We'll split straws later, said Ronicky. Main thing we need right about now is action. This coin will start us. In the hall, as they took their hats, they found big Frederick Fernand in the act of dissuading several of his clients from leaving. The incident of the evening was regrettable, most regrettable, but such things would happen when wild men appeared. Besides, the fault had been that of McKeever. He assured them that McKeever would never again be employed in his house and Fernand meant it. He had discarded all care for the wounded man. Ronicky Doone stepped to him and drew him aside. Mr. Fernand, he said, I've got to have a couple of words with you. Come into my private room, said Fernand, eager to get the fighter out of view of the rest of the little crowd. He drew Ronicky and Jerry Smith into a small apartment which opened off the hall. It was furnished with an almost feminine delicacy of style, with wide-seated spindle-legged Louis XV chairs, and a couch covered with rich brocade. The desk was a work of boule. A small tapestry of goblins made a ragged glow of color on the wall. Frederick Fernand had recreated an atmosphere two hundred years old. 
he seated them at once. "'And now, sir,' he said sternly to Ronicky Doone, "'you are aware that I could have you placed in the hands of the police for what you've done tonight.' Ronicky Doone made no answer. His only retort was a gradually spreading smile. "'Partner,' he said at length, while Fernand was flushing with anger at this nonchalance on the part of the Westerner, "'they might have grabbed me, but they would have grabbed your house first. "'That fact,' said Fernand hotly, "'is the reason you have decided to act like a wild man in my place? "'Mr. Doone, this is your last visit.' "'It sure is,' said Ronicky heartily. "'Do you know what would have happened to you out in my neck of the woods "'if there had been a game like the one tonight? "'I wouldn't have waited to be polite, "'but just pulled a gat and started smashing things for luck.' "'The incident is closed,' Fernand said with gravity, "'and he leaned forward as if to rise. "'Not by a long sight,' said Ronicky Doone. "'I got an idea, partner, that you worked the whole deal. "'This is a square house, Fernand. "'Why was I picked out for the dirty work?' It required all of Fernand's long habits of self-control to keep him from gasping. He managed to look Ronicky Doone fairly in the eyes. What did the youngster know? What had he guessed? Suppose I get down to cases and name names. The gent that talked to you about me was John Mark. Am I right? asked Ronicky. Sir, said Fernand, thinking that the world was tumbling about his ears. What infernal— I'm right, said Ronicky. I can tell when I've hurt a gent by the way his face wrinkles up. I sure hurt you that time, Fernand. John Mark it was, eh? Fernand could merely stare. He began to have vague fears that this young devil might have hypnotic powers, or be in touch with he knew not what unearthly source of information. Out with it, said Ronicky, leaving his chair. Frederick Fernand bit his lip in thought. He was by no means a coward, and two alternatives presented themselves to him. One was to say nothing, and pretend absolute ignorance. The other was to drop his hand into his coat pocket and fire the little automatic which nestled there. "'Listen,' said Ronicky Doone, "'suppose I was to go a little further still in my guesses. "'Suppose I said I figured out that John Mark "'and his men might be scattered around the outside of this house, "'waiting for me and Smith to come out. "'What would you say to that?' "'Nothing,' said Fernand, but he blinked as he spoke. "'For a feat of imagination as great as that, "'I have only a silent admiration. "'But if you have some insane idea that John Mark—' a gentleman I know and respect greatly, is lurking like an assassin outside the doors of my house. Or maybe inside him, said Ronicky, unabashed by this gravity. If you think that, went on the gambler heavily, I can only keep silence. But, to ease your mind, I'll show you a simple way out of the house, a perfectly safe way which you cannot doubt will lead you out unharmed. Does that bring you what you want? It sure does, said Ronicky. Lead the way, Captain, and you'll find us right at your heels. He fell in beside Jerry Smith, while the fat man led on as their guide. What does he mean by safe exit? asked Jerry Smith. You'd think we were in a smuggler's cave. Worse, said Ronicky. A pile worse, son. And they'll have to have some tunnels or something for getaways. This ain't a lawful house, Jerry. As they talked, they were being led down toward the cellar. They paused at last in a cool, big room, paved with cement, and the unmistakable scent of the underground was in the air. "'Here we are,' said the fat man, and so saying turned a switch which illuminated the room completely, and then drew aside a curtain which opened into a black cavity. Ronicky Doone approached and peered into it. "'How does it look to you, Jerry?' he asked. "'Dark, but good enough for me, if you're all set on leaving by some funny way.' "'I don't care how it looks,' said Ronicky thoughtfully. "'By the looks you can't make out nothing most of the time, nothing important. "'But they's ways of smellin' things, and the smell of this here tunnel ain't too good to me. "'Look again, and try to pry down the tunnel with your flashlight, Jerry.' Accordingly Jerry raised his little pocket electric torch, and held it above his head. They saw a tunnel opening with raw dirt walls, and a floor, and a rude framing of heavy timbers to support the roof but it turned an angle and went out of view in a very few paces. "'Go down there with your lantern and look for an exit,' said Ronicky Doone. "'I'll stay back here and see that we get our farewell all fixed up.' The damp cellar air seemed to affect the throat of the fat man, and he coughed heavily. 
"'Say, Ronicky,' said Jerry Smith, "'looks to me that they're carrying this pretty far. Let's take a chance on what we've got ahead of us.' The fat man was chuckling. "'You show a touching trust in me, Mr. Doone.' Ronicky turned on him with an ugly sneer. "'I don't like you, Fernand,' he said. "'There's nothing about you that looks good to me. If I knew half as much as I guess about you, I'd blow your head off and go out without even thinking about you again. But I don't know. Here you've got me up against it. We're going to go down that tunnel, but if it's blind, Fernand, and you trap us from this end, it will be the worst day of your life. Take this passage, Dune, or turn around and come back with me, and I'll show you some other ways of getting out. Ways that lie under the open sky, Dune. Would you like that better? Do you want Starlight and John Mark? or a little stretch of darkness all by yourself, asked Fernand. Ronicky Doone studied the face of Fernand, almost wistfully. The more he knew about the fellow, the more thoroughly convinced he was that Fernand was bad in all possible ways. He might be telling the truth now, however. Again, he might be simply tempting him on to a danger. There was only one way to decide. Ronicky, a gambler himself, mentally flipped a coin, and nodded to Jerry. "'We'll go in,' he said. "'But, man, man, how my old scars are pricking!' They walked into the moldy, damp air of the tunnel, reached the corner, and there the passage turned, and ended in a blank wall of raw dirt, with a little apron of fallen debris at the bottom of it. Ronicky Doone walked first, and when he saw the passage obstructed in this manner, he whirled like a flash and fired at the mouth of the tunnel. A snarl and a curse told him that he had at least come close to his target, but he was too late. A great door was sliding rapidly across the width of the tunnel, and before he could fire a second time the tunnel was closed. Jerry Smith was temporarily mad. He ran at the door, which had just closed, and struck the whole weight of his body against it. There was not so much as a quiver. The face of it was smooth steel, and there was probably a dense thickness of stonework on the other side, to match the cellar walls of the house. "'It was my fool fault,' exclaimed Jerry, turning to his friend. "'My fault, Ronicky. Oh, what a fool I am!' "'I should have known by the feel of the scars,' said Ronicky. "'Put out that flashlight, Jerry. We may need it after a while, and the batteries won't last forever.' He sat down as he spoke, cross-legged, and the last thing Jerry saw as he snapped out the light was the lean, intense face and the blazing eyes of Ronicky Doone. Decidedly this was not a fellow to trifle with. If he trembled for himself and Ronicky, he could also spare a shudder for what would happen to Frederick Fernand if Ronicky got away. In the meantime, the light went out, and the darkness sat heavy beside and about them, with that faint succession of inaudible breathing sounds which are sensed rather than actually heard. "'Is there anything we can do?' asked Jerry suddenly. "'It's all right to sit down and argue and worry, but isn't it foolish, Ronicky?' "'How come?' "'I mean it in this way. Sometimes when you can't solve a problem it's easy to prove that it can't be solved by anyone. That's what I can prove now, but why waste time?' "'Have we got anything special to do with our time?' asked Ronicky dryly. "'Well, my proof is easy. Here we are in hard-pan dirt, without any sort of tool for digging. So we sure can't tunnel out from the sides, can we? Looks most like we can't, said Ronicky, sadly. And the only ways that are left are at the ends. That's right. But one end is the unfinished part of the tunnel, and if you think we can do anything to the steel door... Hush up, said Ronicky. Besides, there ain't any use in talking in a whisper, either. No, it sure don't look like we could do much to that door. Besides, even if we could, I don't think I'd go. I'd rather take a chance against starvation than another trip to Fat Fernand's place. If I ever enter it again, son, you lay to it that he'll get me bumped off mighty pronto. Jerry Smith, after a groan, returned to his argument. But that ties us up, Ronicky. The door won't work, and it's worse than solid rock. And we can't tunnel out from the side without so much as a pin to help us dig. Can we? I think that just settles things, Ronicky. We can't get out. Suppose we had some dynamite, said Ronicky cheerily. Sure, but we haven't. Suppose we find some. Jerry Smith groaned. Are you trying to make a joke out of this? Besides, could we send off a blast of dynamite in a closed tunnel like this? We could try, said Ronicky. 
way I'm figuring is to show you it's bad medicine to sit down and figure out how you're beat. Even if you owe a pile of money, they some satisfaction in sitting back and adding up the figures so that they come out about a million dollars on top, in your dreams. Before we can get out of here, we got to begin to feel powerful sure. But you take it straight, friend. Fernand ain't going to leave us in here. Nope, he's going to find a way to get us out. That's easy to figure out. But the way he'll get us out will be as dead ones, and then he can dump us, when he feels like it, in the river. Ain't that the simplest way of working it out? The teeth of Jerry Smith came together with a snap. Then the thing for us to do is get set and wait for them to make an attack. No use waiting. When they attack, it'll be in a way that'll give us no chance. Then you figure the same as me. We're lost. Unless we can get out before they make the attack. In other words, Jerry, there may be something behind the dirt wall at the end of the tunnel. Nonsense, Ronicky. There's got to be, said Ronicky soberly, because if there ain't, you and me are dead ones, Jerry. Come along and help me look anyway. Jerry rose obediently and flashed on his precious pocket torch, and they went down to pass the turn and come again to the ragged wall of earth which terminated the passage. Jerry held the torch and passed it close to the dirt. All was solid. There was no sign of anything wrong. The very pick marks were clearly defined. Hold on, whispered Ronicky. Hold on, Jerry, I seen something. He snatched the electric torch, and together they peered at the patch from which the dried earth had fallen. Queer for deadpan to break up like that, muttered Ronicky, cutting into the surface beneath the patch with the point of his hunting knife. Instantly there was a sharp gritting of steel against steel. The shout of Ronicky was an indrawn breath. The shout of Jerry was a moan of relief. Ronicky continued his observations. The thing was very clear. They had dug the tunnel to this point, and excavated the place which they had guarded with a steel door, but, in order to conceal the hiding place, or whatever it might be, they cunningly worked a false wall of dirt against the face of it, using clay and a thin coating of plaster as a base. "'It's a place they don't use very often, maybe,' said Ronicky, "'and that's why they can afford to put up this fake wall of plaster and mud after every time they want to come down here.' Pretty clever to leave the little pile of dirt on the floor, just like it had been worked off by the picks, eh? But we've found em, Jerry, and now all we gotta do is get to the door and into whatever lies beyond. We'd better hurry, then, cried Jerry. How come? Take a breath. Ronicky obeyed. The air was beginning to fill with a pungent and unmistakable odor of burning wood. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 The Miracle No great intelligence was needed to understand the meaning of it. Fernand, having trapped his game, was now about to kill it. He could suffocate the two with smoke, blown into the tunnel, and make them rush blindly out. The moment they appeared, dazed and uncertain, revolvers of half a dozen gunmen would be emptied into them. "'It's like taking a trap full of rats,' said Ronicky, bitterly and shaking them into a pail of water. Let's go back and see what we can. They had only to turn the corner of the tunnel to be sure. Fernand had had the door of the tunnel slid noiselessly open, then into the tunnel itself, smoking, slowly burning, pungent pieces of pine wood had been thrown, having been first soaked with oil, perhaps. The tunnel was rapidly filling with smoke, and through the white drifts of it they looked into the lighted cellar beyond. They would run out at last, gasping for breath and blinded by the smoke, to be shot down in perfect light. So much was clear. Now back to the wall, and try and find the door, said Ronicky. Jerry had already turned. In a moment they were back, and tearing with their fingers at the sham wall, kicking loose fragments with their feet. All the time, while they cleared a larger and larger space, they searched feverishly with the electric torch for some sign of a knob which would indicate a door, or some button or spring that might be used to open it. But there was nothing, and in the meantime the smoke was drifting back, in more and more unbearable clouds. "'I can't take much more,' declared Jerry at length. "'Keep low. The best air is there,' answered Ronicky. A voice called from the mouth of the tunnel, and they could recognize the smooth tongue of Frederick Fernand. "'Dune!' 
I think I have you now. But trust yourselves to me, and all may still be well with you. Throw out your weapons, and walk out yourselves, with your hands above your heads, and you may have a second chance. I don't promise. I simply offer you a hope, in place of no hope at all. Is that a good bargain? I'll see you hung first, answered Ronicky, and turned again to his work at the wall. But it seemed a quite hopeless task. The surface of the steel was still covered, after they had cleared as much as they could, with a thin, clinging coat of plaster which might well conceal a button or a device for opening the door. Every moment the task became infinitely harder. Finally, Jerry, his lungs nearly empty of oxygen, cast himself to the floor and gasped. A horrible gagging sound betrayed his efforts to breathe. Ronicky knelt beside him, his own lungs burning, and his head was thick and dizzy. One more try, then we'll run and rush them and die fighting, Jerry. The other nodded and started to his feet. Together they made that last effort, fumbling with their hands across the surface, and suddenly, had they touched the spring indeed? A section of the surface before them swayed slowly in. Ronicky caught the half-senseless body of Jerry Smith and thrust him inside. He staggered after, and before him stood Ruth Tolliver. While they lay panting on the floor, she closed the door through which they had come, and then stood and silently watched them. Presently Smith sat up, and Ronicky Doone staggered to his feet, his head clearing rapidly. He found himself in a small room, not more than eight feet square, with a ceiling so low that he could barely stand erect. As for the furnishings, and the arrangement, it was more like the inside of a safe than anything else. There were, to be sure, three little stools, but nothing else one would expect to find in an apartment. For the rest was nothing but a series of steel drawers and strong chests, lining the walls of the room and leaving in the center very little room in which one might move about. He had only a moment to see all of this. Ruth Tolliver, hooded in a dark evening cloak, but with the light gleaming in her coppery hair, was shaking him by the arm, and leaning a white face close to him. Hurry, she was saying, there isn't a minute to lose. You must start now, at once. They will find out. They will guess, and then... John Mark? he asked. Yes, she exclaimed, realizing that she had said too much, and she pressed her hand over her mouth, looking at Ronicky Doone in a sort of horror. Jerry Smith had come to his feet at last, but he remained in the background, staring with a befuddled mind at the lovely vision of the girl. Fear and excitement and pleasure had transformed her face, but she seemed trembling in an agony of desire to be gone. She seemed invincibly drawn to remain there longer still. Ronicky Doone stared at her, with a strange blending of pity and admiration. He knew that the danger was not over by any means, but he began to forget that. "'This way,' called the girl, and led toward an opposite door, very low in the wall. "'Lady,' said Ronicky gently, "'will you hold on one minute? "'They won't start to go through the smoke for a while. "'They'll think they've choked us when we don't come out on the rush, shooting. "'But they'll wait quite a time to make sure. "'They don't like my style so well that they'll hurry me.' "'He smiled sourly at the thought. "'And we got time to learn a lot of things that we'll never find out unless we know right now, pronto. He stepped before the girl as he spoke. How come you knew we were in there? How come you to get down here? How come you risk everything you got to let us out through that treasure room of Mark's gang? He had guessed as shrewdly as he could, and he saw, by her immediate wincing, that the shot had told. You strange, mad, wild westerner, she exclaimed. Do you mean to tell me you want to stay here and talk? Even if you have a moment to spare, you must use it. If you knew the men with whom you are dealing, you would never dream of— In her pause, he said, smiling, Lady, it's tolerable clear that you don't know me. But the way I figure it is this. A gent may die any time, but when he finds a minute for a good living, he'd better make the most of it. He knew by her eyes that she had guessed his meaning, but she wished to be certain. What do you intend by that? she asked. It's tolerable simple, said Ronicky. I've seen square things done in my life, but I've never yet seen a girl throw all she had to a good turn for a gent she's seen only once. You follow me, lady? I pretty near guess the trouble you're running into. You guess what? she asked. 
I guess that you're one of John Mark's best cards. You're his chief gambler, lady, and he uses you on the big game. She had drawn back, one hand pressed against her breast, her mouth tight with the pain. You have guessed all about me? she asked faintly. That means you despise me. What folks do don't matter so much, said Ronicky. It's the reason they have for doing the thing that matters, I figure, and the way they do it. I don't know how John Mark hypnotized you and made a tool out of you, but I know that you ain't changed by what you've done. Ronicky Doone stepped to her quickly and took both her hands. He was not, ordinarily, particularly forward with girls. Now he acted as gracefully as if he had been the father of Ruth Tolliver. Lady, he said, you saved two lives tonight. That's a tolerable lot to have piled up to anybody's credit. Besides, inside you're snow white. We've got to go, but I'm coming back. Will you let me come back? Never, never, declared Ruth Tolliver. You must never see me. You must never see Carolyn Smith again. Any step you take in that direction is under peril of your life. Leave New York, Ronicky Doone. Leave it as quickly as you may, and never come back. Only pray that his arm isn't long enough to follow you. Leave, Carolyn? he asked. I'll tell you what you're going to do, Ruth. When you get back home you're going to tell Carolyn that Jerry here has seen the light about Mark, and that he has money enough to pay back what he owes. But I haven't, Jerry broke in. I have it, said Ronicky, and that's the same thing. I'll take no charity, declared Jerry Smith. You'll do what I tell you, said Ronicky Doone. You've been bothering enough, son. Go tell Carolyn what I've said, he went on to the girl. Let her know that they's no claim on anybody, and if she wants to find Bill Gregg, all she's got to do is go across the street. You understand? But even if I tell her, how could she go, Ronicky Doone? when she's watched. If she can't make a start and get to a man that loves her and is waiting for her right across the street, she ain't worth worrying about, said Ronicky, sternly. Do we go this way? She hurried before them. You've waited too long. You've waited too long, she kept whispering in her terror as she led them through the door, paused to turn out the light behind her, and then conducted them down a passage like that on the other side of the treasure chamber. It was all deadly black and deadly silent, but the rustle of the girl's dress as she hurried before them was their guide, and always her whisper came back, Hurry! Hurry! I fear it is too late. Suddenly they were climbing up a narrow flight of steps. They stood under the starlight in the back yard, with houses about them on all sides. Go down that alley, and you will be on the street, said the girl. Down that alley, and then hurry, run, find the first taxi. Will you do that? We'll sure go, and we'll wait for Carolyn Smith, and you too. Don't talk madness. Why will you stay? You risk everything for yourselves and for me. Jerry Smith was already tugging at Ronicky's arm to draw him away, but the Westerner was stubbornly pressing back to the girl. He had her hand and would not leave it. If you don't show up, lady, he said, I'll come to find you. You hear? No, no, I swear. Bless you, but never venture near again. But, oh, Ronicky Doone, I wish ten other men in the whole world could be half so generous and wild as you. Suddenly her hand was slipped from his, and she was gone into the shadows. Down the alley went Jerry Smith, but he returned in an agony of dread to find that Ronicky Doone was still running here and there, in a blind confusion, probing the shadowy corners of the yard in search of the girl. "'Come off, you wild man,' said Jerry. "'They'll be on our heels any minute. They may be waiting for us now, down the alley. Come off, idiot! Quick!' "'If I thought there was a chance of finding her, I'd stay,' declared Ronicky Doone, shaking his head bitterly. Whether you and me live don't count beside a girl like that. Getting soot on one tip of her finger might mean more in whether you or me die. Maybe, maybe, said the other, but answer that tomorrow. Right now, let's start to make sure of ourselves, and we can come back and find her later. Ronicky Doone, submitting partly to the force and partly to the persuasion of his friend, turned reluctantly and followed him down the alley. End of chapter 21
Chapter Twenty Two. Mark makes a move. Passing hurriedly out of the cloak room a little later, Ruth met Simons, the lieutenant of Frederick Fernand, in the passage. He was a rat-faced little man with a furtive smile, not an unpleasant smile. But it was continually coming and going, as if he wished earnestly to win the favor of the men before him, but greatly doubted his ability to do so. Ruth Tolliver, knowing his genius for cards, knowing his cold and unscrupulous soul, detested him heartily. When she saw his eyes flicker up and down the hall, she hesitated. Obviously, he wished to speak to her, and obviously, he did not wish to be seen in the act. As she paused, he stepped to her. His face suddenly set with determination. Watch John Mark, he whispered. Don't trust him. He suspects everything. What? Everything about what? she asked. Simons gazed at her for a moment with a singular expression. There were conjoined cynicism, admiration, doubt, and fear in his glance. But instead of speaking again, he bowed and slipped away into the open hall. She heard him call, and she heard Fernand's oily voice make answer, and at that she shivered. What had Simons guessed? How, under heaven, did he know where she had gone when she left the gaming house? Or did he know? Had he not merely guessed? Perhaps he had been set on by Fernand and Mark to entangle and confuse her. There remained, out of all this confusion of guesswork, a grim feeling that Simons did indeed know, and that, for the first time in his life, perhaps, he was doing an unbought, a purely generous thing. She remembered now how often Simons had followed her with his eyes, how often his face had lighted when she spoke even casually to him. Yes, there might be a reason for Simons' generosity, but it implied that he knew fairly well what John Mark himself half guessed. The thought that she was under the suspicion of Mark himself was terrible to her. She drew a long breath and advanced courageously into the gaming rooms. The first thing she saw was Fernand hurrying a latecomer toward the tables, laughing and chatting as he went. She shuddered at the sight of him. It was strange that he, who had a moment before, in the cellar of that house been working to bring about the death of two men, should now be immaculate, self-possessed. A step farther and she saw John Mark sitting at a console table with his back to the room and a cup of tea before him. That was, in fact, his favorite drink at all hours of the day or night. To see Fernand was bad enough, but to see the mastermind of all the evil that passed around her was too much. The girl inwardly thanked heaven that his back was turned and started to pass him as softly as possible. "'Just a minute, Ruth,' he called, as she was almost at the door of the room." For a moment there was a frantic impulse in her to bolt like a foolish child afraid of the dark. In the next apartment there was light and warmth and eager faces and smiles and laughter, and here, behind her, was the very spirit of darkness calling her back. After an imperceptible hesitation she turned. Mark had not turned in his chair, but it was easy to discover how he had known of her passing. A small oval mirror, fixed against the wall before him, had shown her image. How much had it betrayed, she wondered, of her guilty, stealthy pace? She went to him and found that he was leisurely and openly examining her in the glass as she approached, his chin resting on one hand, his thin face perfectly calm, his eyes hazy with content. It was a habit of his to regard her like a picture, but she had never become used to it. She was always disconcerted by it, as she was at this moment. He rose, of course, when she was beside him, and asked her to sit down. "'But I've hardly touched a card,' she said. "'This isn't very professional, you know, wasting a whole evening.' She was astonished to see him flush to the roots of his hair. His voice shook. "'Sit down, please.' She obeyed, positively inert with surprise. "'Do you think I keep you at this detestable business because I want the money?' he asked. "'Dear heaven! Ruth, is that what you think of me?' Fortunately, before she could answer, he went on. "'No, no, no. I have wanted to make you a free and independent being, my dear, and that is why I have put you through the most dangerous and exacting school in the world. You understand?' 
I think I do, she replied falteringly. But not entirely. Let me pour you some tea. No? He sighed as he blew forth the smoke of a cigarette. But you don't understand entirely, he continued, and you must. Go back to the old days, when you knew nothing about the world but me. Can you remember? Yes, yes. Then you certainly recall a time when, if I had simply given directions, you would have been mine, Ruth. I could have married you the moment you became a woman. Is that true? Yes, she whispered. That is perfectly true. The coldness that passed over her taught her for the first time how truly she dreaded that marriage, which had been postponed, but which inevitably hung over her head. But I didn't want such a wife, continued John Mark. You would have been an undeveloped child, really. You would never have grown up. No matter what they say, something about a woman is cut off at the root when she marries. Certainly, if she had not been free before, she is a slave if she marries a man with a strong will. And I have a strong will, Ruth, very strong. Very strong, John, she whispered again. He smiled faintly, as if there were less than what he wanted in the second use of the name. He went on, You see, I have faced a problem. I must and would marry you. There was never any other woman born who was meant for me. So much so good. But if I married you before you were wise enough to know me, you would have become a slave, shrinking from me, yielding to me, incapable of loving me. No, I wanted a free and independent creature as a wife. I wanted a partnership, you see. Put you into the world, then, and let you see men and women? No, I could not do that in the ordinary way. I have had to show you the hard and bad side of life because I am, in many ways, a hard and bad man myself. He said it almost literally through his teeth. His face was fierce, defying her. His eyes were wistful, entreating her not to agree with him. Such a sudden rush of pity for the man swept over her that she put out her hand and pressed his. He looked down at her hand for a moment, and she felt his fingers trembling under that gentle pressure. I understand more now, she said slowly, than I have ever understood before. But I'll never understand entirely. A thing that's understood entirely is despised, he said, with a careless sweep of his hand. A thing that is understood is not feared. I wish to be feared, not to make people cower, but to make them know when I come and when I go. Even love is nothing without a seasoning of fear. For instance, he flushed as the torrent of his speech swept him into a committal of himself. I'm afraid of you, dear girl. Do you know what I have done with the money you have won? Tell me, she said curiously, and at the same time she glanced in wonder as a servant passed softly across the little room. Was it not stranger than words could tell that such a man as John Mark should be sitting in this almost public place, and pouring his soul out into the ears of a girl? "'I shall tell you,' said Mark, his voice softening. "'I have contributed half of it to charity.' Her lips, compressed with doubt, parted in wonder. "'Charity?' she exclaimed. "'The other half,' he went on, "'I deposited in a bank to the credit of a fictitious personality.' That fictitious personality is, in flesh and blood, Ruth Tolliver, with a new name. You understand? I have only to hand you the bank book, with the list of deposits, and you can step out of this Tolliver personality and appear in a new part of the world as another being. Do you see what it means? If, at the last, you find you cannot marry me, my dear, you are provided for, not out of my charity, which would be bitter to you, but out of your own earnings and lest you should be horrified by the thought of living on your earnings at the gaming table, I have thrown bread on the waters, dear Ruth. For every dollar you have in the bank, you have given another to charity, and both, I hope, have borne interest for you. His smile faded a little, as she murmured, with her glance going past him, Then I am free? Free, John? Whenever you wish. Not that I shall ever wish— but to know that I am not chained, that is a wonderful thing. She looked directly at him again. I never dreamed there was such fineness in you, John Mark. I never dreamed it, but I should have. Now I have been winning Carolyn to the game, he went on, and she is beginning to love it. 
in another year or six months, trust me to have completely filled her with the fever. But now enters the mischief-maker in the piece, a stranger, an ignorant outsider. This incredible man arrives, and in a few days, having miraculously run Carolyn to earth, goes on and brings Carolyn face to face with her lover, teaches Jerry Smith that I am his worst enemy, gets enough money to pay off his debt to me, and convinces him I can never use my knowledge of his crime to jail him, because I don't dare bring the police too close to my own rather explosive record. "'I saw them both here,' said the girl. She wondered how much he had guessed, and she saw his keen eyes probe her with a glance. But her ingenuousness, if it did not disarm him, at least dulled the edge of his suspicions. He was here, and the trap was laid here, and he slipped through it got through a certain room which Fernand would give a million to keep secret. At any rate, the fellow has shown that he is slippery, and has a sting, too. He sent a bullet a fraction of an inch past Fernand's head, at one point in this little story. In short, the price is too high. What I want is to secure Carolyn Smith from the inside. I want you to go to her, to persuade her to go with you on a trip, take her to the Bermudas, or to Havana, any place you please. The moment the Westerner thinks the lady is running away from him, of her own volition, he'll throw up his hands and curse his luck and go home. They have a sort of pride on the other side of the Rockies. Will you go back tonight, right now, and persuade Carolyn to go with you? She bowed her head under the shock of it. Ronicky Doone had begged her to send Carolyn Smith to meet her lover. Now the counterattack followed. Do you think she'd listen? Yes. Tell her that the one thing that will save the head of Bill Gregg is for her to go away. Otherwise, I'll wipe the fool off the map. Better still, tell her that Gregg of his own free will has left New York and given up the chase. Tell her you wanted to console her with a trip. She'll be sad, and glad, and flattered, all at the same moment, and go along with you without a word. Will you try, Ruth? I suppose you would have Bill Gregg removed, if he continued a nuisance. Not a shadow of a doubt. Will you do your best? She rose. Yes, said the girl. Then she managed to smile at him. Of course I'll do my best. I'll go back right now. He took her arm to the door of the room. Thank heaven, he said, that I have one person in whom I can trust without question, one who needs no bribing or rewards, but works to please me. "'Good-bye, my dear.' He watched her down the hall, and then turned, and went through room after room to the rear of the house. There he rapped on a door, in a peculiar manner. It was opened at once, and Harry Morgan appeared before him. "'A rush job, Harry,' he said. "'A little shadowing.' Harry jerked his cap lower over his eyes. "'Give me the smell of the trail. I'm ready,' he said. "'Ruth Tolliver has just left this house.' follow her. She'll probably go home. She'll probably talk with Carolyn Smith. Find a way of listening. If you hear anything that seems wrong to you, anything about Carolyn leaving the house alone, for instance, telephone me at once. Now go and work, as you have never worked for me before. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 Carolyn Takes Command Ruth left the gaming-house of Frederick Fernand, entirely convinced that she must do as John Mark had told her, work for him as she had never worked before. The determination made her go home to Beekman Place as fast as a taxicab would whirl her along. It was not until she climbed to Carolyn Smith's room and opened the door that her determination faltered, for there she saw the girl lying on her bed weeping and it seemed to the poor, bewildered brain of Ruth Tolliver, as if the form of Ronicky Doone, passionate and eager as before, stood at her side and begged her again to send Carolyn across the street to a lifelong happiness, and she could do it. Though Mark had ordered the girl to be confined to her room until further commands were given on the subject, no one in the house would think of questioning Ruth Tolliver if she took the girl downstairs to the street and told her to go on her way. She closed the door softly, and, going to the bed, touched the shoulder of Carolyn. 
The poor girl sat up slowly and turned a stained and swollen face to Ruth. If there was much to be pitied there, there was something to be laughed at also. Ruth could not forbear smiling. But Caroline was clutching at her hands. "'He's changed his mind?' she asked eagerly. "'He sent you to tell me that he's changed his mind, Ruth? "'Oh, you've persuaded him to it? Like an angel? I know you have.' Ruth Tolliver freed herself from the reaching hands, moistened the ends of a towel in the bathroom, and began to remove the traces of tears from the face of Caroline Smith. That face was no longer flushed, but growing pale with excitement and hope. "'It's true,' she kept asking. "'It is true, Ruth. Do you love him as much as that?' "'More than I can tell you. So much more. Try to tell me, then, dear.' Talking of her love affair began to brighten the other girl and now she managed a wan smile. His letters were very bad, but between the lines I could read so much real manhood, such simple honesty, such a heart, such a will to trust. Ruth, are you laughing at me? No, no, far from that. It's a thrilling thing to hear, my dear. For she was remembering that in another man there might be found these same qualities. Not so much simplicity, perhaps, but to make up for it, a great fire of will and driving energy. But I didn't actually know that I was in love. Even when I made the trip west and wrote to him to meet the train on my return, even then I was only guessing. When he didn't appear at the station, I went cold and made up my mind that I would never think of him again. But when you saw him in the street, here... John Mark had prepared me and hardened me against that meeting, and I was afraid to even think for myself. But when Ronicky Doone, bless him, talked to me in your room, I knew what Bill Gregg must be, since he had a friend who would venture as much for him as Ronicky Doone did. It came over me in a flash. I did love him. I did indeed. Yes, yes, whispered Ruth Tolliver, nodding and smiling faintly. I remember how he stood there and talked to you. He was like a man on fire. No wonder that spark caught in you, Carolyn. He, he's a very fine-looking fellow, don't you think, Carolyn? Bill Gregg? Yes, indeed. I mean Ronicky. Of course, very handsome. There was something in the voice of Carolyn that made Ruth look down sharply to her face, but the girl was clever enough to mask her excitement and delight. Afterward, when you think over what he has said, it isn't a great deal, but at the moment he seems to know a great deal, about what's going on inside one, don't you think, Carolyn? These continual appeals for advice, appeals from the infallible Ruth Tolliver, set the heart of Carolyn beating. There was most certainly something in the wind. I think he does, agreed Carolyn, masking her eyes. He has a way, when he looks at you, of making you feel that he isn't thinking of anything else in the world but you. Does he have that same effect on everyone? asked Ruth. She added, after a moment of thought, Yes, I suppose it's just a habit of his. I wish I knew. Why? queried Carolyn, unable to refrain from the stinging little question. Oh, for no good reason. Just that he's an odd character. In my work, you know, one has to study character. Ronicky Doone is a different sort of man, don't you think? Very different, dear. Then the great inspiration came to Carolyn. Ruth was the key, which she knew could unlock nearly any door in the house of John Mark. Do you know what we are going to do? she said gravely, rising. Well, we're going to open that door together, and we're going down the stairs. Together. Together? But we... Don't you know John Mark gave orders? that I'm not to leave the room. What difference does that make? They won't dare stop us if you are with me, leading the way. Carolyn, are you mad? When I come back, you're not coming back. Not coming back? No, you're going with me. She took Ruth by the arms and turned her until the light struck into her eyes. Ruth Tolliver, aghast at this sudden strength in one who had always been a meek follower, obeyed without resistance. "'But where?' she demanded. "'Where I'm going.' "'What?' "'To Ronicky Doone, my dear. Don't you see?' The insistence bewildered Ruth Tolliver. She felt herself driven irresistibly forward, with or without her own will. 
Carolyn, she protested, trying feebly to free herself from the commanding hands and eyes of her companion. Are you quite mad? Go to him? Why should I? How can I? Not as I am going to Bill Gregg, with my heart in my hands, but to ask Ronicky Doone, bless him, to take you away somewhere, so that you can begin a new life. Isn't that simple? Ask charity of a stranger? You know he isn't a stranger, and you know it isn't charity. He'll be happy. He's the kind that's happy when he's being of use to others. Yes, answered Ruth Tolliver, of course he is. And you'd trust him? To the end of the world. But to leave? Ruth, you've kept cobwebs before your eyes so long that you don't see what's happening around you. John Mark hypnotizes you. He makes you think that the whole world is bad, that we are simply making capital out of our crimes. As a matter of fact, the cold truth is that he has made me a thief, Ruth, and he has made you something almost as bad, a gambler. The follower had become the leader, and she was urging Ruth Tolliver slowly to the door. Ruth was protesting. She could not throw herself on the kindness of Ronicky Doone. It could not be done. It would be literally throwing herself at his head. But here the door opened, and she allowed herself to be led out into the hall. They had not made more than a half a dozen steps down the dim length when the guard hurried toward them. "'Talk to him,' whispered Carolyn Smith. "'He's come to stop me, and you're the only person who can make him let us pass on.' The guard hurriedly came up to them. "'Sorry,' he said. "'Got an idea you're going downstairs, Miss Smith?' Yes, she said faintly. The fellow grinned. Not yet. You'll stay up here till the chief gives the word, and I got to ask you to step back into your room, and step quick. His voice grew harsh, and he came closer. He told me straight, you're not to come out. Carolyn shrunk back, and she was on the verge of turning when the arm of Ruth Tolliver passed strongly around her shoulders, and stayed her. She's going with me, she told John Mark's bulldog. Does that make a difference to you? He ducked his head and grinned feebly in anxiety. Sure it makes a difference. You go where you want, any time you want. But this, I say she's going with me, and I'm responsible for her. She urged Carolyn forward, and the latter made a step, only to find that she was directly confronted by the guard. I got my orders, he said desperately to Ruth. Do you know who I am? she asked hotly. I know who you are, he answered, and believe me, I would not start bothering you none, but I got to keep this lady back. I got the orders. They're old orders, insisted Ruth Tolliver, and they have been changed. Not to my knowing, replied the other, less certain in his manner. Ruth seized the critical moment to say, Walk on, Carolyn. If he blocks your way... She did not need to finish the sentence, for as Carolyn started, the guard slunk sullenly to one side of the corridor. "'It ain't my doings,' he said. "'But they got two bosses in this joint, and one of them is a girl. How can a gent have any idea which way he ought to step in a pinch? Go on, Miss Smith, but you'll be answered for.' They hardly heard the last of these words, as they turned down the stairway, hurrying, but not fast enough to excite the suspicion of the man behind them. "'Oh, Ruth,' whispered Carolyn. "'Oh, Ruth!' "'It was close,' said Ruth Tolliver. "'But we're through. "'And now that I'm about to leave it, "'I realize how I've hated this life all these years. "'I'll never stop thanking you for waking me up to it, Carolyn.' They reached the floor of the lower hall, and a strange thought came to Ruth. She had hurried home to execute the bidding of John Mark. She had left it, obeying the bidding of Ronicky Doone. They scurried to the front door. As they opened it, a sharp gust of night air blew in on them, and they heard the sound of a man running up the steps. In a moment, the dim hall light showed on the slender form and the pale face of John Mark standing before them. Carolyn felt the start of Ruth Tolliver. For her part, she was on the verge of collapse, but a strong pressure from the hand of her companion told her that she had an ally in the time of need. "'Tut, tut,' Mark was saying. "'What's this? How did Carolyn get out of her room? And with you, Ruth?' 
"'It's idiotic to keep her locked up in there all day and all night, in weather like this,' said Ruth, with a perfect calm that restored Carolyn's courage almost to normal. "'When I talked to her this evening, I made up my mind that I'd take her out for a walk.' "'Well,' replied John Mark, "'that might not be so bad. "'Let's step inside and talk it over for a moment.' They retreated, and he entered, and clicked the door behind him. "'The main question is, where do you intend to walk?' "'Just in the street below the house.' "'Which might not lead you across to the house on the other side?' "'Certainly not. I shall be with her.' "'But suppose both of you go into that house, and I lose two birds instead of one. What of that, my clever Ruth?' She knew at once, by something in his voice rather than his words, that he had managed to learn the tenor of the talk in Carolyn's room. She asked bluntly, "'What are you guessing at?' "'Nothing. I only speak of what I know. No single pair of ears is enough for a busy man. I have to hire help, and I get it. Very effective help, too. Don't you agree?' "'Eavesdropping?' exclaimed Ruth bitterly. "'Well, it's true, John Mark.' You sent me to steal her from her lover, and I've tried to steal her for him in the end. Do you know why? Because she was able to show me what a happy love might mean to a woman. She showed me that, and she showed me how much courage love had given her. So I began to guess a good many things, and among the rest, I came to the conclusion that I could never truly love you, John Mark. I've spoken quickly, she went on at last. It isn't that I have feared you all the time. I haven't been playing a part, John, on my word. Only, tonight I learned something new. Do you see? Heaven be praised, said John Mark, that we all have the power of learning new things now and again. I congratulate you. Am I to suppose that Carolyn was your teacher? He turned from her and faced Carolyn Smith, and though he smiled on her, there was a quality in that smile that shriveled her very soul with fear. No matter what he might say or do this evening, to establish himself in the better graces of the girl he was losing, his malice was not dead. She knew that. She was my teacher, answered Ruth steadily, because she showed me, John, what a marvelous thing it is to be free. You understand that all those years I have been with you I have never been free. Not free? he asked, the very touch of emotion in his voice. Not free, my dear? Was there ever the least wish of yours since you were a child that I did not gratify? Not one, Ruth, not one, surely, of which I am conscious. Because I had no wishes, she answered slowly, that were not suggested by something you liked or disliked. You were the starting point of all that I desired. I was almost afraid to think until I became sure that you approved of my thinking. That was long ago, he said gravely. Since those old days, I see you have changed greatly. Because of the education you gave me, she answered. Yes, yes, that was a great mistake. I begin to see. Heaven, one might say, gave you to me. I felt I must improve on the gift of heaven before I accepted you. There was my fault. For that I must pay the great penalty. Kismet. And now what is it you wish? To leave at once. A little harsh but necessary, if you will it. There is the door, free to you. The change of identity of which I spoke to you is easily arranged. I have only to take you to the bank, and that is settled. Is there anything else? Only one thing, and that is not much. Very good. You have given me so much, she ran on eagerly, that you will give me one more thing, out of the goodness of that really big heart of yours, John, dear. He winced under the pleasantly tender word, and she said, I want to take Carolyn with me, to freedom and the man she loves. That is really all. The lean fingers of John Mark drummed on the back of the chair, while he smiled down on her, an inexplicable expression on his face. Only that, he asked. My dear, how strange you women really are. After all these years of study, I should have thought that you would, at least— have partially comprehended me. I see that is not to be. But try to understand that I divide with a nice distinction the affairs of sentiment and the affairs of business. There is only one element in my world of sentiment. That is you. Therefore, ask what you want and take it for yourself. 
But for Carolyn, that is an entirely different matter. No, Ruth, you may take what you will for yourself. But for her, for any other living soul, not a penny, not a cent will I give. Can you comprehend it? Is it clear? As for giving her freedom, nothing under heaven could persuade me to it. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 THE ULTIMATE SACRIFICE She stared at him as the blow fell, and then her glance turned slowly to Carolyn, who had uttered a sharp cry and sunk into a chair. "'Help me, Ruth,' she implored pitifully. "'No other person in the world can help me but you.' "'Do you see that?' asked Ruth quietly of John Mark. "'And still it doesn't move you?' "'Not a hair-breath, my dear. "'But isn't it absurd?' Suppose I have my freedom, and I tell the police that in this house a girl against her will— Tush, my dear, you really do not know me at all. Do you think they can reach me? She may be a hundred miles away before you have spoken ten words to the authorities. But I warn you that all your holds are broken. She knows that you have no hold over her brother. She knows that Ronicky Doone has broken them all, that Jerry is free of you. Ronicky Doone— said Mark, his face turning gray, is a talented man. No doubt of it, his is a very peculiar and incisive talent, I admit. But though he has broken all the old holds, there are ways of finding new ones. If you leave now, I can promise you, my dear, that before the next day dawns, the very soul of Carolyn will be a pawn in my hands. Do you doubt it? Such an exquisitely tender, such a delicate soul as Carolyn, can you doubt that I can form invisible bonds that will hold her, even when she is a thousand miles away from me? Tush, my dear, think again, and you will think better of my ability. Suppose, said Ruth, I offer to stay. He bowed. You tempt me, with such overwhelming generosity, to become even more generous myself and set her free at once. But— Alas, I am essentially a practical man. If you will stay with me, Ruth, if you will marry me at once, why then, indeed, this girl is as free as the wind. Otherwise, I should be a fool. You see, my dear, I love you so that I must have you by fair means or foul, but I cannot put any chain on you except your own word. I confess it, you see, even before this girl, if she is capable of understanding, which I doubt, but speak again. Do you make the offer? She hesitated, and he went on. Be careful. I have had you once, and I have lost you, it seems. If I have you again, there is no power in you, no power between heaven and earth, to take you from me a second time. Give yourself to me with a word, and I shall make you mine forever. Then Carolyn shall go free, free as the wind, to her lover, my dear, who is waiting." He made no step toward her, and he kept his voice smooth and clear. Had he done otherwise, he knew that she would have shrunk. She looked to him. She looked to Carolyn Smith. The latter had suddenly raised her head and thrown out her hands, with an unutterable appeal in her eyes. At that mute appeal, Ruth Tolliver surrendered. "'It's enough,' she said. "'I think there would be no place for me after all. What could I do in this world except what you've taught me to do?' No, let Carolyn go freely, and I give my— Stop! He checked her with a raised hand, and his eyes blazed and glittered in the dead whiteness of his face. Don't give me your word, my dear. I don't want that chain to bind you. There might come a time when some power arose strong enough to threaten to take you from me. Then I want to show you that I don't need your promise. I can hold you for myself. Only come to me and tell me simply— that you will be mine if you can. Will you do that? She crossed the room slowly and stood before him. I will do that, she said faintly, half closing her eyes. She had come so close to that. If he willed, he could have taken her in his arms. She nerved herself against it. Then she felt her hand taken, raised, and touched lightly against trembling lips. When she stepped back, she knew that the decisive moment of her life had been passed. "'You are free to go,' said John Mark to Carolyn. "'Therefore don't wait. Go at once.' "'Ruth!' 
the girl whispered. Ruth Tolliver turned away, and the movement brought Carolyn beside her with a cry of pain. "'Is it what I think?' she asked. "'Are you making the sacrifice all for me? "'You don't really care for him, Ruth, and—' "'Carolyn,' John Mark broke in. She turned at the command of that familiar voice, as if she had been struck with a whip. He raised the curtain in front of the window beside the door, and was pointing up across the street. "'I see the window of Greg's room,' he said. "'A light has just appeared in it. I suppose he is waiting. But, if you wish to go, your time is short. Very short.' An infinite threat was behind the calmness of the voice. She could only say to Ruth, "'I'll never forget.' Then she fled down the hall and through the door, and the two within heard the sharp patter of her heels as she ran down to the street. It was freedom for Carolyn, and Ruth, lifting her eyes, looked into the face of the man she was to marry. She could have held out, she felt, had it not been for the sound of those departing footsteps, running so blithely toward a lifetime of happiness. Even as it was, she made herself hold out. Then a vague astonishment came to clear her mind. There was no joy in the face of John Mark, only a deep and settled pain. "'You see,' he said, with a smile of anguish, "'I've done it. I have bought the thing I love, and that, you know, is the last and deepest damnation. If another man had told me I was capable of such a thing, I'd have killed him on the spot. But now I have done it. I think I'll go to my room,' she answered, her eyes on the floor. She made herself raise them to his unless you wish to talk to me longer. She saw him shudder. If you can help it, he said, don't make me see the brand I've put on you. Don't, for heaven's sakes, cringe to me if you can help it. Very well, she said. He struck his clenched fist against his face. It's the price, he declared through his teeth, and I accept it. He spoke more to himself than to her, and then directly, Will you let me walk up with you? Yes. He took her passive arm, then went slowly, slowly up the stairs, for at each landing it seemed her strength gave out, and she had to pause for a brief rest. When she paused he spoke with difficulty, but with his heart in every word. You remember the old Greek fable, Ruth? The story about all the pains and torments which flew out of Pandora's box? And how hope came out last, that blessed hope, and healed the wounds? Here... A moment after the blow has fallen, I am hoping again like a fool. I am hoping that I shall teach you to forget, or if I cannot teach you to forget, then I shall even make you glad of what you have done tonight. The door closed on her, and she was alone. Raising her head, she found she was looking straight across the street to the lighted windows of the rooms of Ronicky Doone and Bill Gregg. While she watched, she saw a silhouette of a man and a woman run to each other, saw them clasp in each other's arms. Ruth dropped to her knees and buried her face in her hands. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 Unhappy Freedom Once out in the street, Carolyn had cast one glance of terror over her shoulder at the towering façade of the house of John Mark. Then she fled, as fast as her feet would carry her, straight across the street and up the steps of the rooming-house and frantically up the stairs, a panic behind her. Presently she was tapping hurriedly and loudly on the door, while with her head turned she watched for the coming of some swift avenging figure from behind. John Mark had given her up, but it was impossible for John Mark to give up anything. When would he strike? That was the only question. Then the door opened. The very light that poured into the dim hall was like the reach of a friendly hand and there was Ronicky Doone laughing for pure joy. And there was Bill Gregg's haggard face, as if he saw a ghost. I told you, Bill, and here she is. After that she forgot Ronicky Doone, and the rest of the world except Gregg, as he took her in his arms, and asked over and over, How did it come about? How did it come about? And over and over she answered, It was Ronicky, Bill. We owe everything to him, and Ruth Tolliver. This brought from Ronicky a sudden question. And what of her? What of Ruth Tolliver? She wouldn't come? It pricked the bubble of Carolyn's happiness, that question. Staring at the frowning face of Ronicky Doone, her heart for a moment misgave her. 
How could she tell the truth? How could she admit her cowardice, which had accepted Ruth's great sacrifice? No, she said at last. Ruth stayed. Talk about that afterward, Ronicky, pleaded Bill Gregg. I got about a million things to say to Carolyn. I'm going to talk now, said Ronicky gravely. They's something queer about the way Carolyn said that. Will you let me ask a few more questions? Won't you wait, asked Carolyn, in an agony of remorse and shame. Won't you wait till the morning? Ronicky Doone walked up and down the room for a moment. He had no wish to break in upon the long-delayed happiness of these two. While he paced, he heard Bill Gregg saying that they must start at once, and put three thousand miles between them and that devil John Mark. And he heard Carolyn say that there was no longer anything to fear. The claws of the devil had been trimmed, and he would not reach out after them. He had promised. At that, Ronicky whirled sharply on them again. "'What made him change his mind about you?' he asked. "'He isn't the sort to change his mind without a pretty good reason. "'What bought him off? "'Nothing but a price would change him, I guess.' "'And she had to admit, it was Ruth. "'She paid the price?' he asked harshly. "'How, Carolyn?' "'She promised to marry him, Ronicky.' "'The bitter truth was coming now, and she cringed as she spoke it. "'The tall body of Ronicky Doone was trembling with excitement. "'She made that promise so that you could go free, Carolyn?' "'No, no!' exclaimed Bill Gregg. "'It's true,' said the girl. "'We were about to leave together when John Mark stopped us.' "'Ruth was coming with you?' asked Ronicky. "'Yes.' "'And when Mark stopped you, she offered herself in exchange for your freedom?' Y yes Both she and Bill Gregg looked apprehensively at the face of Ronicky Doone, where a storm was gathering. But he restrained his anger with a mighty effort. She was going to cut away from that life and start over? Is that straight, Carolyn? Yes. Get the police, Ronicky, said Bill Gregg. They sure can't hold no woman again her will in this country. Don't you see that it is her will? asked Ronicky Doone darkly. Ain't she made a bargain? Don't you think she's ready and willing to live up to it? Sure she is, son, and she'll go the limit to do what she said she'll do. You stay here. I'll go out and tackle the job. Then I go, too, said Bill Gregg, stoutly. You've been through enough for me. Here's where I go as far as you go. I'm ready when you're ready, Ronicky. It was so just an offer that even Carolyn dared not cry out against it, but she sat with her hands clasped close together her eyes begging Ronicky to let the offer go. Ronicky Doone nodded slowly. I hoped you'd say that, Bill, he said. But I'll tell you what. You stay here for a while, and I'll trot down and take a look around and try to figure out what's to be done. Can't just walk up and rap at the front door of the house, you know. And I can't go in the way I went before. No doubt about that. I got to step light. So let me go out and look around, will you, Bill? Then I'll come back, and I'll tell you what I've decided. On the street, Ronicky looked dubiously across at the opposite house. He realized that more than an hour had passed since Carolyn had left John Mark's house. What had happened to Ruth in that hour? The front of the house was lighted in two or three windows, but those lights could tell him nothing. From inside the house he could locate Ruth's room again, but from the outside it was impossible for him to do it. The whole house, of course, was thoroughly guarded against his attack, for attack they knew he would. The only question was from what angle he would deliver his assault. In that case, of course, the correct thing was to find the unexpected means. But how could he outguess a band of trained criminals? They would have foreseen far greater subtleties than any he could attempt. They would be so keen that the best way to take them by surprise might be simply to step up to the house, ring the doorbell, and enter, if the door were opened. The idea intrigued him at once. They might be, and no doubt were, guarding every obscure cellar window, every skylight. To trick them was impossible, but it was always possible to bluff any man, even John Marks and his followers. Straight across the street marched Ronicky Doone, and up the steps of the opposite house, and rang the bell. Not a timid ring, but two sharp pressures, such as would announce a man in a hurry, a brisk man who did not wish to be delayed. He took only one precaution. 
pulling his hat down so the black shadow of the brim would fall like a robber's mask across the upper part of his face. Then he waited, as a man both hurried and certain, turning a little away from the door, at an angle which still more effectually concealed him, while he tapped impatiently with one foot. Presently the door opened, after he made certain that someone had looked out at him from the side window. How much had they seen? How much had they guessed as to the identity of this night visitor? The softness of the opening of the door, and the whisper of the wind as it rushed into the hall beyond, were like a hiss of threatening secrecy. And then, from the shadow of that meager opening, a voice was saying, "'Who's there?' The very caution, however, reassured Ronicky Doone. Had they suspected that it was he, they would either have kept the door definitely closed, or else they would have flung it wide, and boldly invited him in. "'I want to see Harry Morgan. Quick,' he said, and stepped close to the door. At this bold approach, the door closed like the winking of an eye, until it was barely an inch ajar. "'Keep back,' came the warning through the small opening. "'Keep clear, Bo.' "'Damnation!' exclaimed Ronicky. "'What's the idea? I want Harry, I tell you.' Harry ain't here. Just hand me that piece of paper over there, and I'll write out the message, said Ronicky, pointing to the little table just beyond the doorman. The latter turned with a growl, and the moment he was halfway around, Ronicky Doone sprang in. His arm fastened around the head of the unlucky warder, and passing down his throat, crushed it in a stranglehold. His other hand, darting out in strong precision, caught the right arm of the warder at the wrist, and jerked it back between his shoulders. In an instant he was effectively gagged and bound by those two movements, and Ronicky Doone, pausing for an instant to make sure of himself, heard footsteps in the hall above. It was too late to do what he hoped, yet he must take his prize out of the way. For that purpose he half carried, half dragged his victim through the doorway and into the adjoining room. There he deposited him on the floor, as near death as life. Relaxing his hold on the man's throat, he whipped out his colt, and tucked the cold muzzle under the chin of the other. "'Now don't stir,' he said. "'Don't whisper. Don't move a muscle. Partner, I'm Ronicky Doone. Now talk quick. Where's Ruth Tolliver?' "'Upstairs.' "'In her room?' "'Yes.' Ronicky started to rise. Then, for there had been a slight fraction of a second's pause before the victim answered, he changed his mind. "'I ought to smash your head open for that lie,' he said at a random guess. "'Tell me straight now. Where's Ruth Tolliver?' "'How can I tell if she ain't in her room?' "'Look,' said Ronicky, "'if anyone comes into that hall before you've told me where the girl is, "'you're dead, partner. That's straight. Now talk. She's with Mark. "'And where's he? He'd kill me if I tell you. "'Not if I find him before he finds you. His killing days are ended.' Where's Mark and the girl? Has he run off with her? Yes. They're married, asked Ronicky Doone, feeling that it might be a wild goose chase after all. I don't know. But where are they? Heaven help me, then. I'll tell you. He began to whisper swiftly, incoherently, his voice almost shaking to silence as he reached the heart of his narrative. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 Hills and Sea The summer house lay in a valley between two hills. Resting on the lawn before it, Ruth Tolliver lay with her head pillowed back between her hands, and the broad brim of her straw hat flopped down to shade her eyes. She could look up on either side of the sweep of grass, with the wind twinkling in it, grass that rolled smoothly up to the gentle blue sky beyond. On the one hand it was very near to her, that film of blue, but to her right the narrow, bright heads of a young poplar grove pushed up beyond the hilltop, and that made the sky fall back an immeasurable distance. Not very much variety in that landscape, but there was an infinite variety in the changes of the open-air silence. Overtones, all of them, but what a range! If she found that what was immediately overhead and beside her was too bland, if she wearied of that lovely drift of clouds across the sky, then she had only to raise herself upon one elbow and look down to the broad, white band of earth and the startling blue of the ocean beyond. She was a little way up the hills, to be sure, 
but in spite of her elevation, when she looked out toward the horizon, it seemed that the sea was hollowed like a great bowl, that the horizon wave was apt at any moment to roll in upon the beach and overwhelm her among the hills. Not a very great excitement for such a girl as Ruth Tolliver, to be sure, particularly when the faint crease between her eyes told of a perpetual worry and a strain under which she was now living. She was trying to lose herself in forgetfulness, in this open, drowsy climate. Behind her a leisurely step came down one of the garden paths. It brought her to attention at once. A shadow passed over her face, and instantly she was sitting up, alert and excited. John Mark sat down cross-legged beside her, a very changed John Mark indeed. He wore white trousers and low white shoes, with a sack coat of blue, a cool-looking man even on this sultry day. The cane, which he insisted upon at all times, he planted between his knees to help in the process of lowering himself to the ground. He now hooked the head over his shoulder, pushed back the hat, and smiled at the girl. "'Everything is finished,' he said calmly. "'How well you look, Ruth, that hair of yours against the green grass. Everything is finished. The license and the clergyman will arrive within the hour.' She shrugged her shoulders. As a rule she tried at least to be politely acquiescent, but now and then something in her revolted. But John Mark was an artist in choosing remarks, and moments which should not be noticed. Apparently her silence made not even a ripple on the calm surface of his assurance. He had been so perfectly diplomatic, indeed, during the whole affair, that she had come to respect and fear him more than ever even in that sudden midnight departure from the house in Beekman Place, in that unaccountable panic which made him decide to flee the vicinity of Ronicky Doone, even in that critical moment he made sure there was a proper chaperone with them. During all her years with him he had always taken meticulous care that she should be above the slightest breath of suspicion. A strange thing when the work to which he had assigned her was considered. Well, he asked, now that you've seen, how do you like it? If you wish... We'll move today after the ceremony. It's only a temporary halting place, or it can be a more or less permanent home, just as you please. It rather amused her to listen to this deprecatory manner of speech. Of course she could direct him in small matters, but in such a thing as a choice of residence she knew that in the end he would absolutely have his own way. I don't know, she said. I like silence just now. I'll stay here as long as you're contented. He pressed her hand very lightly. It was the only time he had caressed her since they left New York, and his hand left hers instantly. "'Of course,' he explained. "'I'm glad to be at a distance for a time, a place to which we can't be followed.' "'By Ronicky Doone?' Her question had sprung impulsively from her lips. "'Exactly. From the first, he had been amazingly frank in confessing his fear of the Westerner. Who else in the world would I care about for an instant?' Where no other has crossed me once successfully, he has done so twice. That, you know, makes me begin to feel that my fate is wrapped up in the young devil. He shuddered at the thought, as if a cold wind had struck him. I think you need not worry about him, said the girl faintly. I suppose by this time he is in such a condition that he will never worry another soul in the world. The other turned and looked at her for a long, grave moment. You think he attempted to break into the house? "'And didn't you expect the same thing? "'Why else did you leave New York?' "'I confess that was my idea, "'but I think no harm has come to him. "'The chances are nine out of ten, at least, "'that he has not been badly hurt.' "'She turned away, her hands clenched hard. "'On my honor," he insisted with some emotion. "'I gave directions that, if he made an attack, "'he was not to be harmed more than necessary to disarm him, "'knowing that to disarm him would mean to kill him.' "'Not at all. After all, he is not such a terrible fellow as that. Not at all, my dear. A blow, a shot might have dropped him, but unless it were followed by a second, he would not be killed. Single shots and single blows rarely kill, you know.' She nodded more hopefully, and then her eyes turned with a wide question upon her companion. He answered it at once with the utmost frankness. "'You wonder why I gave such an order when I dread Dune.' when I so dread Dune, when I so hardly want him out of my way forever. I'll tell you. If Dune were killed, there would be a shadow between us at once. 
Not that I believe you love him. No, that cannot be. He may have touched your heart, but he cannot have convinced your head, and you are equal parts of brain and soul, my dear. Therefore you cannot love him. She controlled the faintest smile at the surety of his analysis. He could never escape the old conclusion that the girl must be in large part his own product. He could never keep from attributing to her his own motives. But just suppose, she said, that Ronicky Doone broke into your house, forced one of your men to tell him where we are, and then followed us at once. He would be about due to arrive now. What if all that happened? He smiled at her. If all that happened, you are quite right. He would be about due to arrive. I suppose, being a Westerner, the first thing he would do in the village would be to hire a horse to take him out here, and he would come galloping yonder, where you see the white road tossing over the hills. And what if he does come? she asked. Then, said John Mark gravely, he will indeed be in serious danger. It will be the third time that he has threatened me, and the third time— You've prepared even for his coming here? she asked, the thought tightening the muscles of her throat. When you have such a man as Ronicky Doone on your hands, he confessed, you have to be ready for anything. Yes, I have prepared. If he comes, he'll come by the straightest route, certain that we don't expect him. He'll run blindly into the trap. Yonder, you see where the two hills almost close over the road? Yonder is Shorty Kruger, behind the rocks, waiting and watching. A very good gunman is Shorty. Know him? Yes, she said, shuddering. Of course I know him. But even suppose that he passes Kruger, down there in the hollow where the road bends towards us, you can see Lefty himself. I wired him to come. There he is. Lefty? asked the girl, aghast. Lefty himself, said John Mark. You know how much I respect Ronicky Doone's fighting properties. Yes, Lefty himself, the great, the infallible Lefty. She turned her back on the white road which led from the village and faced the sea. If we are down here long enough, he said, I'll have a little wharf built inside that cove. You see? Then we can bring up a motor boat and anchor it in there. Do you know much about boats? Almost nothing. That's true, but we'll correct it. Between you and me, if I had to choose between a boat and a horse, I don't know which I should. Two sharp detonations cut off his words. While he raised a startled hand for silence, they remained staring at one another, and the long, faint echoes rolled across the hills. A revolver shot first, far off, he said, and then a rifle shot. That metallic clang always means a rifle shot. He turned, and she turned with him. Covering their eyes from the white light of the sun, they peered at the distant road, where, as he pointed out, the two hills leaned together and left a narrow footing between. The miracle has happened, said John Mark, in a perfectly sober voice. It is Ronicky Doone. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 The Last Stand At the same moment she saw what his keener eye had discerned a moment before. A small trail of dust was blowing down the road, just below the place where the two hills leaned together. Under it was the dimly discernible, dust-veiled form of a horseman riding at full speed. "'Fate is against me,' said John Mark in his quiet way. "'Why should this daredevil be destined to hunt me? I can gain nothing by his death but your hate. And if he succeeds in breaking through Lefty, as he has broken through Kruger, even then he shall win nothing. I swear it.' As he spoke, he looked at her in gloomy resolution, but the girl was on fire. Fear and joy were fighting in her face. In her ecstasy she was clinging to the man beside her. "'Think of it! Think of it!' she exclaimed. "'He has done what I said he would do. Ah, I read your mind. Ronicky Doone! Ronicky Doone! Was there ever your like under the wide, wide sky? He's brushed Kruger out of the way.' "'Not entirely,' said John Mark calmly. Not entirely, you see. As he spoke, they heard again the unmistakable sound of a rifle shot, and then another, and another, ringing from the place where the two hills leaned over the road. It's Kruger, declared John Mark calmly. That chivalrous idiot, Doone, apparently shot him, and didn't wait to finish him. Very clever on his part, but very sloppy. However, 
he seems to have wounded Kruger so badly that my gunman can't hit his mark. For Ronicky Doone, if it were indeed he, was still galloping down the road, more and more clearly discernible, while the rifle firing behind him ceased. Of course that firing will alarm Lefty, went on John Mark, seeming to enjoy the spectacle before him, as if it were a thing from which he was entirely detached. And Lefty can make his choice. Kruger was his pal. If he wants to revenge the fall of Kruger, he may shoot from behind a tree. If not, he'll shoot from the open, and it will be an even fight. The terror of it all, the whole realization, sprang up in the girl. In a moment she was crying. Stop him, John. For heaven's sake, find a way to stop him. There is only one power that can turn the trick, I'm afraid, answered John Mark. That power is Lefty. If he shoots Lefty, he'll come straight toward us, on his way to the house. And if he sees you, if he sees me, he'll shoot me, of course, declared Mark. She stared at him. John, she said, I know you're brave, but you won't try to face him. I'm fairly expert with a gun, he added, but it is good of you to be concerned about me. I am concerned, more than concerned, John. A woman has premonitions, and I tell you I know, as well as I know I'm standing here, that if you face Ronicky Doone, you'll go down. You're right, replied Mark. I fear that I have been too much of a specialist, so I shall not face Doone. Then start for the house, and hurry. Run away, and leave you here? The cloud of dust and the figure of the rider in it were sweeping rapidly down the grove in the hollow where Lefty waited. And the girl was torn between three emotions. Joy at the coming of the adventurer. Fear for him. Terror at the thought of his meeting with Mark. It would be murder, John. I'll go with you if you'll start now. No, he said quietly, I won't run. Besides, it's impossible for him to take you from me. Impossible? she asked. What do you mean? When the time comes, you'll see. Now he's nearly there. Watch. The rider was in full view now, driving his horse at a stretching gallop. There was no doubt about the identity of the man. They could not make out his face, of course, at that distance, but something in the careless dash of his seat in the saddle, something about the slender, erect body cried out almost in words that it was Ronicky Doone. A moment later the first treetops of the grove brushed across him, and he was lost from view. The girl buried her face in her hands, and then she looked up. By this time he must have reached Lefty, and yet there was no sound of shooting. Had Lefty found discretion the better part of valor, and let him go by unhindered? But in that case the swift gallop of the horse would have borne the rider through the grove by this time. "'What's happened?' she asked John Mark. "'What can have happened down there?' "'A very simple story,' said Mark. "'Lefty, as I feared, has been more chivalrous than wise. "'He has stepped out into the road and ordered Ronicky to stop, "'and Ronicky has stopped. "'Now he is sitting in his saddle, looking down at Lefty, "'and they are holding a parley, "'very like two knights of the old days, "'exchanging compliments before they cut each other's throats. "'But even as he spoke, there was the sound of a gun exploding, "'and then silence. "'One shot. One revolver shot, said John Mark, in his deadly calm voice. It is, as I said, they drew at a signal, and one of them proved far the faster. It was a dead shot, for only one was needed to end the battle. One of them is standing, the other lies dead under the shadow of that grove, my dear. Which is it? Which is it? asked the girl in a whisper. Then she threw up her hands with a joyous cry. Ronicky Doone! Ronicky! Ronicky Doone! A horseman was breaking into view through the grove, and now he rode into full view below them, unmistakably Ronicky Doone. Even at that distance he heard the cry, and throwing up his hand with a shout that tingled faintly up to them, he spurred straight up the slope toward them. Ruth Tolliver started forward, but a hand closed over her wrist with a biting grip, and brought her suddenly to a halt. She turned to find John Mark, an automatic hanging loosely in his other hand. His calm had gone, and in his dead white face the eyes were rolling and gleaming, and his set lips trembled. "'You were right,' he said. "'I cannot face him. Not that I fear death, but there would be a thousand damnations in it if I died knowing that he would have you after my eyes were closed. I told you he could not take you. Not living, my dear. 
dead, he may have us both. John, said the girl, staring and bewildered. In the name of pity, John, in the name of all goodness you have showed me, don't do it. He laughed wildly. I am about to lose the one thing on earth I have ever cared for, and still I can smile. I am about to die by my own hand, and still I can smile. For the last time, will you stand up like your old brave self? Mercy, she cried, in heaven's name. Then have it as you are, he said, and she saw the sun flash on the steel as he raised the gun. She closed her eyes, waited, heard the distant drumming of hoofs on the turf of the hillside. Then she caught the report of a gun. But it was strangely far away, that sound. She thought at first that the bullet must have numbed her as it struck her. Presently a shooting pain would pass through her body, then death. Opening her bewildered eyes, she beheld John Mark, staggering, the automatic lying on the ground, his hands clutching at his breast. Then, glancing to one side, she saw the form of Ronicky Doone, riding as fast as Spur would urge his horse, the long colt balanced in his hand. That, then, was the shot she had heard a long-range chance shot when he saw what was happening at the top of the hill. So swift was Dune's coming that by the time she reached her feet again he was beside her, and they leaned over John Mark together. As they did so, Mark's eyes opened, then they closed again as if with pain. When he looked up again his sight was clear. "'As I expected,' he said dryly, "'I see your faces together, both together, and actually wasting sympathy on me.' "'Tush, tush! So rich in happiness that you can waste time on me?' "'John,' the girl said, on her knees and weeping beside him, "'you know I have always cared for you, but as a brother, John, and not—' "'Really?' he said calmly. "'You are wasting emotion. I am not going to die, and I wish you would put a bandage around me and send for some of the men at the house to carry me up there. That bullet of yours, by Harry, a very pretty snap shot just raked across my breast, as far as I can make out. Perhaps it broke a bone or two, but that's all. Yes, I am to have the pleasure of living. His smile was a ghastly thing, and growing suddenly weak, as if for the first time in his life, he allowed his indomitable spirit to relax. His head fell to one side, and he lay in a limp faint. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 Hope deferred. Time in six months brought the year to the early spring. That time when even the mountain desert forgets its sternness for a month or two. Six months had not made Bill Gregg rich from his mine, but it had convinced him, on the contrary, that a man with a wife must have a sure income, even if it be a small one. He squatted on a small piece of land, gathered a little herd, and, having thrown up a four-room shack, he and Carolyn lived as happily as a king and a queen. Not that the domains were very large, but from their hut up on the hill they could look over the fine sweep of the country, which did not all belong to them, to be sure, but which they constantly promised themselves should one day be theirs. It was the dull period of the afternoon, the quiet, waiting period which comes between three and four o'clock and the sunset, and Bill and his wife sat in the shadow of the mighty silver spruce before their door. The great tree was really more of a home for them than the roof they had built to sleep under. Presently Carolyn stood up and pointed. "'She's coming,' she said, and looking down the hillside, she smiled in anticipation. The rider below them, winding up the trail, looked up and waved, then urged her horse to a full gallop for the short remnant of the distance before her. It was Ruth Tolliver who swung down from the saddle, laughing and joyous from the ride. A strangely changed Ruth she was. She had turned to a brown beauty in the wind and the sun of the west, a more buoyant and more graceful beauty. She had accepted none of the offers of John Mark, but leaving her old life entirely behind her, as Ronicky Doone had suggested, she went west to make her own living. With Carolyn and Bill Gregg she had found a home, and her work was teaching the valley school half a dozen miles away. Any mail? Bill asked for she had passed the distant group of mailboxes on her way to the school. At that the face of the girl darkened. "'One letter,' she said, "'and I want you to read it aloud, Carolyn. Then we'll put our heads together and see if we can make out what it means.' She handed the letter to Carolyn, who shook it out. "'It's from Ronicky!' she exclaimed. 
"'It's from Ronicky,' said Ruth Tolliver, gravely, so gravely that the other two raised their heads and cast silent glances at her. Carolyn read aloud, "'Dear Ruth, I figure that I am overdue back at Bill's by about a month.' "'By two months,' corrected Ruth soberly. "'And I've got to apologize to them, and you, for being so late.' Matter of fact, I started out right pronto to get back on time, but something turned up. You see, I went broke. Carolyn dropped the letter with an exclamation. Do you think he's gone back to gambling, Ruth? No, said the girl. He gave me his promise never to play for money again, and a promise from Ronicky Doone is as good as minted gold. It sure is, agreed Bill Gregg. Carolyn went on with the letter. I went broke because Pete Darnley was in a terrible hole, having fallen out with his old man, and Pete needed a lift, which of course I gave him pronto, Pete being a fine gent. There was an exclamation of impatience from Ruth Tolliver. Isn't that like Ronicky? Isn't that typical? I'm afraid it is, said the other girl, with a touch of sadness. Dear old Ronicky, but such a wild man. She continued in the reading. "'But I've got a scheme on now, by which I'm sure I'll get a stake and come back, "'and then you and me can get married, as soon as you feel like saying the word. "'The scheme is finding a lost mine.' "'A lost mine?' shouted Greg, his practical, miner's mind, revolting at this idea. "'My guns! Is Ronicky plum nutty? "'That's all he's got to do, just find a lost mine? "'Well, if that ain't plenty, may I never see a yearling again.' "'Find a lost mine,' went on Carolyn, her voice trembling between tears and laughter, "'and sink a new shaft a couple of hundred feet to where the old vein—' "'Sink a shaft a couple of hundred feet,' said Bill Gregg. "'And him broke? Where'll he get the money to sink the shaft?' "'When we begin to take out the pay-dirt,' went on Carolyn, "'I'll either come or send for you and—' "'Hush up,' said Bill Gregg softly. Carolyn looked up and saw the tears streaming down the face of Ruth Tolliver. "'I'm so sorry, poor dear,' she whispered, going to the other girl. But Ruth Tolliver shook her head. "'I'm only crying,' she said, "'because it's so delightfully, and beautifully, and terribly like Ronicky "'to write such a letter and tell of such plans. "'He's given away a lot of money to help some spendthrift, "'and now he's gone to get more by finding a lost mine. "'But do you see what it means, Carolyn? "'It means that he doesn't love me, really.' "'Don't love you?' asked Bill Gregg. "'Then he's a plumb fool. "'Why, hush, Bill,' put in Carolyn. "'You mustn't say that,' she added to Ruth. "'Of course you have reason to be sad about it, and angry, too.' "'Sad, perhaps, but not angry,' said Ruth Tolliver. "'How could I ever be really angry with Ronicky? "'Hasn't he given me a chance to live a clean life? "'Hasn't he given me this big, free, open West to live in? "'And what would I do without Ronicky? What would have happened to me in New York? Oh, no, not angry. But I've simply waked up, Carolyn. I now see that Ronicky never cared particularly about me. He was simply in love with the danger of my position. As a matter of fact, I don't think he ever told me in so many words that he loved me. I simply took it for granted, because he did such things for me as even a man in love would not have done. After the danger and uniqueness were gone, Ronicky simply lost interest. "'Don't say such things,' exclaimed Carolyn. "'It's true,' said Ruth steadily. "'If he really wanted to come, well, did you ever hear of anything Ronicky wanted that he didn't get?' "'Except money,' suggested Bill Gregg. "'Well, he even gets that, but he mostly gives it away pretty pronto. "'He'd have come like a bullet from a gun if he really wanted me,' said Ruth. "'No, the only way I can bring Ronicky is to surround myself with new dangers, terrible dangers, make myself a lost cause again. Then Ronicky would come laughing and singing, eager as ever. Oh, I think I know him. And what are you going to do? asked Carolyn. The only thing I can do, said the other girl, I'm going to wait. Far, far north, two horsemen came at the same time to a splitting of the trail they rode. The elder, bearded man, pointed ahead. "'That's the roundabout way,' he said, "'but it's sure the only safe way. "'We'll travel there, Ronicky, eh?' Ronicky Doone lifted his head, and his bay mare lifted her head at the same instant. 
the two were strangely in touch with one another. "'I don't know,' he said. "'I ain't heard of anybody taking the short cut for years. Not since the big slide in the canyon. But I got a feelin' I'd sort of like to try it. Save a lot of time and give us a lot of fun. Unless it breaks our necks.' "'Sure,' said Ronicky. "'But you don't enjoy having your neck safe and sound unless you take a chance of breaking it. Once in a while.' End of chapter 28 This concludes Ronicky Dune by Max Brand Read by Rowdy Delaney Idaho, USA April 2008